Chapter 247. Darkness Incarnate. Part 5. Cybern let out a bitter laughter as he met Atain's gaze. You finally called me by my name. It was as Atain had said. Cybane had broken the seal. Cybane knew Atain's abilities better than anyone present here. Atain had manifested in this place through darkness incarnate. But Cybane knew Atain was capable of monitoring the other members of Regus's party. It was the reason why clone users were so scary. However, this didn't mean Atain knew everything that was going on in the battlefield. If Cybane had personally moved to break the seal, Atain would have used incarnation to stop him. This was why Cybane had used another method. Cybane wasn't a clone user. However, he possessed dark magical energy. He was able to create corrupted beings and wraiths that were under his control. As he used his large-scale magic, he continuously produced corrupted beings and wraiths. He had diverted some of them, and he had stealthily hid the facility containing the seal. Atain spoke. You've changed a lot. The passage of time was apparent through Cybane's appearance. In terms of appearance, it looked as if Cybane was the father. Cybane spoke. A lot of things happened before you were revived. You already know this. Those experiences pushed you to become my enemy. There wasn't a single ounce of anger in Atine's expression as he asked the question. Cybane was his son, yet he had turned his back towards Atain. He was trying to kill Atain. When faced with this fact, it hadn't bothered Atain at all. Only an expression of pure curiosity appeared on his face. As expected, Cybane was hurt by this truth. It would have been better if Atain had raged and berated him. He couldn't see any affection towards him within Atain's eyes. I see. I mean nothing to you. Father. That isn't true. You are my son. You talked about the worth of family. However, the worth you place on your bloodline is different from everyone else. Am I right? At his question, Atain didn't immediately give an answer. Atain looked at Cybane for a brief moment. There was a slight hesitation before he nodded his head. It isn't the same. Unfortunately, it can't be the same. That's what I thought. I've never once felt that I was an important figure in your life. It had been like that during the Dragon Demon War. During that time, the fight had been much more personal to him. He wanted to be recognized by his parents. He wanted love, and he wanted to be special to his parents. He wanted an extremely normal type of happiness. However, it was always lacking in his life. Atain, who was his father, only acknowledged him as his progeny. He didn't give any interest or love that was supposed to come along with being a father. Cybane spoke with Atain, but his heart was always somewhere else. There was always a distant look in his eyes. This was why Cybane felt endlessly hurt by Atain. What about his mother, Ainsera? You are the son of the Exalted One. You have to be someone that won't embarrass him. You cannot fall behind the children born to those lowly women. It was hard to imagine it when one looked at the current Ain Sarah, who had lost her sense of self. In the past, Ain Sarah had been a strict and temperamental mother. Her love was only towards Atain. She had born two children named Rebecca and Cybane. The number of children were proof that she was loved above all other queens. Moreover, the two of them were mere tools that were pitted against the offspring of second queen Tedron. They were used to show that Ain Sarah was superior to Tedron. When Rebecca died in the Dragon Demon War, Ain Sarah hadn't been sad. She was disappointed. Above all else, she was angry. It was the same when Cybane was defeated in battle. She had been disappointed and angry when he came back barely with his life intact. As if losing to those lowly humans weren't enough, you brought disgrace to your father. Her son had almost died, yet she only talked about him hurting Atine's reputation. Above all else, it put her at a disadvantage in her competition against the other queens. Ain Sarah was such a mother. It would be great if he was able to hate his parents. However, he didn't possess such a character. He was hurt and angry, but he wanted his parents to look out for him. He wanted his parents to acknowledge and love him. As I lived my life, I learned a lot of things. Do you know what's the most interesting thing I learned? I have no idea. I learned that my emotions towards mother and father was quite common in the world. Neglected children pine for love from their parents. 
It was easy to find humans that shared the same emotions as me. His father was singularly unique. Yet Saibane's feelings were universal. Can you imagine what I felt? You were like a god. And I am your son. However, the relationship between the two of us was quite common. Do you realize how taken aback I was when I learned this? His father was the first dragon demon and the first magician. He had saved the world several times. He was the dragon demon king Atane, and Saibane was his son. Of course, Saibane had thought he was special too. He also thought his relationship with his father was unique. He thought it was something no one else was capable of understanding. He thought their relationship was that singular. In truth, it wasn't like that at all. A person may be unique, but the relationship between people weren't that special. There were countless, children, in this world that understood and shared Saibane's experience. I finally realized it then. I had really special parents, and I was also a rare existence. However, I was a person in the end. Moreover, Saibane hesitated before he spoke. I knew that father wasn't someone that could be called a person. It was a realization that threw Saibane into a spiral of despair. Atane was a transcendent being, and he could never be what Saibane wanted him to be. Ain Sarah took on the caretaker role of the great darkness, and she had lost her sense of self. The possibility of her being a person had disappeared. You do not hold any attachment towards your bloodline. You aren't cold, and you do not consider family to be unimportant, but from the beginning, it wasn't something that could move the needle of your emotions. Am I not right? I won't deny that fact. Atane didn't hesitate to give his answer. Saibane's expression crumpled. Ha! His heart hurt. He thought he had given up such emotions long ago. Atane had never taken care of him. Atane's blood flowed within Saibane. Yet he was basically like the numerous figures within the dragon demon king's army. Atane only cared for him a little bit more compared to the others. Saibane knew this to be true, and he had thought he had abandoned any expectation he had towards Atane. Saibane realized that he had been deluding himself. When he realized this truth, Saibane let out a sad laughter. Thank you, father. What are you thankful for? Atane asked as if he couldn't understand Saibane. Saibane spoke. I won't live like you, father. I never expected to confirm my resolve like this. Him. I want to hear more about it. I really do, but. Suddenly, Atain spoke. Time is up. The ground was shaking. The tremor had started not too long ago. It started deep under the earth, and it had reached the surface. The being causing the vibration had finally reached the surface. The sound of the ground exploding spread outwards. Everyone's gaze headed towards the source of the sound. It was where the seal had been placed. A thick darkness emanated upwards as the facility holding the seal blew apart. Then an enormous silhouette appeared from within the darkness. Two enormous wings unfolded. The owner of the wings looked as if he was wearing a mask. His face was smooth, and he was larger than Ragus. Is he the god of rest? That's right. When Ragus muttered his words, Atane replied. He recalled an old memory. He tried to get rid of desire for humans to fight other humans. In the distant past, there was a human that got sick of the fact that humans fought other humans. Humans were capable of overcoming their human nature that led them down the path of destruction. However, humans were selfish and ugly by nature, so the fight between humans were never ending. There were countless beings that were capable of wiping out humanity. Instead of fighting the outside threats, humans fought each other. It made him feel anger and sadness towards humans. When faced with the obvious truth, he tried to get rid of the source that was causing the self-destruction. I'll eliminate the hate humans have for each other. The desire to destroy each other would be eliminated. He thought everyone would be able to live happily ever after if he did that. If humans had no reason to fight each other, he thought they would work to advance their civilization. They would pursue their happiness. After long research, he found a way to accomplish this task. All humans dreamed. Dreams was a pathway to one's deep subconsciousness. All humans were free with this space. If I control their dreams, I can control how their conscious mind works. With him at the center, he tied the dreams of many humans into one. He created a mental world. 
In this world of dreams, he made the humans throw away the, unnecessary, parts of themselves. The humans under his control gained peace. They no longer hated other humans. They were no longer envious of other humans. The humans were no longer. Everything unnecessary was left behind in the dream world. In the real world, these humans started living peaceful and rational lives. Fights amongst humans happened only in the dream world. The dream world was merely a place where they could let out all their dark desires in their sleep. At a glance, it wouldn't have been surprising to see a utopia appear within the world. However, the parts that were considered to be necessary by the god of rest was essential to humans. It was needed to be able to live as humans. Atain mumbled to himself. In the process of creating the dream world, he gained control over countless humans. He was able to become a transcendent being. As the number of humans under his control grew, his power grew. He was able to gain godlike power over the beings under his control. It would have been great if he was able to create a utopia. Atain let out a bitter laughter. Human civilization was at its infancy during this time. Magicians were rare, so the god of rest was fully capable of taking over the world. Atain observed the god of rest for a time span equal to a human lifespan. The god of rest had created a power base that would make it hard for Atain to fight against him. That was why Atain continued to research the abilities of the god of rest. He researched until he could increase the probability of his victory to an acceptable level. At the same time, he observed if the god of rest could truly create an ideal world. In the land ruled by him, none of the usual stressor of maintaining a human society existed. He had eliminated any stressor that would arrive from humans interacting with other humans. However, this didn't mean that they were happy. After a long period of observation, Atain arrived at that unfortunate conclusion. They could no longer be called humans. They looked like humans. They spoke and acted like humans. However, they were no longer humans. It was true that there was no jealousy and hate. However, they didn't love each other either. If there's no conflict, people don't interact with each other. They didn't get lonely. This was why they had no desire to talk to each other. Things had to occur in the real world. If not, their conversation had no substance. There was no desire to understand each other. In a time's view, it wasn't an ideal world. It was another form of hell. I came to the conclusion that humanity would end in the long run. Humans lost jealousy, hatred and their fighting spirit. Humans couldn't identify what they were lacking in their lives, and they had no desire to better themselves. This led to lack of desire, and they lost the ability to take risks. There was no advance in their civilization. Everyone acted as if they were living the ideal life. In this stagnant paradise, birth rate dropped steeply. At that point, Atain gave up on all expectation. After a fierce fight, he was able to seal the god of rest within the great darkness. Ha! Ragus laughed at the absurdity of it all. Chapter 248. Darkness Incarnate. Part 6. Ha! Ragus laughed at the absurdity of it all. How is your actions any different from what the god of rest tried to do? It is different. Atain was firm with his words. I'm not trying to restrict human nature or their free will. I just want to push human-made laws and institutions to the extreme. How laughable. You are trying to steal everyone's ability to face their destiny. You are no better than that bastard. The important part is their potential. Ragus. It didn't directly messy with human nature, so I didn't kill their potential. Atain knew he couldn't convince Ragus. He shook his head at this unfortunate fact. Come dragon demon weapon. Dream's apostle. This particular dragon demon weapon had been the key to defeating the god of rest. It had the ability of dominating the spirit world and mental world. It had delivered victory to Atain when he had faced the god of rest. Ah! After emerging onto the surface world, the god of rest opened his mouth. The sound that emanated from him sounded like beautiful music. It was so beautiful that almost everyone became mesmerized by it. In a flash, everyone on the battlefield became absorbed with the song. Their eyes became unfocused as if they were drunk. The fierce battle stopped as the will to fight bled away. There were only a few that were capable of shielding their minds with their power. 
Everyone else stood still. They looked comfortable as if they were in the arms of their mother. The one to break this effect was Atain. He brought down his staff called the Dream's Apostle. The head of the staff was decorated with the moon and the stars. An unseen power reverberated outwards as it awoke his troops, who were drunk on the power of the song. A Tyne's clone shouted as he raised the Dream's Apostle. Do not be mesmerized by it. Suppress him. My power will protect you all. I won't let you do that. Regus charged towards a Tyne's clone. However, a darkness erupted in front of him. Another clone appeared from within the darkness. The clone was destroyed in the process of stopping Regus, but another clone had rushed right behind the first one. The clone hit Regus, and Regus hit the ground. I'll just kill you all here. There is no meaning to recovering the seal now. You are merely a clone, yet you are full of confidence. Let's see which side prevails. The battle, which had come to a halt, raged again. Chiron cursed. Shit, that bastard, Ragus. When Ragus decided to move, Chiron's plan blew up in his face. Four days. They just needed four days, and all their preparations would have been completed. The selected members, who would be participating in the upcoming battle, had been moved to the northern border of the Udusk Kingdom. It was also the border of the Plain of Darkness. The only thing left was to set up a supply line, and they would be able to find a path that'll allow him to invade the Plain of Darkness in one fell swoop. However, Regus's move had messed everything up. This didn't mean they weren't going to do anything. Chiron kept cursing Regus's name as he quickly readjusted his plan. The final battle will be fought today. It didn't matter if they didn't have all their supplies. It couldn't be helped if they were unable to mobilize all their troops. Since events had turned out like this, this was the moment they had to make their move. Azel snickered. This reminds me of the old days. Something similar to this happened before. Almost nothing turns out as planned. Above all else, you were the one that kept information back from Regus. You didn't fully flesh out the plan. Regus's party held a big role in Chiron's plan. They were supposed to draw out a Tyne's darkness incarnate by attacking a seal. Basically, his plan was to spread out a Tyne's power. Kieran had lost his dragon demon weapon, so Regus's party could use extreme extinction only once more. After drawing out the darkness incarnate, Chiron didn't expect much from Regus's group. In the end, they would lose a significant portion of their power through the loss of the dragon demon weapon. This was why they had to act now even if their preparation wasn't complete. If not now, they would have to fight a much scarier version of Atain. Chiron glared at Azel. If I explained it all to him, do you really think he wouldn't have caused an accident? Him. Well, there's no guarantee that he wouldn't have caused an accident. Azel scratched his cheek. They were flying through the sky. Azel was using the storm dragon's wing to fly by himself. He also manifested his white flame phoenix. Chiron and ten other members were able to ride atop it. Moreover, nets were made through telekinesis by magicians, and they were hanging off the white flame phoenix. These nets carried supplies and men. There were over fifty men being carried within the net. Everyone was hanging off of the white flame phoenix, but they couldn't complain. This was the only method that'll allow him to enter the plane of darkness in one fell swoop. In fact, Arietta was doing the same thing with the crying phoenix. Chiron let out a sigh. We have to hit the plane of darkness with only 100 men. We've lost our mind. You were the one that came up with this plan, so you shouldn't say such words. Moreover, you said 100 men, but that's a bit. There were a total of 87 members heading into the plane of darkness. This number included Azul's party. They were all elite members, but it was extremely foolhardy to attack the plane of darkness with their number. However, all the remaining guardian shadows remaining on the surface of this world were heading towards a point determined by Chiron. They would all gather there. A significant number of guardian shadows were destroyed in the ongoing fight, but there were over 8,000 of them left. It was thanks to the order given by Chiron when he had first gained command of the Guardian Shadows. He had turned half their numbers into observers. Now we. Azel looked at his surrounding as he spoke. Rough terrain was below him, and he could see a white plane coming up ahead. For a very long time, 
Humans believed that all the evils of the world was sealed in this demonic land. It was the plane of darkness. We have to settle this fight. Sibane groaned. This is a mess. It was as he said. The fight between Ragus and Atane was altering the terrain around them. As Atane fought Ragus, the fight with the God of Rest was going on in parallel. It was a problem, because both sides were split into fighting two battles. While the Dragon Demon King worshippers fought the God of Rest, they were also fighting Sibane, Niberus and Kieran. From the perspective of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, they had to stop Ragus's party from using the extreme extinction at all cost. Despite fighting battles at two fronts, the Dragon Demon King worshippers were holding up pretty well. It was all thanks to Atane. While Atane fought Ragus, he used the Dream's Apostle to assist the Dragon Demon King worshippers. I can't believe he's capable of blocking most of our curses so easily. Sibane and Niberus used black magic, and they were specialized in using curses. Most of the curses affected the mind or the spirit. Even if their curses could manifest different effects, most of their curses started out by affecting the mind or the spirit. This was why their effectiveness was significantly reduced when facing foes, who were under the protection of the dream's apostle. As a result, they were no longer able to dominate the dragon demon king worshippers. It devolved into a very difficult fight. It really brought home the fact that they were fighting the dragon demon king Atane. He was the first dragon demon, and he was the founder of magic. As always, Atane had an immense godlike presence. Could they really win against his father? It would have been better if the god of rest was a bit stronger. Sibane was so frustrated that he had such thoughts. The god of rest was being worked over by the dragon demon king worshippers. It couldn't be helped. The God of Rest was one of the oldest pillars within the Great Darkness. His power mainly dealt with messing with the mind of living beings, and that ability was greatly reduced by the Dream's Apostle. If he wanted to try something else, he had to fall back on using magic. However, his magic was woefully outdated compared to the magic of this era. He possessed more magical energy than Atane and Ragus. However, he didn't have the technique to be able to properly utilize his magical energy. From the perspective of the God of Rest, he wanted to scream out in frustration. This is the worst. At that moment, a middle-aged dragon mage and warrior broke through Sibane's magic. Sibane moved his dragon soul to attack the warrior, but the warrior didn't go down easily. He turned away the fierce attack of the dragon soul, and he kicked out towards Sibane. Sibane swayed on his feet. An invisible power shot out from the warrior's kick, and it had hit Sibane's body. I'll be taking your head, Prince Sibane. The warrior turned away the dragon soul once again as he swung his sword. However, his sword let out sparks as it clashed against a magical barrier quickly erected by Sibane. Moreover, a thunderbolt detonated on the warrior's head before he could retreat. The middle-aged dragon mage and warrior was sent flying. Niberus had saved Sibane. Despite suffering under the surprise attack, the dragon mage and warrior wasn't instantly killed. He blocked the next salvo of spells as he retreated. The magicians, who followed him in support, concentrated their attack on Niberus. They are quite relentless. After he escaped the immediate danger, Sibane calmed his breathing. From the beginning, this was a tough fight. Even if Sibane, Niberus and Kieran were powerful magicians, they were fighting the elites of the Plane of Darkness. There were a good number of troops that had gone through the Dragon Slayer's ritual, and there were those that posses dragon demon weapons. The fact that the three of them were trying to face several hundred elite troops was an arrogant act in itself. The only reason why they were able to hold out against so many was the fact that they were unusually strong, and they had decent tactics. However, the tide of battle had turned when Atane entered the fight. Niberus and Kieran were also breathing hard. They didn't suffer any life-threatening wounds, but there were minor wounds all over their bodies. Since they had sublime control over their magic, they still had enough dragon demon magic in reserve. However, their energy pulse was under stress, and their bodies were screaming out in pain. The situation was getting worse by the minute. As the God of Rest was pushed back, 
the dragon demon king worshippers continued to gain respite. They were slowly divorating troops towards Sibane's party. Above all else, the problem was the fight between Atane and Ragus. Sir Ragus isn't able to gain an upper hand. Since the Great Darkness was stronger than ever, the Darkness Incarnate was also at the height of its power. Atane had created four clones through incarnation, and the four clones were able to make five clones each. Moreover, a good number of them possessed dragon demon weapons, so Ragus could barely pressure Atane with his attacks. He destroyed the clones several times, but he was having a difficult time getting close to the real body. It was as if they were struggling to get out of quicksand. Sibane came to the conclusion that their situation was slowly getting worse. At that moment, Nibirus spoke. Father. Him. We'll have to end this before it is too late. Sibane knew she had made the same assessment as him. At this rate, they were slowly inching towards defeat. They had to make a gambit for victory when there was still a sliver of a chance. I see, but, the problem remained that there were too many enemies. There were over 300 enemy troops remaining. It would have been great if Kieran still had his dragon demon weapon. I never expected to miss that thing. The situation was bad enough that Sibane was having such thoughts. It wasn't as if it was impossible to defeat all the enemies in front of them. Kieran had lost his dragon demon weapon, but the combined power of the three of them was still formidable. The problem was what they were running into right now. Chapter 249. Darkness Incarnate. Part 7. The problem was what they were running into right now. Even if they were able to kill the enemies in front of them through a bloody fight, it didn't mean they would win. They would only win if they were able to kill the god of rest. Since things have turned out like this, would it be better to bait them into sealing the god of rest? Would it be better for us if we use that opportunity to escape from this place? They would be admitting defeat in this fight. They would be trying to live to fight another day. Since Sibane didn't know Chiron's plan, it would be the wise choice. However, will there really be another day? When Sibane left the forest, Alberton had given him a warning. The completion of a Tyne's ritual isn't too far away. The ritual might be completed in a couple days, or it could be completed tomorrow. It could even be completed today. No one knew the exact timeline. Everything would end when Atane finished his ritual. Sibane looked at Nibirus. Sibane felt pressure from the fact that they couldn't retreat right now. Ah, also, he was impressed. Nibirus' demeanor never cracked. She was probably going through the same thought process as him, yet she was unflappable. She assessed the situation in front of them, and she had made a goal. Then she put all her mind towards accomplishing her goal. How embarrassing. He came out from hiding for his daughter. He wanted to protect his daughter, who was walking into the lion's den. He never expected to feel embarrassment from seeing his daughter's resolve. Suddenly, Nibirus asked a question. Kieran. How much time do you need? I need three minutes. I want you to do it in two minutes. You are talking nonsense. Kieran clicked his tongue. Despite showing dismay, he grinned. But I'll do as you say. What are you trying to do? Sibane asked in puzzlement. Instead of vocalizing her plan, Nibirus used communication magic to deliver her plan to Sibane. Who? Sibane's eyes twinkled when he heard Nibirus' plan. He was impressed. Sibane turned to look at Kieran. Kieran had an ability that Sibane didn't know about. Nibirus had been Kieran's competitor for a very long time. She had also fought alongside him with their lives on the line. She knew what he was capable of doing. It is worth attempting. Let's. The three of them changed formation. Until now, Sibane and Nibirus shared their darkness magical energy. They layered spells upon each other to attack their enemies. Kieran moved to where he was needed, and he had been in charge of crowd control. Now Kieran had retreated fully from the battle. Sibian and Nibirus increased the intensity of their attack. Since they were fighting numerous enemies, they were mindful of how much magical energy they were using. They were mindful of a long drawn out battle. However, the two of them started pouring out powerful magic. It was as if they didn't care about the consequences of using so much power. Their enemies started to scream, and they were pushed backwards. It happened at that moment. Suddenly, there was a rapid change to the atmospheric pressure. 
there were still explosions detonating around the battlefield. Hot air was swirling around, so the atmosphere wasn't stable. However, it shouldn't cause the dark clouds to converge over the battlefield. Fierce winds picked up as it uprooted the trees and boulders. Then the lightning detonated. An enormous streak of electricity connected the earth to the sky. As the lightning detonated, the world was dyed white. There had been countless lightning bolts impacting the battlefield up until now, but this lightning was on a different level. Sibane reflexively had a thought. Can it be, as if to confirm his guess, a powerful wave of dragon demon magic emanated outwards? Come dragon demon weapon! Storm scream! The dragon demon weapon of the deceased Almeric made its appearance. Frightening lightning bolts assaulted the surface of the ground. On the other side, Atain was focusing the power of the storm scream. It was as if time was being rewound. The electricity from the lightning blots were flowing backwards. They were sucked into the storm scream. It changed into a large blade of energy. My god, everyone became shocked when they saw this. A power that could decimate everyone present was being focused into a small vessel. It had the effect of weakening the attack being directed towards Ragus. Ragus didn't miss this opportunity. He charged Atain, and he brought down his soul hammer. Atain didn't have the time to dodge it, but he didn't plan on dodging it. Light exploded forth. In a flash, the world was filled with blinding white light. Heat and shock erupted from the site of the explosion, and it overturned the earth. Even the troops fighting the god of rest had to desperately protect themselves. They had to do this despite being far away from the site of the explosion. A groan could be heard from within the hellish heat. Shit. You got me. It was a great move. Ragus swayed on his feet. A large portion of his white armor was destroyed, and darkness was leaking out from within. On the other side of him, Atain was holding a transparent great sword, and he was looking down on Ragus. The dragon demon weapons of the dragon demon generals were subjugated to the great darkness. It could live past the death of its owner within the great darkness. Of course, the original owners had the highest priority to use their dragon demon weapon. However, Almeric had died, and he hadn't passed on the storm's scream to anyone. This was why Atain was able to use it. It is unfortunate that Almeric is dead. His expression would be priceless if he saw what you did right now. Ragus had suffered massive damage at the hands of Almeric's secret technique, called the Thunder God's Sword. As if using the storm's scream wasn't enough, Atain had mimicked Almeric's technique. I bet he would laugh at my poor technique. Atain let out a bitter laughter. It was true that he had copied the Thunder God's Sword. He had to make up some of the deficiency with magic so he couldn't completely recreate the destructive power of Almeric's technique. Above all else, the range of the attack was woefully short. This was why he had to bait Ragus into charging him. Atain had used it as a counterattack. You got one over me, yet you are acting humble. This is why you suck. No wonder you are a magician. It isn't as if I won the exchange in a one-sided manner. That is why it is hard for me to pat myself on the back. It was as he said. A darkness was also leaking out from a Tyne's body. Atain had struck an awesome blow against Ragus, yet he had suffered a big wound when the soul hammer glanced off of him. Of course, it wasn't his living body. It was a clone made through the darkness incarnate. Still, its function decreased if the clone took damage. It was inevitable. The space around them had turned into hell. Even high-ranked magicians would need to use all their power to survive in this environment. However, Atain and Ragus were well past such levels. Atain used the hellish heat as ingredient for his spell. He attacked Ragus. Ragus took on the attack as he got ready for a counter-attack. You won't be able to stop me without the help of your other clones. They had to use a good amount of their power to protect themselves from the hellish environment. It clearly gave Ragus the upper hand. Atain was a clone technique user, and his power was significantly reduced if he was unable to use his clones. If Atain tried to use incarnation in this environment, he would have to protect each clone from the heat. It would cause too much strain on his resources. Hmm. He never expected to be put in this predicament, so the complexion of his face changed. Since he wasn't using the clones, 
he could theoretically increase the number of spells he could use against Ragus. However, that was easier said than done. In the end, Ragus broke through Atain's magic, and he kicked towards Atain. Atain retreated backwards, and the melted ground rose up like a wave to attack Ragus. Ragus increased his speed as he tried to close the gap. Atain hit Ragus from the rear in the nick of time. It had the effect of changing the trajectory of Ragus's charge. However, Ragus did something unexpected in the next moment. When he was pushed off his path, he used the momentum to spin his body, and he struck the ground with his soul hammer. Oh shit! Atain was a beat late in realizing Ragus's intention. The seismic wave cut through the heat. It headed towards the dragon demon king worshippers, who were fighting the god of rest. Wow! Cybane unintentionally let out a hearty laughter. I never expected in my life to compliment you on your tactics, Sir Ragus. The earth was hotter the flame. A massive amount of earth rode the seismic wave, and it hit the dragon demon king worshippers. A miraculous opportunity presented itself. Cybane, Nibirus and Kieran stepped forwards to enact their gambit for victory. I'm asking this because I'm curious. It was rare to see Atain perturbed. He looked a bit taken aback as he asked the question. Were you aiming for this result from the start? What? No way. Ragus proudly gave his answer. Normally, Ragus didn't pay attention to others when he entered a battle. However, his current action had helped his allies. On the surface, it looked as if Ragus had been keeping a close eye on how the battle was progressing. I tried to hit you, but I missed. However, it was too late to pull back my attack. I thought I could somewhat change the direction of the attack, so I sent it towards them. Thank you for giving me an honest answer. Are you sure you won't regret using that move? Atain was asking the question, because he could see Atain's state. The attack was going to miss anyways, so he changed the direction of the attack. He had dealt a big blow to the dragon demon king worshippers. Everything was ideal up until that point. However, Ragus had revealed a fatal weakness as a price of using that attack. Atain was baffled by Ragus's decision, but he would let an opportunity pass him by. He sent out a powerful attack. Regret. I never regret my actions. It'll make me look small. Ragus laughed as he took control of his swaying body. He had already suffered a big blow, yet he had suffered under another powerful attack. Another big hole had appeared on his armor, and darkness was leaking out. That answer if very like you. Atain ran in towards Ragus. When Ragus retaliated, Atain resolved into lightning. He appeared behind Ragus as he brought down the storm's scream. The lightning detonated as Ragus's body shook. Atain's hand had changed into lightning in the previous attack. It manifested back into its original form as his fist hit Ragus's body. The enormous figure of Ragus was sent flying into the air. His strike was precise. He had aimed for the broken portion of Ragus's armor. The cracks in his armor widened, and the darkness within poured out like a torrent. Atain appeared in front of Ragus as he brought down the storm's scream. When Ragus used his soul hammer to block the sword strike, other clones appeared to continuously attack Ragus. When each clone struck Ragus, a pre-made spell detonated against Ragus' body. Ragus's body was bouncing around the air like a pinball. Ragus groaned. At once, the tide of the battle changed in favor of Atain. Ragus had destroyed the environmental factor that had sealed the formation of clones with his own hands. Moreover, his missed attack had caused him to lose a massive amount of magical energy. Atain didn't pass up on this opportunity as he let out a fierce attack. As a result, the damage to the armor expanded. Ragus was quickly losing his magical energy, which made up his body. However, Ragus didn't go down easily. In a flash, Ragus headbutted the storm's scream being brought down by a Tyne's clone. Then he brought up his shoulder to destroy the body of the clone. I've suffered enough that I know your patter now. Hmm. Darkness manifested to form a Tyne's body once again. Ragus was about to attack, but he suddenly came to a stop. He became aware of a devastating truth. Chapter 250. Darkness Incarnate. Part 8. Ragus was about to attack but he suddenly came to a stop. He became aware of a devastating truth. Shit. 
This body isn't durable. Already, his transformation was becoming undone. The damage taken in the battle against Attane might not be the only factor. Was this happening? Because he had taken significant damage before his transformation. He had taken massive damage after falling into Chain's trap. Attane spoke. It seems the effect is finally showing up. Did you do this? You might have forgotten about it, but I'm the one that gave you your ability. While exchanging blows with Ragus, Attain had hammered spells into Ragus' body. He had done it several times. It was done in order to cancel Ragus's transformation. Ragus's defense was so mighty that the effect of the spell had been significantly delayed. It only took hold when Ragus took significant amount of damage. His white armor was turning back to its original black color. The dragon demon magic being generated by Ragus fell steeply. It was being changed back into magical energy. Let's end this. Atain had already manifested numerous spells around him. He was about to send them all towards Ragus. Says who? Ragus did something totally unexpected. He threw his soul hammer towards Atain. It wasn't a sword or a spear. He used the battle hammer as a throwing weapon. Atain was taken aback. The backside of the hammer was shaped like a human head. In a flash, it opened its mouth as it roared. It caused the ground beneath the soul hammer to explode. Earth and boulders assaulted Atain at high speed. He was hiding this function all this time. Atain didn't know about this function. He was flustered, but he trusted his defensive spells to stop the attack. He decided to send all his prepared spells towards Ragus. It was a mistake. As soon as Ragus threw his soul hammer, he charged forward using the instantaneous movement technique. Most of the magical bombardment barely missed Ragus. Ragus pushed through the spells in front of him, and he rammed his whole body into Atain. Atain was pushed back as his barrier spells were broken. After he reacquired his soul hammer, Ragus swung his hammer again. Atain, who had been in front of him, disappeared like an illusion. Atain's clone turned into a streak of darkness. Since he could avoid taking physical damage, Atain decided to escape by turning into darkness. I said I can read you now. In an instant, Ragus pulled back his attack, and he ran sideways. Then he punched where Atain would show up. Atain's eyes widened. When he resolved back into his physical form, Ragus's fist struck him. The layers of barrier magic blocked the blow, but it still caused strain on his body. Go! Ragus brought down his soul hammer with one hand. It was an attack that couldn't be dodged. Atain was quick to make a decision. If he couldn't dodge it, he would face it head on. It caused an explosive impact. In the middle of the rising cloud of dust, Ragus and Atain glared at each other. Ragus was in tatters. He had already taken a lot of damage up until that point. When he took on Atain's counterattack, around half of his upper body was blown away. Even if he was a powerful undead, it was dubious as to whether he could recover from this serious injury. It's your victory, Ragus. However, Atain had suffered more damage than him. Atain could no longer maintain his darkness incarnate clone. Ragus spoke as he watched the clone slowly collapse on itself. Shit. I won, but it doesn't look like I've won at all. This is embarrassing. Don't be so petty next time by bringing out your clone. Let's fight each other with all our might. Next time. Atain let out a hollow laughter. Then he looked at Ragus with regretful eyes. This is goodbye, my old friend. Atain's clone completely collapsed. Ragus swayed on his feet before he sat down on the ground. I can hear death coming for me. I don't even have time to rest. I am so thankful to the god of fate that I am almost in tears. In no time, his enemies started to converge towards him. Ragus laughed as he saw this. Cybon's party was hitting their enemies like a surging wave. Just a little bit more. The dragon demon king worshippers were fighting the god of rest, and Cybane's party had attacked them from the rear. When Ragus's errant attack hit them, the dragon demon king worshippers suffered a critical blow. In a flash, several dozen members were killed, and their formation started to fall apart. Cybane's party knew that this was their best opportunity. Let's go. Kieran released the magic he had prepared. An incredible amount of magical energy poured out of him. 
It was such a massive amount that it made one wonder if he had truly lost his dragon demon weapon. He was using a spell that mimicked the function of the dragon demon weapon Bleeding Star. It was similar to what Laura had done with her research of the Vitten's Chalice. She was able to manifest dimensional distortion through magic. Of course, this spell was less powerful than the original ability of the Bleeding Star. However, it was very effective in his current situation. Countless people had died in battle, and blood had flowed like a river. Magical energy was being generated by gathering the blood. Kieran was able to break through the Dragon Demon King worshippers using this power. Kieran split his enemies into two groups as he poured out his spells. His enemies shed their blood, and it was fed back into Kieran. The spell generated magical energy once again. It was akin to a ball of snow rolling down a snowy mountain. Sibane and Nibiris followed behind, and they used their spell on the divided group of Dragon Demon King worshippers. Corrupted beings appeared amongst them as they started slaughtering the Dragon Demon King worshippers. In the middle of this massive chaos, the three of them reached the God of Rest. The God of Rest was already a mess. Several spears and swords, which had been imbued with the sealing spell, were skewered into his body. It was suppressing a massive amount of his power. However, he was showing no signs of dying. When he gained some respite, the God of Rest started to extract the blades skewering him. It had the effect of quickly healing him, and his magical energy was being filled up again. It was possible for him to die, because he was an immortal being. There was no limit to his life energy. He was able to endlessly regenerate any wound. Spectre of the past. Death is coming for you. Nibiris yelled out in anger as she sent a spell towards the God of Rest. The shockwave of the spell pushed the God of Rest backwards, and a cursed sword of darkness pierced through his body. The God of Rest was undaunted by the pain, and he tried to vocalize his song. However, the song lasted only for a brief moment. Sibane had sent an attack. It pierced through the throat of the God of Rest. The song turned into a guttural scream, Nibiris. Hurry! Kieran yelled out. He was able to use massive amount of magical energy through the blood in the battlefield. As a price, his energy pulse was under a massive strain. It was crying out. It wouldn't be too long before his spell would be shut off. Moreover, the Dragon Demon King worshippers were still a problem. They had been outwitted by Sibane's group, so they had allowed Sibane's group to charge through them. However, they were still dangerous. They were also willing to give up their lives to stop the three of them. So the pressure created by the Dragon Demon King worshippers was intense. I know. Nibiris was well aware of her current situation. She manifested extreme extinction through her Book of Darkness. It wouldn't take her too long to complete her spell. Many emotions crossed her mind as she spoke. Thank you for everything, Book of Darkness. He hadn't created it, but the Book of Darkness was her sworn companion. It had a connection to her soul. She had been lost in the darkness as the madness of the plane of darkness was drilled into her. The only thing that had allowed her to survive such an experience was the Book of Darkness. It had been the light of hope in her darkness, and it had been her sole connection to Sibane. Of course, she was deeply moved when sacrificing such an item. Nibiris was awash in her emotions as she was about to activate the extreme extinction. It happened at that moment. She felt excruciating pain spread throughout her body. Ah! Nibiris' eyes widened. A streak of darkness had pierced through her body. This, one of the blades, which had been pierced through the God of Rest, had attacked her. She realized that a powerful magic had been placed on this blade. It was a trap. This sword had been placed there for her from the start. It's the king. He knew things would turn out like this from the beginning. Atain had prepared this trap. Even Atain couldn't predict everything. However, he had made preparations for the possibility of the God of Rest being attacked. He was a clone user and an apex magician. He was capable of placing such a trap even as he fought Ragus. Nibiris. No. Sibane yelled out. Nibiris grabbed the blade sticking out of her body, and she immediately grasped her current situation. Sibane yelled out in grief. He had promised himself that he would protect his daughter at all cost. His promise was trampled by none other than Atain. 
Nibirus. However, he couldn't let his despair paralyze him. He supported Nibirus as he worked on dispelling the magic imbued within the blade. She had suffered a critical wound by the surprise attack. The sword held a Tyne's curse. It ate away at her life energy like a powerful poison. Stay awake. No, I'll save you. I will. He just had to extract the blade. Then he would be able to heal her with his dragon soul. Even if a Tyne's curse was dreadful, he. Father, stop. Nibirus raised her hand to stop Sibane's action. At the same time, she started to get up. Sibane looked at her in surprise, and he realized that she had created tentacles of darkness. She was using them to move herself. Stop moving. At this rate, we, we will all die. Without accomplishing anything, Nibirus panted as she spoke. It was as she said. Sibane's dragon soul had a healing ability. However, he was completely defenseless when using this ability. Their enemies were attacking them from all directions. It would be suicidal for him to use his healing ability. If Sibane was focused on healing her, he would die once Kiran was unable to hold back their enemies. In the end, Nibirus would die either way. Nibirus, how could you? Sibane's expression was dyed with despair. Nibirus squeezed out her words. Sir Ragus, do you hear me? Her voice reached Ragus, who was fighting on the other side of the battlefield. I hear you, but I'm a bit busy right now. I don't want to hear you whine. Come towards us. You have to pay back the debt you incurred for not being able to protect my life. Miss. Ragus sounded puzzled. Nibirus took a step forward. She felt no pain. She had blocked all her pain through magic. However, her senses had dulled. She could barely see, and her hearing was impaired. She felt her life drain out as she took a step. She felt her life drain away as she took each breath. The Reaper was getting closer. She could hear the Reaper breathe down her back. Kieran. Nibirus. Please stop. Yes. Please. She could hear Kieran. He was close to tears. Nibirus laughed as she recalled her old memories. You should stop being a crybaby at this age. Kieran, let me face my own death with honor. I ask this of you. Nibirus didn't wait for his answer. She didn't know what Kieran would do. However, he wouldn't stop her. He would let her do as she wished. He wouldn't turn around to watch her death. He'll do as she wished by blocking their enemies from reaching her. Death. It would be a lie to say she wasn't afraid of it. If she gave up right now, she might live. She could use the power of the Book of Darkness to dispel the curse. At that point, Sibane and Kieran might sacrifice themselves to save her. Such hopeful thoughts ran through her mind. However, she couldn't go down that path. Joran. Joran was a human, who had died for her. She didn't want to embarrass him through her actions. It was something she dreaded more than death. Nibirus wouldn't be able to forgive herself if she ran away even if there was a possibility that she would be able to save her life. King. Oh great king. Nibirus looked at the sky with her blurry eyes. I will resist against your madness. Atain considered the rise and fall of an empire as a single moment in his life. She was an insignificant being compared to him. However, she wouldn't follow the destiny laid out by him. She would show him the will of someone that he considered to be a mayfly. The Book of Darkness let out a light. The extreme extinction was close to completion. It happened at that moment. Stop. Chapter 251. Darkness Incarnate. Part 9. It happened at that moment. Stop. Sibane's voice was full of grief. Nibirus tried to shake her head, but Sibane's dragon soul roared before she could do that. A powerful wave of power pushed the nearby enemies backwards. At the same time, it broke apart the extreme extinction technique, which Nibirus had been desperately trying to complete. Ah, Nibirus was taken aback. Sibane laughed as he took her falling body into his arms. Sir Kieran. Yes, I know I am asking much of you, but could you buy me 30 seconds? Can you do it? Sibane didn't listen to Kieran's answer. He wrapped the dragon's soul around Nibirus. Nibirus was being suppressed by Sibane, so she couldn't do anything. She could only watch as he used his dragon demon magic to heal her body. Father, why? Sibane should know that his actions were pointless. So why did he choose to go down this path? 
I promised myself that I wouldn't live like my father, Nibirus. Sibane's voice sounded long way off as if it was a dream. Nibirus couldn't see him, but he had a gentle smile on his face. I've never been able to act like your father. Still, I do not want to watch my daughter die in front of my eyes. Please. The latter half of his words couldn't be heard as the sound of a nearby explosion buried his voice. Nibirus' consciousness was fading into the darkness. She soundlessly despaired. Father, the source of the ringing explosion was Ragus. When he heard Nibirus call, he had rushed towards her. He did so as he took on the fierce attack of his enemies. The cost of such an action was huge. Half of his upper body had already been destroyed, yet he had been pummeled by the attack of his enemies. Severe cracks had formed all over his body. It wouldn't be strange if his body fell apart at any moment. If Ragus had done nothing, his body would have been destroyed. He was forcefully keeping his body together through sheer force of will. If he continued to fight, his death was guaranteed. Moreover, the great darkness lost the god of death, Belrun's ability. Ragus would no longer be able to reincarnate himself. If he died here, it would be his final resting place. I don't have much time. She fell asleep before she could tell me why she called me over here. What shall I do? Will you listen to my request instead? What do you want me to do? First, I want you to block everyone that approaches us. Sibane spoke those words as he withdrew the dragon soul, which had been healing Nibirus. He deployed his spells once again as he gave Kieran some respite. Kieran had been prepared for his own death, so he was abusing his energy pulse. Kieran sunk to the ground. 70% of his spells collapsed, but it couldn't be helped. Sir Kieran. Sibane grabbed his shoulder as he spoke. You did very well. I know this is cruel of me, but I would like to ask you for another favor. Please speak. Kieran breathed roughly as he answered Sibane. Sibane laughed. Please look after my daughter. Sibane Nim, I won't forgive you if you are unable to save my child. When he finished speaking, Sabane turned his back towards Kieran. Then he spoke to Ragus. I'll block their attack. Could you open up a path for them? You can see my current state, yet you are asking me of this. Will you turn down my request? Sibane grinned as he used his magic. I won't be a man if I let the little miss die. A man should show his spirit in such a moment. Ragus's remaining arm brought down his soul hammer. A wave of earthquake spread in a cone-like shape as it created a hole in the encircling net of the dragon demon king worshippers. At the same time, Sibane yelled out his order. Now, go. Kieran didn't give a reply. He just used his all power to fly. He had Nibirus in his arms. Sibane didn't look back. He yelled out towards his enemies. Those that worship my father's madness. Look, at the same time, incredible power was unleashed from within him. For an instant, his enemies flinched as they looked at him. Until now, Sibane had been controlling how much dragon demon magic he was using. He had been keeping some in reserve in case of a drawn-out battle. While he had displayed devastating power up until now, he hadn't used a significant portion of his dragon demon magic. He had chained his spells together to create greater effect. It was a highly advanced way to use magic, and it had allowed him to avoid using a large portion of his dragon demon magic. It was different now. He didn't hold back any power in reserve. He squeezed out every ounce of his power. The darkness magic spread outwards like a tsunami, and countless spheres of darkness appeared from within the darkness. Moreover, the spells that he had placed around him was triggered. A storm of magic engulfed his surrounding. It was a flashy attack that looked like it could overturn the heavens, but in reality, there was little substance to it. The amount of power and spells being used was incredible. It was almost unbelievable that a single person was able to do this. It might have worked if Sibane was facing normal troops. However, his enemies were the elites of the Plane of Darkness. They were able to weather the attack without taking much damage. The only problem was the fact that the spells were continuous. Spells kept bombarding the Dragon Demon King worshippers, and they were being driven backwards. Hmm. Prince Sibane plans to sacrifice himself for his daughter. Everyone knew what Sibane was trying to do. 
This was the absolute worst way a high-ranked magician could use his magic. The result was much worse compared to the power he had invested. From the perspective of their enemies, they would win if they could hold out. Cybane would burn himself out. He wouldn't be able to cause significant damage to them. However, Niberus and Kieran would be able to run away as a trade-off. We can't let those two get away. When Cybane's attack slows down, we'll split into two groups. We'll track them down. From their perspective, Niberus was someone that they had to kill. She possessed a dragon demon weapon, so she'll be able to use extreme extinction. I can clearly see what you guys are thinking. Do you really think you'll be able to win against us just by waiting us out? At that moment, Cybane's voice hit the minds of the dragon demon king worshippers. It was delivered through magic. I'll show you why you are wrong. You should watch me. I'll kill the god of rest through extreme extinction. What? Everyone was shocked. This move completely cut the ground out from under his opponents. Is he bluffing? Of course, it was highly probable that Cybane was bluffing. However, they thought about Cybane's reputation as a magician. Even if they thought Cybane was making a bluff, they couldn't ignore his words. What if he really was capable of doing what he claimed? They had to stop Cybane at all cost. Shit, stop him. In the end, the Dragon Demo King worshippers had to give up on being passive. They had to stop Cybane even if the risk of them taking damage increased. Ragus also queried him. Will you be able to do it? My daughter can do it. There is no reason why I can't do it either. Cybane grinned. In order for him to break free from Alberton's contract, he had to barter with Alberton. The content of the deal was. Alberton let me go, because he was satisfied with the price I paid. It was the extreme extinction technique. Cybane had held back Niberus for a couple days. He told everyone that he was going to teach Niberus how to use the Book of Darkness. It had actually been an excuse to enact his secret plan. There was a secret function to the Book of Darkness that Niberus didn't know about. Every magic of its user was engraved into the Book of Darkness. As soon as Niberus had acquired the Book of Darkness, she was able to display immense power. This was possible, because every spell learned throughout Cybane's life had been engraved into the dragon demon weapon. When Niberus became its owner, all the spells she knew was also engraved into Book of Darkness. Basically, the extreme extinction technique was engraved into the Book of Darkness as soon as Niberus learned it from Laura. Cybane didn't tell Niberus about this. He made an excuse. He told her he was trying to teach Niberus about the Book of Darkness. In the meantime, he gained access to the Book of Darkness, and he stole the extreme extinction technique. Of course, he couldn't immediately use the technique. It was the version made by Carlos, so one had to sacrifice a dragon demon weapon to be able to use it. This was why Cybane had made a stipulation in his deal with Alberton. I want you to help me modify this technique as soon as possible. Instead of sacrificing a dragon demon weapon, I would like to sacrifice my dragon soul. Please cooperate with me. Freedom wasn't the only price extracted for providing the extreme extinction technique. Cybane received cooperation from Alberton and Libetan. They were two dragons, who had gained wisdom. As a result, he was able to modify and evolve the extreme extinction technique in a short amount of time. He rejoined Niberus after he did this. I never expected to say goodbye to her as soon as I came to see her. Cybane turned his gaze towards the direction where Niberus and Kieran had left. Ragus coughed. Geez, it seems I brought up a sore subject without knowing the full situation. I'm sorry. At least, you know you should be sorry. This is all I can do for you now. I can be your traveling companion as we head down the road of death. I acknowledge you as a man, prince. Ha ha ha. That is good to hear. Let's go now. Cybane let out a heroic laughter. Their enemies rushed towards them. They were ready to sacrifice their lives. The dragon demon king worshippers had to push through the storm of spells so several dozen members were killed in the process. However, they didn't blink an eye. We have to stop them at all cost. Atane had promised them rewards in the afterlife, so they weren't afraid of death. They were fanatics. When the bloody dragon demon king worshippers were about to reach Cybane, 
Ragus stepped in between them. Let's see if you guys can end me, you brats. Even as Ragus let out a hearty laughter, his armor was breaking apart. He was already at death's door. Ragus laughed even though he was aware of this truth. One of his enemies stabbed his sword into a crack in his armor. Ragus headbutted him. A spear stabbed into the hole created in Ragus's armor. Afterwards, spells were sent towards him. Fragments of his armor flew apart into the surrounding when he was hit with the spells. You guys play pretty hard. At the same time, Ragus brought down his soul hammer. The warriors, who stabbed with their weapons, didn't have time to retreat. A powerful shockwave exploded outwards, and they were swept up in it. Ragus sat down in the middle of the battlefield. The previous attack had the unfortunate effect of damaging Ragus too. He could no longer stand up. Hey, Prince, I did my part. Are you done? It is done. While Ragus was having his final fight, Sybane's dragon soul was letting out a light as it encircled the god of rest. Sybane could see his enemies charge him as they screamed. However, it was too late. The extreme extinction will soon kill the god of rest. Afterwards, his life energy would combust. His suicide attack would deal a critical blow to his enemies. Niberus, this is all I can do for you. Please live a happy life. Sybane smiled. He was near death, yet his heart was surprisingly peaceful. Sybane spoke as the light continued to get stronger. I never expected you to be my traveling companion in death. Are you complaining? No, it isn't bad at all. I was able to act like a parent thanks to you. Ha ha ha. Good. The two men looked at each other as they laughed. The white light engulfed everything as it expanded outwards. Kealia suddenly raised her head as she mumbled to herself. Ah, what is it? Azel queried her. Their surrounding had turned into a battlefield. Azul's party fought off the enemies that were converging towards them. They were doing so, while the White Flame Phoenix and the Crying Phoenix maintained their flight. It was curious to see Kealia be distracted in the middle of a fight. Kealia let out a sad laughter as she spoke. Ragus Opa went ahead of us. Still, he accomplished his goal before he passed away. It is so like Opa. The pillar was destroyed. If it was as she said, Half of the twelve pillars of darkness was destroyed. One of the party's goals had been achieved. That bastard. Azel felt mixed emotions as he mumbled to himself. Ragus had been a nuisance both as an enemy and an ally. Still, Azel felt mixed emotions at that moment. Kealia spoke. There isn't much time left. Okay. He nodded his head as he looked into the distance. In the middle of the snowy plain, there was an enormous castle. An imposing snow-covered mountain was behind the castle, and a city was built around the castle. They were at the heart of the Plain of Darkness. The Dragon Demon Castle was in front of them. Chapter 252. Outbreak of War. Part 1. After the Dragon Demon War, the Plain of Darkness didn't allow any outsiders to enter their domain for a very long time. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were hiding in the Plain of Darkness, and they were waging a one-sided war against the rest of the world. However, they never experienced a foreign force stepping onto their soil. It was as Kieran had predicted. They had no experience in defensive warfare. Moreover, they had been focused in playing an offensive and defensive battle in order to protect the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. They never expected to be invaded. They especially didn't think the Dragon Demon Castle, which was at the heart of the Plain of Darkness, would be attacked. When enemies suddenly appeared, it threw the Dragon Demon King worshippers into confusion. Unbelievable. He was a Dragon Demon with metallic blue hair color. Rishu mumbled to himself as he watched what was going on outside of the Dragon Demon Castle. He was at the heart of the Dragon Demon Castle with Atain. Currently, Atain was projecting images through magic. The suicide squad led by Azul's party and the several thousand guardian shadows were attacking the dragon demon castle. The guardian shadows moved across the snowy field, and they ambushed the residents of the plain of darkness. The defensive magic of the city was activated, and everyone tried to react to the attack in great haste. However, the confusion didn't die down. The confusion became worse as time passed. Did you know this would happen? Is that why you called me back here? Rishu asked the question. 
Azul's party had been aiming for the Pillars of Darkness, yet Atain had called Rishu back to the Dragon Demon Castle. He could now understand why Atain chose to do so. It seemed Atain had predicted this scenario. Atain answered him, I just made preparations, just in case. I didn't know for sure. You didn't know, but it looks as if you've been dutiful in making your preparations. It was almost unimaginable that someone would invade the plane of darkness, but it wasn't as if there weren't any contingencies in place. However, their enemies were coming in from extreme elevation using the white flame phoenix and the crying phoenix. They couldn't react to such an attack. Despite the ambush, the dragon demon castle didn't suffer any critical damage. It was all thanks to the defensive system placed over the dragon demon castle. The enemy force was able to enter into the plane of darkness without much problem, but they were detected when they were five kilometers away from the dragon demon castle. When the enemies started to descend from the sky, anti-aerial spells started to fire into the air. The current state of chaos was the result of such events. This situation transcended my expectation. I expected him to try to assassinate me with a small group of elite troops. I never expected him to haul in a large force through such a method. Atain let out a bitter laughter. When Euron stole and gave the white flame phoenix to Azel, Atain had to prepare for the future. However, he had expected a small number of elite troops to come. He never expected a group of 100 troops to ambush the plane of darkness. Moreover, he never expected several thousand phantoms of the guardian shadows to hit them at the same time. Rishu spoke. Anyways, you made the right choice in calling me back. I'll try to stop as many of them as possible. Wait a moment. You have more to say. When Atain held him back, Rishu tilted his head in confusion. Atain spoke. Rishu, I have a request for you. It might not be necessary for me to do this. I hope this to be true. I imagined the worst case scenarios that could happen when coming here. Chiron mumbled to himself. He was rushing through the frozen city, and a dragon mage and magician shot a beam of light towards him. Chiron unleashed his dragon soul, and he charged through the beam of light. He used instantaneous movement, and the distance of 50 meters between the two combatants disappeared in an instant. However, the magician didn't panic. It was as if the dragon mage and warrior had waited for that exact moment. The warrior got in Chiron's way. At that moment, Chiron let out a cold smile. As the sound of an explosion rang out, Chiron crushed the dragon mage and warrior. The other side had made the magician into bait. They wanted to lure Chiron into their trap before ambushing him. Chiron saw through their plan from the beginning. This was why he chose to end the instantaneous movement 10 meters before he reached the magician. He let out a powerful blade of energy with his sword. The dragon mage and warrior was taken by surprise so he died before he could put up any defense. The eyes of the dragon mage and magician widened from shock. Before the confusion could dissipate, Chiron cut off the head of the magician. Someone contacted Chiron through magic. Five enemies broke through the guardian shadows towards the northwest. Be careful, they are coming in fast. It was Kaalia. She was flying in the air, and she was monitoring the battle. She gave up to date information to her allies, and she used her magic at crucial moments in battle. Understood. Chiron didn't plan on going up against five enemies by himself. If he was alone, he would have done it. However, there was a clear objective to this battle. They had to minimize damage taken, and at the same time, they had to do as much damage as possible to their enemies. He immediately returned towards Azul's location. He spoke. Thing are going too well. I almost feel numb inside. It has been going well up until now. However, it will all be for naught if we don't eventually kill Atain. Azel was cold in making his assessment. It was almost unbelievable as to how well things were going. While they were crossing the vast plain of darkness, they could have been found at any moment. They would have been slowed down by fights. However, they weren't found before they reached the dragon demon castle. They were able to ambush their enemies before they were ready for combat. The only reason why their cover was blown was the Dragon Demon Castle's defensive system. However, they were only 5 kilometers away before they were detected, so it didn't matter. 
Their enemies hadn't been prepared for this scenario. The Dragon Demon King worshippers ran around in confusion, and it gave time for Azul's party to descend towards the city. At the same time, over 8,000 Guardian Shadows entered into the city from the ground. The large walls surrounding the city weren't a deterrent at all. Soon, confusion descended upon the city. Chiron spoke. However, there really are a lot of them. After our ambush, Dragon arts practitioners and magicians poured out of the houses to fight in the streets. The regular troops, who were supposed to protect the Dragon Demon Castle, weren't able to do much. The guards that were placed on the castle walls were the only ones fighting right now. Although, there were fights erupting all over the city, but these fights were being conducted by the many residents of the city, who possessed overwhelming combat powers. Azul's party was running through the streets when an explosion rang out in front of them. They are starting to clump in numbers. Chiron mumbled to himself. The dragon demons and dragon magians were fighting against the guardian shadows. When one saw their equipment, it was obvious that they weren't part of the regular army. They wore old armors. Some didn't even wear any gear. They were old dragon magians and dragon demons, who had taken up their swords once again. They were old, but their battle capability was well above a normal human. They used their massive power to sweep the streets as they fought the Guardian Shadows. Him. Leticia stepped forward when she was this. At the same time, the Guardian Shadows changed their movement pattern. What's going on? The Dragon Demons and Dragon Magians were taken aback. The Guardian Shadows had been attacking in a free-for-all manner up until that moment. They suddenly moved in sync. They organized to fight in short, medium and long distance. They moved in a precise manner. The dragon demon kin worshippers were taken aback. A single streak of lightning fell from the sky. Kaalia, who had been flying in the sky, had attacked with her magic. The dragon demon king worshippers had been clumped together as they fought. They screamed. Afterwards, Leticia charged into them as she stabbed with her spear. Her spear which was coated in cold energy, pierced through an old warrior's heart. Before her enemies could come to their senses, cold energy exploded outwards from the body of the dead warrior. The white wave of energy left behind only pillars of ice. There was only one half-frozen old dragon magian warrior that remained standing. He charged towards her. You bitch. Kaalia's magic had done minimal damage to him. His defensive ability was outstanding. He was able to avoid critical wounds from Leticia's ambush attack too. He attacked her with his life on the line. However, Leticia didn't even blink as she stabbed her spear into his neck. Her party members arrived right afterwards, and they muttered amongst them. They've retired, yet they still possess great amount of skill and power. If we attacked a human city like this, we would have instantly taken over the city. According to the information they had acquired, the Plane of Darkness possessed five small cities and the Dragon Demon Castle. These were the residential areas. The Plane of Darkness had a higher number of Dragon Demons and Dragon Magians within their population. This was why their residents were capable of fighting. However, it wasn't as if their entire population were active fighters. There were many that had retired due to injuries or old age. Then there were the lowest class within the Plane of Darkness. These were humans that provided basic labor, and there weren't a lot of combatants within this group. If they weren't fully geared, one could assume them to be civilians. Chiron spoke. Still, our plan worked. There would be much more resistance here if our plan hadn't worked. After Atane was revived, the Plane of Darkness gave up on defending the waypoints. However, this didn't mean they had completely pulled back. They chose not to sacrifice the elite troops but the regular troops already dispatched outside were used to defend the waypoints. They were sacrificed. When the Pillars of Darkness were attacked, they couldn't use same battle plan. It was known as to which pillar would be attacked, so numerous elite's troops had to be deployed to protect the pillars. As a result, there were a lot of vacancies in the number of troops within the Dragon Demon Castle. What about the Castle Gate? Arietta queried him. The 8,000 Guardian Shadows were fighting within the city to act as a distraction. The attack force was made out of 87 members, and they were split into two groups. 
they advanced towards the dragon demon castle. Azul's party arrived at the gate of the castle a bit faster than the other team. The imposing steel gate was 10 meters high, and it was firmly shut. If it was a simple steel gate, it wouldn't cause much trouble to Azul's party. However, there was a powerful protection magic placed over it, and it was causing them trouble. Chiron spoke. Let's occupy this location, and we'll be on standby. We'll solve this in no time. However, Chiron had to adjust his plan when something unexpected occurred. A window high up in the dragon demon castle opened, and enemies started to pour out. Their regular armed forces are finally making their move. It seemed the force within Dragon Demon Castle was gathered in one place. They ran down the castle wall as if they were running across the ground. They started letting out their long-range attacks. Azul's party had to retreat as they blocked the attack. As if the other side had been waiting for this moment, the castle gate opened. The gate was massive, but it was being raised at high speeds. Chiron was puzzled when he saw this. What the hell? No one is there. The castle gate had opened, yet no one was there. If one considered that the castle door was opened at that exact moment, one would expect soldiers to be on the other side. However, Chiron was fooled. I've been had. When the castle gate opened to a certain degree, several hundred enemies suddenly appeared. An illusion had been placed over the troops to fool Azul's party. As they stood on standby beyond the castle gate, the soldiers had used the extra time bought by the illusion to prepare their spells and dragon arts techniques. They were ready to concentrate all their might towards Azul's party. Chapter 253. Outbreak of War. Part 2. Light. Lightning and flame flew towards them like a torrent. Everyone tried to react to the attack, but they knew they couldn't block it all. When they had that thought, a wave of light expanded in front of them. Come dragon demon weapon. Unyielding fortress. It was as if numerous water drops were falling to the surface of the ground, then waves of light spread outwards as they overlapped each other to block the onslaught. Most of the surprise attack was blocked by the unyielding fortress summoned by Azel. He had to cover a large area in a short amount of time, so he couldn't block all the attacks. However, it didn't matter. Everyone present in his party could block the remaining attacks without taking damage. We'll split up. Let's hit them from both sides. Chiron yelled out. The suicide squad was populated by people, who had only fought on their land. Basically, they never had the opportunity to fight alongside each other. Despite this fact, the group quickly and efficiently split up when Chiron's order came down. Of course, each member used the preferred long-range attacks to keep their enemies in check. They moved closer to their enemies as they attacked. Foolish bastards. Even if each one of you is excellent, do you really think you can threaten the dragon demon castle with such numbers? The dragon magin was the commander in charge of the guards defending the dragon demon castle. He grinded his teeth. They were the defenders of the dragon demon castle. This was the first time in history that the plane of darkness had been attacked, and it was humiliating. This castle gate is meaningless in front of the guardian shadows. It is best to meet them outside. The commander made the shocking move of opening the castle gate, because he knew the guardian shadows possessed a special characteristic. They were like ghosts that could go through the walls or floors of buildings. He determined it would be better to fight him out in the open. It would be more advantageous than fighting in cramped space. If we push the enemies backwards, we'll be able to join up with the civilians, who are fighting in the streets. General Rishu and the troops of each clan will mobilize soon. It wasn't a bad judgment. Even if a lot of troops had vacated their posts, the Dragon Demon Castle possessed massive number of troops. The beings, who were considered to be the ruling power before Atine's revival, had continuously developed their military power. On top of that, there were the undeads, who had participated in the Dragon Demon War. If they pushed back the enemies in front of them, they merely had to wait for the rest of their forces to mobilize and participate in the battle. They would be able to easily win this fight if that happened. The problem was the fact that the enemy in front of them couldn't be judged through normal standards. Come dragon demon weapon. Sky splitter. The sky was clear, yet a lightning bolt streaked down from the sky. As the light dissipated, 
a sword letting out blue light made its appearance. It's Azel Kazak. Shoot him. The guards were shaken by the presence of Azel, yet they reflexively followed the order. The first line of troops attacked the suicide squad, which had split towards each side. There was a small time difference between the attacks sent by the second and third line. They attacked Azel. You have good judgment. Azel gave his compliments to his enemies. As he blocked the attack with his unyielding fortress, his heart started to pound. Bar dump. The jewel bands around his heart resonated as it produced a massive amount of dragon demon magic. The dragon demon magic coursed through his energy pulse. A powerful wave of dragon demon magic emanated from Azel's body, and clones made out of light charged forward. The clones successively let out lightning bolts, and it stalled the guards. However, the defense of the guards was sublime. They were all dragon arts practitioners or magicians. They worked with each other to put up a defense, and the protection magic around the gate extended outwards towards them. Magical barriers were also erected. This was why all of Azel's attacks were blocked. Let's go. Azel didn't hesitate. He attacked with his clones, so he could distract his enemies. The sound of thunder rang out above his head. A blue bolt of lightning struck Azel. It was Kaalia. At the request of Azel, she had directed a lightning spell towards him. After being hit by the lightning bolt, all the electricity was sucked into the sky splitter. In a flash, the power of the lightning became amplified as it was shot towards his enemies. Thunder Dragon's Horn During the Dragon Demon War, Kaalia and Azel had made a name for themselves as being in the rank of the most powerful beings. Their attacks were well above what the guards could handle. The barrier put up by the guards were ripped apart, and they were swallowed up by the lightning bolt. The sound of the explosion rang out a beat late, and the battle lines set up by the guards were broken. Now, go, crying phoenix. Arietta's eyes shone. The crying phoenix had been flying around her in its miniature form. In a flash, it regained its original size as it flew up into the sky. Countless bombs made out of fire fell from its wings as it carpet bombed the guards. The scream of their enemies rang out. The two split teams rejoined once again. The guardian shadows, who had been causing chaos around the city, started to gather in one place too. Chiron didn't let this opportunity pass him by. Everyone just let it rip. Oh dragon sword, burn the evil darkness. Even if Chiron hadn't said anything, everyone had been waiting for an opportunity to attack. The warriors, who were the quickest to attack, started to send out long-distance attacks. Consecutive explosions rang out as the 10-meter-tall castle gate was blown into pieces. The magicians attacked before the explosion could subside. On top of that, Leticia controlled the guardian shadows to snipe at the guards with long-range attacks. The guards became desperate at that point. Shit! break them apart. The troops, who had been stationed behind the castle gate, had taken massive damage. The ones that exited from the top weren't the target of the attacks, so they continued to pour out to put pressure on their enemies. The guards were trying to turn this into a melee, and the suicide squad looked as if they were about to jump in. Suddenly, a voice rang out inside the heads of the guards. The guards shall immediately retreat back into the dragon demon castle. Your Majesty, it was a Tyne's voice. The guards were puzzled by the order, but they followed it. A Tyne's orders were absolute to them. Chiron clicked his tongue. They wised up to it. We hid it as best as we could, but we caused too much damage. I thought Atane would be too focused on his ritual, but it seems he has enough time to monitor the events outside. Azel grumbled. Suddenly, the suicide squad ebbed away. One of the guards, who were puzzled by their move, suddenly let out an exclamation. Ah, what's wrong? Look up at the sky. He had been monitoring the sky since he had been wary of Kaalia's presence in the sky. The sky was blue, and it was empty except for the white clouds. Suddenly, a portion of the sky became distorted. It was as if an enormous teardrop had formed in the sky. Everyone knew what this phenomena meant. The guards were shocked when they saw it. Heaven's Tear Goblet. While her comrades fought on the ground, Laura had entrusted herself to the White Flame Phoenix. She was flying at a higher altitude than Kaalia. 
While Kealia blocked Larua's magic from being detected, she prepared an attack that would deal a critical blow to her enemies. After Laura honed in on the dragon demon castle as the target, she raised the Vitten's chalice. She mumbled to herself, release. A massive amount of sunlight was gathered in the sky. An iron mace of destruction fell onto the dragon demon castle. In a flash, their vision burned white. Afterwards, a terrifying heat swept through the surrounding. It was such a devastating destructive event that it looked as if the world in front of them had ended. Every time I see this I don't know what to think. It really is amazing. Chiron grumbled to himself. The previous attack was a joint effort between Laura and Kealia. The amount of power used was calculated. If the Heaven's Tear Goblet was used in an irresponsible manner, she would have wiped out her allies too. The target was ultimately the Dragon Demon Castle. Instead of causing mass destruction, the goal was to cut through the Dragon Demon Castle using the Beam of Light. Despite the restraints, the aftereffects of the attack was massive. There was nothing left near the Dragon Demon Castle. All the buildings within several hundred meters were destroyed, and everything was on fire. The aftereffects of the attack created fierce winds that could send humans flying like ragdolls. Leticia grumble. My god. It took the full brunt of the attack, yet it took so little damage. In comparison to the destroyed surrounding, the dragon demon castle retained its shape. Of course, it wasn't untouched. There was a big hole where the attack hit, and the nearby structure was crumbling. However, it was almost unbelievable that the damage stopped there. Chiron asked Azel a question. By looking at the damage inflicted, I'm guessing the place where the ritual is taking place was unharmed. I believe so. That place should have the highest defense. As expected, nothing is easy. Let's charge in before our enemies can get back on their feet. Even if a Tyne's defensive magic had minimized the damage, their enemies were probably in a state of shock. They had to break through their enemies before the confusion could rain in. The suicide squad immediately entered through the castle gate. There were many corpses strewn about the entrance, and there were many enemies inside that were still dazed from the attack. The suicide squad cut them all down as they moved deeper into the dragon demon castle. Soon, they clashed with the troops stationed deeper inside. Do not yield. The guards were ready to give up their lives in order to stop Azul's party. The number of guards still outnumbered the suicide squad by a significant amount. This was true if one counted those that were alive. They are coming through the walls. Floor. Be wary of the attacks from below. The screams of the guards rang out. The guardian shadows passed through walls like ghosts, and they attacked the guards. In a straight fight, the suicide squad could fight the guards to a standstill. When the guardian shadows revealed themselves from below, the line set up by the guards were destroyed. Laura. Azel spoke as he observed the fight. Laura had rejoined him by this time. She nodded her head. Yes. The Vitten's chalice created a dimensional distortion. The floor beneath them became distorted, and the path to the lower floors was opened. Above all else, they had to stop Atain from completing the ritual. Kealia had found the room where the ritual was taking place. It was being done in the seventh floor of the underground. Azel took half of the suicide squad as they left the first floor. The other half of the suicide squad and the guardian shadows were tasked with fighting the remaining enemies up top. Azel and his party arrived at the seventh floor of the underground. They had used the path of tears. Azel looked at his surrounding as he asked a question. How far do we have to go? You just have to go straight for five kilometers. This place is large for no purpose. It was such a large space considering it was just one floor. From the floor to the ceiling, there was a distance of over 30 meters. Kealia spoke. A Tyne's ritual room is above the abyss. It is a place where he can focus all of his power. The abyss. It was a grandiose name. However, it was the heart of the great darkness, so it deserved to be called by such grandiose name. Soon, the party checked their surroundings as they quickly moved forward. Laura and Kealia were their guides, so there was no way they'll become lost. You shall not pass. Undead magicians wearing fancy clothes got in the way of Azul's party. There were also several dozen dragon magians and dragon demons present alongside the undead dragon magians. 
Laura recognized them. They are Diggo and Bolton's warriors. These were the troops directly under leaders of the Plane of Darkness. The undeads, who had participated in the Dragon Demon War, had pulled aside these troops, since they weren't part of the guards. I knew they wouldn't let us move forward in peace. Sir Kazark, do not waste your strength here. Let us handle it. Just go. The one to speak was the white sword Count Bakad Lakadi from the Rio's kingdom. His siblings stepped forward with him. Azel nodded his head. I wish you good fortune in battle. Thank you. When this battle ends, I'll invite you to my land. Will you come? I'll serve you some rare alcohol that had been passed down through the previous generations. I'll gladly take you up on that offer. Including the four Likardi siblings, ten members of the Suicide Squad and fifty Guardian Shadows remained behind. The rest left behind the fierce battle as they pushed onwards. However, that wasn't the end to the enemies they encountered. At various locations, troops of similar level as the previous group were deployed. Each time a part of the Suicide Quad stepped forward to fight them. They were 400 meters away from the Ritual Room, and only the members of Azul's party was left amongst the Suicide Squad. Suddenly, Chiron mumbled to himself. Will we be okay? Chapter 254. Outbreak of War. Part 3. Suddenly, Chiron mumbled to himself. Will we be okay? What do you mean? Chiron's expression darkened as he replied to Azul's question. I'm not sure if this really is the best course of action. Even if it takes longer, wouldn't it be better to attack with our full force? If we do that, I believe we can take on Atain with no difficulties. Instead of pushing through with the combined might of the Suicide Squad, Chiron had decided to split them apart. It was the price for reaching the Ritual Room as soon as possible. However, he suddenly had a feeling of doubt when their destination was close at hand. Azel let out a bitter laughter. This plan came out of your own mouth. As a commander, you shouldn't show doubt at this point in time. You were right. Chiron coughed. He was embarrassed by the fact that he had shown a pathetic side of him. However, no one could fault him for feeling that way. Even if they had fought many battles, they were fighting for the fate of the world. How could they not feel pressured by that fact? Azel spoke. We all trust you, Duke. We've already carried out the plan. Let's trust your judgment until the end. Let's push forward with confidence. All right. However, it means your burden will increase. I've been expecting it from the beginning. It isn't as if I'm the only one to put my life on the line. Azel grinned. The party had been moving forward without a hitch when they suddenly came to a stop. There were the sounds of explosions ringing out from behind them, but there was also the sound of steps coming towards them from the front. It was coming from the corridor connected to the ritual room. Leticia's expression hardened. Rishu, a dragon demon youth with messy metallic blue hair made his appearance. He stopped when there was a distance of 50 meters between them. In the end, you are here. As expected, you were here. Azul's expression also hardened. He had expected it. When Regus attacked the Seal of the God of Rest, Rishu hadn't been there. After they ambushed the Dragon Demon Castle, Rishu hadn't made his appearance either. This was why Azel was holding out hope that Rishu wasn't here. As expected, there was no way things would be that easy. Rishu spoke. It was an excellent ambush attack. I never expected us to be bloodied so much. If Atain hadn't called me back, we would have been in a pretty bad spot. Rishu, do you truly wish to fight us on behalf of Atain? Do you really need to confirm that again? Rishu let out a bitter laughter. From early on, Azel and Leticia had been ready to fight Rishu to death. However, it was a bitter pill to swallow when it actually came time to fight Rishu. If someone cursed me out for being soft-hearted, I wouldn't be able to say anything. If I'm being honest with myself, I am thankful that Atain made that request. Atain had made a request to Rishu before he came out here. Rishu let out a small sigh as he thought about that request. After Azul's party had arrived here, he stepped forward to act as the chief gatekeeper. He had done so, because of that request. Azel, you should go. What? Didn't you guys already split apart your force to reach this place? You probably knew someone would block your path here. You also know that there isn't much time left. Hmm. 
Chiron groaned. Rishu was right. They had rushed forward at the expense of not keeping their forces together. That was how desperate the situation was. As soon as they entered the dragon demon castle, Kealia was able to acquire some devastating information. In the process of eliminating the god of rest, Ragus's party had killed a massive number of dragon demon king worshippers. It had the side effect of strengthening the great darkness. It was stronger than ever before, and it had hastened the timeline of the ritual. Soon, Atain would pass the third stage of his ritual. The next step would complete the ritual. Rishu spoke. Atain wants to see you. At this point, he just wants to settle his quarrel with you. Why should I go along with that proposal? Will you fight me with the help of everyone here? I assure you that it'll be the worst decision you'll make. I can try to prove it to you. Rishu let out a confident smile as he spoke. Azel glared at him when he heard Rishu's words. There was Azel, Laura, Kealia, Chiron, Leticia and Arietta here. There were also the fifty remaining guardian shadows. They might even be able to beat Atain with this force. The problem right now was the fact that no one knew the true measure of Rishu's power. While Chiron and Leticia learned the dragon's soul from him, Rishu had never showed his true power. Ragus had fought Rishu, but it was no guarantee that he had shown the full extent of his power in the fight. It'll put too much burden on our side. If they fought Rishu as is, the party had to defeat him as soon as possible in order to reach Hatain in time. On the other hand, Rishu just had to buy some time. If he focused only on his defense, will they really be able to defeat him in a short amount of time? Azel was conflicted. Someone tapped his shoulder. It was Chiron. Azel. Duke. Go. Let us use our enemy's arrogance against them. Leave Rishu to us. Then Chiron used the whispering technique to speak to him. It is turning out as planned. So why are you hesitating? Our plan doesn't change by this new development. Understood. Azel nodded his head as he looked at each member of his party. It was as if he wanted to etch their figures into his mind. At last, he met Laura's eyes. She soundlessly moved her lips. Leave it to me. Azel unsightiously smiled when she read her lips. In the end, Azel ran across the wall. Rishu didn't even turn to look at Azel. Well, let's. Before Rishu could end his words, Laura had used the Vitten's chalice to create a dimensional distortion. Rishu furrowed his brows as he got ready to defend against her attack. Soon, Rishu realized that Laura didn't plan on attacking him. The path of tears opened up on the floor. Laura and Arietta disappeared into it. Ah, uh, Rishu was taken aback. His eyes widened. If anyone tried to follow after Azel, he planned on stopping them. He was confident that he could stop them. However, he never expected him to use such a method to escape from this spot. Geez, Atain might get mad at me. That is none of your concern now. Leticia stepped forward. She let out a sharp killing intent as she spoke. I'll keep my word. When they parted ways, Leticia had made a declaration towards Rishu. If they met again as enemies, she would be the one to take his life. She moved forward, so she could keep her word. After he passed by Rishu, Azel went straight towards the ritual room. The sound of battle rang out behind, but no one got in his way. It almost made him feel uneasy. He thought there would be more troops or traps hidden in front of him, but he went forward unhindered. In the end, he arrived at the ritual room. Moreover, the door to the ritual room started to open when Azel came close. It was as if it had been waiting for him. Atain was waiting for him inside the room. Atain didn't look any different from the clone that Azel had met not too long ago. He had long black hair, and two thick black horns. Then there were his empty blue eyes, which looked unfocused as if he was seeing far into the distance. The only thing that was different was the darkness behind Atain. It was undulating like a wave, and Azel felt chills when he saw it. That is an incredible amount of magical energy. There was a magic circle etched on the floor. Instead of light, darkness was floating atop of it. Azel was sure that it was part of the great darkness. The problematic part was the amount of magical energy gathered there. Azel had never experienced such vast power gathered in a single location. It is a spell that is capable of scarring this world. 
This magic was on a different level compared to a simple destructive spell. Atain was carrying out a ritual that might be able to change the nature of this world. Atain spoke. You were a bit late. I'm almost at the final step of the ritual. If you hadn't come, I would have been able to finish it before dusk. You don't need to spell it out for me. I can see that it isn't complete yet. You were right. Still, this is unexpected, Azel Kazakh. What do you mean? Even if it was an urgent situation, I never expected you to come here by yourself. At the very least, I thought you would be accompanied by Kealia or Ornsaurus's heir. Atain tilted his head as if he could comprehend Azel's decision. It was true that Azel was strong. Atain couldn't guarantee victory if he fought against Azel. He admitted this fact. Still, it was quite reckless for Azel to come here by himself. You are fighting me in the Dragon Demon Castle. Yet you are confident you can win against me by yourself. I know you aren't that dumb. The battle capability of a high rank magician greatly varied depending on the resource available to the magician. Environment also mattered when it came to efficacy of one's specialized magic. A magician's spell increased in power by several folds depending on how much resources were prepared beforehand. Moreover, this was a Tyne's front yard. It was the Dragon Demon Castle. This place was the heart of the Great Darkness. Atain was standing above the abyss. It was literally where Atain's ability was maximized. Azel was dismayed. You are worried for an enemy that is trying to take your life. It almost brings tears to my eyes as to how arrogant you are. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had defeated Atain at a location called the Dragon's Horn Fortress. A large number of his troops were gathered there, and it had been a stout fortress. However, that location didn't have any power to maximize Aten abilities. You didn't even use your traps. I was able to come here unharmed. In order to fend off invaders, many traps had been placed within the Dragon Demon Castle. If Atain had wanted to do it, he just needed to use a small portion of his magic to slow down Azel. However, Atain hadn't done that. He had sent Rishu out to stop Azel's party member, but Atain had allowed Azel to reach him without any resistance. I insisted on that. I'm about to make a choice that I cannot go back on. I inevitably became sentimental. Atain let out a bitter laughter. Ornsaurus, Baldazark, Almeric and now Ragus. Everyone that could occupy the same time frame as him was dead. Until someone new shows up, he would have to be alone. He would be lonely in the eternal passage of time. There aren't that many people left that can make me feel sentimental. There is only a handful of people left. Azel Kazakh, I realized something when I met you again in this era. What was it? I have to settle the business between the two of us. You are the symbol that represents my regret, and it is tying me down. Atain looked at Azel. It was unlike his usual gaze. His eyes were focused as he looked at the existence called Azel. You are my fated opponent chosen by this world. When I defeat you, it'll mean that I've ascertained the potential possessed by humanity. As always, you always talk in grandiose terms. Well, all right. Azel started to walk slowly. It was as if several Azels were overlapping each other. Clones started to appear in ones and twos. We'll continue the fight that we weren't able to conclude in the past. Let's end this. Atain. In the next moment, Azel and Atain moved almost at the same time. Azel's clones split to both sides as Azel remained in the center. He swung his sword. The sky splitter turned into its light form as it lashed out towards Atain. Atain didn't back down as he countered the attack. The darkness engraver let out a blade of darkness as it exploded against the blade of light. The ritual room shook. Finally, the fight with the fate of the world in its balance started. Chapter 255. One Person. Part 1. The Dragon Demon Castle was louder than ever before. Everyone within the castle was aware of it. There were battles occurring all over the castle. The sound of explosions continuously rang out, and the castle continued to shake. Powerful beings were clashing against each other. The floor was overturned, and a large hole was formed on the wall. A black hair dragon demon could be seen within the cloud of dust. Chiron groaned. He was holding onto his two swords, 
and a green dragon's soul was wrapped around his body a gale suddenly erupted indoors, and someone emerged from the other side of the cloud of dust. It was Rishu. He was the dragon demon youth possessing messy blue metallic hair. A red dragon's soul was wrapped around his body. Chiron gritted his teeth as he charged. He swung his dual swords. Rishu retreated backwards as he dodged the sword strikes, which was as swift as the winds. The guardian shadows ran at Rishu from his back. These were guardian shadows capable of close quarters combat. They jumped towards Rishu with their spears and swords in hand. Flame erupted from his entire body. The fire swept the guardian shadows away. At the same time, Rishu was about to kick off the ground. He was about to accelerate, but Leticia had moved with exquisite timing. She stabbed Rishu with her spear from the side. Rishu had been about to move forward. It would force Rishu to come to a halt since he had to respond to her attack. It should have been like that. A streak of red light moved forward in space. Leticia was shocked. He escaped my attack. She had attacked with perfect timing. If Rishu charged forward, he should have been skewered by the spear. Moreover, if he tried to stop his charge, it would have put immense pressure on his body. He would have to regain his balance, and at that moment, Chiron would have been able to launch a powerful attack. However, it was as if Rishu didn't care if the spear was coming towards him. He pushed off the ground, and his speed became several more times faster. It was much faster than what Leticia was expecting. Leticia didn't even have the opportunity to unleash her cold energy. The shockwave hit her. Chiron was committed to his attack. He trusted Leticia would be able to execute her attack. Chiron's eyes widened. He was hit, and it felt as if his body would shatter. Chiron let out a scream as he was sent flying. His body bounced off the floor several times before his body was embedded in the wall. Leticia wasn't in any better shape. She was late as she tried to attack the backside of Rishu. However, Rishu kick came up from a blind spot as he struck Latika. Immediately, the dragon soul followed up with a powerful attack Leticia was sent flying. My god, Kealia was taken aback. Chiron and Leticia got back on their feet. They were swaying on their feet. Kealia had expected Rishu to follow up with an attack, so she had prepared a spell. However, Rishu didn't move from his spot after attacking them. Chiron gritted his teeth. Shit. He is fast. It is almost unreal. Rishu possessed more dragon demon magic than Ragus in his transformed state. It was almost impossible for Chiron and Leticia to track Rishu with their eyes. Many spirit order and dragon arts practitioners learned skills that could accelerate their body parts to extreme. Even Chiron and Leticia could move faster than the speed of sound if they wanted to. However, this type of acceleration was unnatural. One had to stop for a brief moment to recuperate or the acceleration would cause too much of a burden on one's body. He is able to use pure copper technique to create such ridiculous speed. I see. Is this the secret to his dragon soul? Rishu was using pure copper technique on various parts of his body. This allowed him to accelerate each body part with impunity. He was able to generate transcendent speed that defied common sense. Azul's party had acquired information about Rishu through Kealia. She had witnessed the fight between Rishu and Ragus. This was why they had been wary of his speed. However, when they were faced with it, it was beyond imaginable. It was overpowering. Even if they used quick, short attacks, they were having a hard time responding to the continuous attacks from Rishu. Rishu spoke. I see. You fought someone that is faster than me. Ragus was like that too. From Rishu's perspective, he should have taken him unawares. His speed was something Chiron and Leticia should have never experienced before. Their senses shouldn't have been able to register his speed. If everything was as it seemed, he should have wiped him out in the first exchange. However, he saw it. They registered his movement, and they had tried to respond. Their bodies were unable to carry out what their mind had processed. Still, they were able to minimize the damage they took. Chiron didn't answer him as he took on a fighting stance. Cold sweat was running down his back. If it wasn't for Azel, we would have died from the start. It was as Rishu predicted. The two of them had experienced movement that was faster than Rishu. 
they had experienced it through Azel. Rishu was fast in a different way from Azel. As a clone user, Azel could exist in multiple places at the same time. He could carry out many actions at the same time. His clones could freely move between its energy form and its form of substance. He could appear wherever he wanted at the moment he wanted to. He was able to pull off attacks in an instant. There was no delay in his control over his clones. In a battle, this could be called a form of extreme speed. Chiron and Leticia had fought against such an opponent. This was why they were able to react to Rishu's speed even if the end result was a WUFL. Suddenly, Rishu spoke. It has started. What are you talking about? Azel and Atane. Him. The expression on Chiron and Leticia's face hardened. They were late in realizing it, because Rishu had been letting out too much power. It was true. They could feel two incredibly powerful beings clashing against each other on the other side. Leticia glared at him. You are quite relaxed. Does this mean you are confident you can kill us at any time? Even if you are strong, you shouldn't become arrogant when life and death is on the line. You taught me this. I'm not that relaxed right now. You guys are formidable foes, and there is an extraordinary magician helping you. Rishu's eyes were glued to Kaalia. She was dead, so she didn't have a body. She didn't possess any dragon demon magic, and her access to the great darkness was restricted. She no longer possessed the same amount of power she possessed when she was alive. Despite this fact, she was one of the top magicians during the Dragon Demon War, so he couldn't take her lightly. Still, her attacks have been oddly lukewarm. I'm sure she is aiming for something. When he thought about the composition of their group, it made sense that Kaalia would support Leticia and Chiron instead of directly attacking Rishu. Despite this fact, he was having a hard time believing that was all Kaalia was doing. She truly was an extraordinary magician. She used her magic at the right place at the right time. This was why he hadn't been able to wipe out Chiron and Leticia in the first engagement. Her actions were restricting his movements to an annoying degree. He had to think about her past reputation. This couldn't be all she would do. He couldn't erase that nagging thought inside his head. Leticia made a sarcastic remark. Is that the assessment you came up with after you thoroughly investigated us? In truth, it wasn't like that. Leticia, let me ask you one question. Why are you opposing Atane? What? I can understand why Chiron is opposing Atane. Chiron is a member of human society, and he is a lord in their lands. Why are you on their side? Is it because you despise the dragon demon king worshippers? Unbelievable. Leticia let out a feigned smile as she asked a question. Why are you supporting Atane? Do you really think his crazy plan will bring about a paradise in this world? Do you really think everyone will be happy? I support him because I believe we need preventive measures. If the gods truly did make this world, they missed some important things in designing this world. Rishu had experienced a lot as he wandered around the world for the past 220 years. He had met a lot of people. He watched children turn into adults. He watched them turn old. He had given his love to others. Leticia was one of the people that had received his affections. Then he kept losing his loved ones. He experienced pain until he was sick of it. Rishu raised a fist as he spoke. Even if I am powerful, I cannot protect everyone in this world. In fact, I couldn't even protect one person. Even if one cared very much for others, they had to live their own lives at the end of the day. It was impossible to shadow them every day of the year. This was why a safety net was needed. Everyone knew this to be true. When humans formed a society, law and institution was established. Each member of the society worked hard to procure safety within the society. However, that's not enough. The safety net made by humans throughout history had been woefully inadequate. If someone broke the law, the lawbreaker got a punishment. There were countless times when this simple rule wasn't followed at all. As a result, the blameless became hurt. Those that were loved by everyone died. The ones with the bright futures died. Rishu couldn't stand that fact. That was why he had joined forces with Atane. There were people that avoided detection as they committed crimes. People used loopholes in the law to act with impunity. They carried evil deed without fear. In the world created by Atane, 
such incidents would never occur. There would be a monitoring system. The freedom to carry out evil deeds would be taken away from humanity. Ha! Leticia sighed when she heard Rishu's reasoning. She looked baffled as she shook her head. Rishu furrowed his brows at this sight. If you have something you want to say to me, you can. Rishu, you've definitely lived longer than me. Leticia opened her mouth. Since you've lived for a long time, you've seen more people than me. You've experienced more of life than me. I do not know about the life lived by normal humans. When I was with you, I tried to live amongst the humans. When I saw their lives, it was like watching a scene within a portrait. For most of her life, she had lived within the plane of darkness. She was, made, to be one of the candidates that'll become the heir to Almeric. When she was branded as a failure, she was thrown into hell. The only peaceful memories she had was the time she spent with Rishu. While she was his student, Leticia was able to live amongst normal people. She knew their names, and she had shared stories with them. She even did tasks that were mutually beneficial to her and others. When she looked back on it, it really was her best memories. There were times when she wanted to continue living amongst them. However, there was a flame of hate burning within her heart. Rishu recognized this, so he had pushed her to leave. In truth, she was thankful that he had done that. If he hadn't ended it for her, she would have been lost. The hate would have ate away at her. Leticia continued to speak. I used to think you were capable of doing anything. Yes, I was like a human child that looked up at an adult. I thought you knew everything, and I thought there was nothing you couldn't do. That's what I thought. He had lived amongst the humans under a mask called Jissel. Rishu was a skillful performer. He easily mingled with other people, and in a short amount of time, everyone became reliant on him, and they liked him. This was why she hadn't had this realization until that moment. She had been like a child that didn't know the worries of an adult. Leticia hadn't known about the truth within Rishu's heart. I understand it now. You aren't superhuman. At the very least, there is something I know more than you. What is it? You are talking about making the whole world into a greenhouse, and the humans will be your indoor flowers. You probably can't even imagine what it would be like living such a life. However, I can. I grew up in such a sheltered environment and it was hell. What? Rishu looked as if he couldn't comprehend what she was saying. Leticia let out a bitter laughter as she spoke. I was monitored and controlled by others. Others determined what was evil for me. I couldn't do what was considered to be evil by these people. That is the world you want. How do you know if the ones in control is good? Before Leticia escaped the research facility, she had been an experiment, and the ones in charge had made her life a living hell. The research facility was a closed world, and the ones in charge determined what was good and evil. They had violated the souls of the test subjects. I found out the truth when I came out to the outside world. Good and evil isn't something that is predetermined from the beginning. It was something people come to an agreement as they live in this world. Leticia had escaped, because she wanted to be freed from the pain. She wanted to live without being abused. At the time, she hadn't gone against them, because she didn't think they were evil. She didn't even think their actions were evil. There is no good and evil when carnivores eat herbivores. Good and evil is something made up by humans. I moved away from where I was born, and I found out that the good and evil in the outside world differed greatly from where I came from. You taught me that, Rishu. When Leticia came out to the outside world she was introduced to a new standard. Her worldview was shattered by what she learned from Rishu. It had shocked her to her core. From the perspective of the outside world, I was born and raised in a place that's perceived to be the hotbed of evil however, I'm not fighting them, because they're evil. So why? The simplest reason is I don't want to see them do well. Jeez. Did you expect some profound answer? Leticia snickered when she saw Rishu's dumbfounded expression. She continued to speak. Those bastards worshipped Atane, so he was the source of my pain. He acts like an absolute being, and he acts as if I should be satisfied with what he is offering. He wants me to fuck off, because he plans on giving me a paradise in this world. My life had been too harsh and painful for me to accept that. In the end, you don't trust Atane. 
Is that what it boils down to? Chapter 256. One person. Part 2. Rishu let out a sigh. He already knew about it. Good intentions wasn't enough. If Atain was behind it, there would inevitably be enemies that would oppose his plan. Leticia spoke. Trust isn't something that is built up so easily. You should think hard on it. What if Atain didn't do this when he was awakened? What if he hid his identity to work as a saint for a couple hundred years? What if he used his almost endless lifespan like that? My comrade told me this. Atain doesn't apologize for his mistakes. He doesn't try to compensate for his mistake. I mostly agree with that assessment. Leticia knew why Atain didn't act like this. Atain didn't consider it important to make relationships with the people of this era. Since he was living on a different time frame as others, he didn't feel the weight that came with developing relationships with others. It didn't matter if one was a man or a woman. It didn't matter which culture one was from. There are universal experiences that everyone shares. Even if it was a personal experience, one shared such memories with each other. As time passed, everyone aged. This was why an importance was placed on the relationships that tied one to others. However, Atain was already beyond such concepts. He only saw the difference in time between the humans and himself. He felt much more detached from humans than the animals of this world. This was why he didn't feel the need to apologize and give compensation to the people he hurt. He was working for humanity. This was why he had to make up for his mistake to humanity. From a Tyne's perspective, humanity was the presence that was equal to himself. The individuals making up humanity wasn't on equal footing as him. This was why he didn't feel the need to sacrifice his life for those individuals. He wouldn't delay what he considered important for them. I cannot let someone that lives by such principles ascend to godhood in this world. Leticia. It happened when Rishu let out a sigh. Leticia ran towards him. His breathing had changed for a brief moment, and she wouldn't let such an opportunity pass by. She ambushed him. If it was anyone else, he would have been taken unawares. However, Rishu registered the attack in a single beat, and he calmly used his pure copper technique to counteract the ambush. He started moving way later than Leticia, but he was able to comfortably block Leticia's spear stab. He counter her attack. Leticia's dragon soul was shaken. She endured the attack without being flung away. Guardian shadows moved in from both sides of her. It won't work. Rishu was calm as ever. His hands moved like the wind as he blocked all attacks sent towards him. He lightly stomped on the ground. The ground rang out as a wave of flame erupted to sweep his surrounding. Leticia, who had been withstanding the flames, created a wave of cold energy. Fierce winds erupted forth when the two powers clashed. Leticia gritted her teeth as she amplified her cold energy. In terms of abilities possessed by the dragon soul, she could never win against Rishu. However, she wasn't alone. Shout, soldiers of wind god. Chiron let out his cantrip as he swung his twin swords. His dragon soul roared, and the winds were directed towards Rishu. It caught Rishu's eyes. The power to control the wind and the power of the cold energy was combined to create a synergistic effect. The fierce snowstorm froze all the precipitation in the air, and the ice shards flew towards Rishu. It was an attack to be reckoned with. Since they were in a corridor, Rishu couldn't dodge the attack. He decided to face it head on. The red dragon's soul let out a roar as it wrapped itself around Rishu's fist. He punched towards the snowstorm. Flames erupted from his fist when he made contact with the snowstorm. The snowstorm looked as if it was capable of freezing the whole world. As if the snowstorm had never existed before, it became fuel for the flames. The flame didn't show any signs of slowing down as it melted the walls and it punched through the ceiling. Rishu wrapped his dragon soul around his body to endure the backlash of the attack. The guardian shadows appeared from below before the heat from the explosion could dissipate. They stabbed towards Rishu. The guardian shadows attacked him despite knowing they might be destroyed. Oh no. Even Rishu felt his blood curdled at the surprise attack. He was barely able to hit the ground running. Guardian shadows appeared out of both walls, and they sent their long-distance attack towards Rishu. 
Rishu bounced in the air in a dizzying manner as he blocked the attack. At that moment, a streak of lightning fell from the hole in the ceiling. It was a lightning attack that was on par in power with a lightning bolt. Rishu used his dragon soul to dodge the attack, but he became frozen in midair for a brief moment. Is it Kaalia? Leticia suddenly appeared in front of Rishu, who was gritting his teeth. Clone. The surprised Rishu tilted his head as he barely was able to dodge the spear. The side blade of the spear cut his face as blood sprayed out from the wound. He immediately kicked Leticia, but it felt as if he had kicked the empty air. It isn't incarnation. If it was a clone with substance, he would have felt some resistance. However, he felt nothing. Is it the same as the Guardian Shadows? He was taken aback for a brief moment, and at that moment, something stabbed at his senses. It was a mental attack. Rishu strengthened his mental defense as he repelled the mental attack. He jumped into the air. He planned on kicking off the wall to descend towards the ground. However, Leticia appeared once again in front of him. What is she playing at? Rishu used a lightning quick strike to destroy the guardian shadow that looked like Leticia. However, numerous Leticia appeared around him in an instant. They stabbed towards him with spears infused with cold energy. Rishu couldn't freely fly in the air. He didn't have that ability. He didn't have any place to place his feet in the air. His attacks were slowly starting to lose its power. He could see burning lights appearing in various locations. It meant powerful spells were being created at that moment. They are pretty good. Rishu didn't hesitate as he made the decision. The red dragon's soul roared as flame exploded outwards towards his surroundings. Guardian shadows, who had taken on the shape of Leticia, were swept away. Moreover, the spells that had been prepared by Kaalia were swept away too. Rishu used the rebound to fly into the air, and he stuck to the wall. He finally found a surface that he could place his feet. Guardian shadows appeared around him as they attacked him. Rishu didn't bother blocking each attack. Instead, he strengthened his dragon soul. He created a flame that blocked all of their attacks. Leticia let out a wave of white cold energy towards him. When he blocked it, Rishu realized that Chiron had jumped high into the air. Chiron descended from the air as if he was a hawk diving for a prey. March forward, Storm Dragon's army. As he shouted out his cantrip, countless wind bullets shot towards Rishu. Rishu used his pure copper technique to accelerate, and he broke apart all the wind bullets. At that moment, Chiron followed up with an attack that contained all of his power. It is useless. However, Rishu wasn't shaken at all. He had used the pure copper technique to stop the wind bullets, yet there was no opening for Chiron to attack. Rishu let out a counterattack. He attacked with perfect timing. His fist would would have struck Chiron's chest before Chiron's swords could accelerate. Ah, when his fist arrived at its target, something incomprehensible happened. Rishu's eyes widened. Until a moment ago, Chiron had been in front of him. So why was he seeing the wall right now? He should have hit Chiron, yet Rishu's fist punched the wall. As the wall crumbled away, Rishu realized what had happened. Dimensional distortion. Chiron had waited for the exact moment when Rishu would hit him. Then he activated a magical trap. Since Laura's Vitten's chalice wasn't here, Rishu had his guard down in regards to the dimensional distortion technique. He never expected Kaalia to be able to replicate the dimensional distortion in such an accurate manner. Rishu didn't even have the time to think. He threw his body forward. Leticia's spear barely missed, but the cold energy around the spear exploded forth. It hit Rishu from the back. It was almost a miracle that he was able to avoid being skewered by the spear. His back was frozen. He used his pure copper technique to accelerate. He spun his body in a flash as he extended his hand. Leticia was following up with another spear stab. He grabbed the spearhead with his hand. Rishu's body slid backwards as a cloud of dust rose into the air. It is a terrifying attack, but he felt his blood curdle by the attack. Rishu sealed the power imbued within the spear. When he tried to open his mouth, another Leticia appeared from behind him. Another clone. How many times will you use the same trick? Rishu was annoyed. His dragon soul responded to his emotions. 
It lashed out towards the clone. However, something unexpected happened once again. Rishu's eyes widened. Leticia's clone had stabbed her spear into his back. Up until now, he had easily destroyed the guardian shadows that looked like Leticia. However, this clone used exquisite body technique to dodge the dragon soul's attack, and she had stabbed him with her spear. Moreover, the strength behind the strike was powerful. It was enough to break through his dragon soul's defense. Incarnation. Rishu was in disbelief as he looked at Leticia's true form. Leticia didn't answer him. When Rishu was shaken by the attack, the spear unleashed its wave of cold energy. The pure white energy exploded. Around half of his body was frozen. He haltingly retreated. Leticia kept attacking in a ferocious manner. Leticia and Rishu were flung in opposite directions. He was able to hit Leticia even in such a situation. However, she wasn't the only enemy he was facing. Shit. You really taught them well. Azel. Rishu blocked the barrage of spells sent by Kaalia. Chiron had jumped in as soon as the spells ended, and Rishu was barely able to defend against Chiron's dual swords. Rishu was impressed. Leticia was using her secret card. It was the incarnation technique learned from Azel. Even if she had the aptitude for the clone technique, it was impressive that she had learned incarnation in such a short amount of time. Blood erupted from his shoulder. The blade, which he couldn't dodge, made a shallow cut on his chest. Chiron's kick impacted on Rishu's defense. Chiron used his dragon soul to concentrate the power of the wind around his leg. At the same time, he detonated the power concentrated around his leg. A terrifying amount of force jammed Rishu into the wall. Rishu was sent flying into the next room. He was barely able to kick the ground to lessen the damage. However, it didn't change the fact that he had taken a significant amount of injury. As soon as he regained his feet, a beam of light and lightning flew towards him. After Kaalia's spells struck Rishu, Chiron immediately used his long-distance attack. Rishu pushed through the explosion as he charged towards Chiron. What the hell? Chiron was shocked. Rishu had taken significant damage. He had looked off balance, yet he had pushed through the barrage of spells. Chiron was taken completely unawares. Rishu was powering through the spells, so he was slightly slowed down. If not, Chiron wouldn't have been able to react to the attack. Chiron was barely able to parry the attack as he retreated backwards. Rishu immediately tried to chase after him, but he stopped. He swayed on his feet. Fantastic. He was gravely injured, yet Rishu wasn't mad. He laughed instead. I haven't been beaten this bad in 200 years. That's an amazing record. Leticia looked tense as she glared at him. He had taken significant damage, yet the dragon demon energy emanating from him wasn't getting weaker. In fact, it was getting much stronger. We've used all the aces up our sleeves. They had used the dimensional distortion as a trap. Leticia even used incarnation, which was very incomplete compared to Azul's incarnation technique. It was mainly used to surprise Rishu. What else were they supposed to do to contend with Rishu? Rishu tried to gather his breath as he spoke. Let me apologize. It seems I've underestimated you guys. Are you perhaps going to say you'll show your true skills now? Are you going to say something so stale? No. I'm just going to change my mindset. Leticia was puzzled as she faced the oppressive pressure coming from Rishu. Even now he isn't showing any killing intent towards us. What is he thinking? He looked determined now. There wasn't any looseness in Rishu's eyes anymore. However, she couldn't feel any killing intent from him. This fact was too weird. What are you planning, Rishu? It happened at that moment. The dragon demon castle shook as if it was about to collapse. Chapter 257 One Person Part 3 Azel and Atain were fighting the fastest battle that had ever happened in this world. Since Almeric was dead, the two of them were the best clone technique users. No one could measure up to them. They immediately appeared wherever they wanted to appear in an instant, and they could dismiss their clones at any moment. The battle between the two of them had transcended the general concept of space and time. The darkness from the ritual was wrapped around him as the two men clashed with their swords. Each fighter took a step back as the sound of an explosion rang out. However, 
That wasn't the end. Clones kept flickering in and out around them like phantoms. The clones were clashing against each other. It caused sparks and shockwaves to erupt around them. Streaks of light and darkness slashed through the air as they intersected with each other. The two men were so fast that one could only see countless lines being drawn in the air. One could only see the sparks that erupted when the two lines crossed each other. Azel inwardly clicked his tongue. The darkness engraver has gotten stronger. The darkness engraver was the exact opposite in nature as the sky splitter. To be precise, Atain had copied the functions of the sky splitter when creating the darkness engraver. Regus had made that admission. However, the darkness engraver could never hold up against the sky splitter in the dragon demon war. Even now the difference between the two weapons were large. Azel held the dragon demon weapon called the moon sword in his hand. The sky splitter had turned into light as it moved within space. On the other hand, Atain still had his darkness engraver in his hand. He created streaks of darkness to counteract the sky splitter. He didn't need to do much else. The fight between light and darkness was taught. Was it because Atain's power had grown? Or was it because the dragon demon castle was a location that amplified Atain's power to the extreme? The ritual room could hold several hundred people, yet it was too small to host the fight between the two of them. The walls fell and a hole was formed in the ceiling. As if both of them had been waiting for this moment, they flew into the air as they fought. I cannot destroy the ritual using the after-effects of our fight. Azel had made that assessment. He even tried to attack the ritual a couple times, but the darkness above the magic circle swallowed up all his attacks. It was none the worse. There was a reason why Atain was so confident. He had reached the third stage of the ritual. If Azel wanted to destroy it, he would have to use all his strength. This was why Azel had given up on fighting within the ritual room. This is surprising. Suddenly, Atain mumbled to himself. Each clash made one's blood curdle. In terms of sword fighting, Atain was slightly at a disadvantage. In the Battle of Clones, he was being overwhelmed. Atain could create nine clones if he included the darkness incarnate. On the other hand, Azel was able to create 32 clones. However, the battle was even, because Atain was a magician. As a magician, Atain held the advantage in the size and quantity of magic he could use. He was like a moving castle, but at the same time, he could use his power in a dynamic fashion. This was why he wasn't at a disadvantage in this fight. Atain mumbled to himself. Dual banding. It is a very surprising technique. He has enough magical energy to contend with me. In the dragon demon castle, there were many devices installed that were boosting his dragon demon magic right now. Currently, Atain possessed much more dragon demon magic than the version of himself that had lost to Azel in the dragon demon war. However, Azel wasn't being pushed back. Azel had finished his dual banding, and in terms of dragon demon magic, Azel possessed more than Atain. Ha! I'm the one that should be dismayed. Azel clicked his tongue. Even if the dragon demon castle helped in boosting Atain's power to the extreme, his party had gone through extraordinary efforts to chip away at his power base. Six pillars of the great darkness had been destroyed. One of them had fallen recently when Regus had sacrificed himself. The darkness incarnate was also destroyed once in that fight. The darkness incarnate isn't in its normal state. Currently, the darkness incarnate was in its summoned state. However, the darkness incarnate was focused on using spells only. It was unable to use the incarnation technique. Atain knew about this deficiency, yet he remained unshaken. Come dragon demon weapon. White flame phoenix. Azel summoned a new dragon demon weapon. It was a large bird that was made out of white flame. It attacked Atain as it flew at high speeds. It is a mean-spirited attack. Atain let out a bitter laughter. He was being attacked by the white flame phoenix, which had been taken from him by Euron. It was like a bad joke. The white flame phoenix let out white flames as it let out the spells stored within itself. It blew apart a portion of the dragon demon castle. They finally broke through the dragon demon castle to appear on the surface. Azel had been trailing behind Atain, so he flinched when he came outside. The sky. 
If you were anticipating seeing the blue sky, you won't. I apologize. Atain replied. It was as if it was night outside. The sky was covered with a murky darkness. This was unlike a normal weather event where dark clouds covered the sky. There was a distinct curtain of darkness covering the sky, and it was blocking the sunlight. It covered the city and a distance of several kilometers. It was like the darkness that came with a starless night. I never expected him to make such preparations. Azel stopped breathing for a moment. The Dragon Demon Castle was at the center of the city, and exactly eight pillars of darkness were stretching into the sky. They were located at the perimeter of the city. This caused the enormous curtain of darkness to form in the air, and it had blocked out the sunlight. The sky splitter became stronger when it was exposed to external light. On the other hand, the darkness engraver became stronger in darkness. Their special characteristics were on the polar opposite end. In terms of when they were fighting the battle, Azel had the advantage. This was why he had given up on fighting within the ritual room. It was supposed to be day outside, so Azel had never expected this scenario. Come dragon demon weapon. Storms scream. Volcanoes giant. Breath of wind. With the massive darkness as background, Atain summoned Almeric's dragon demon weapon, and he let his clone wield it. Afterwards, an enormous giant made out of fire appeared, and it attacked the white flame phoenix. Since this was a battle between two beings made out of fire, heat started to burn everything in their surroundings. Then there was the half-translucent blue cape that appeared around Atain's shoulders. It fluttered as it started to rapidly change the air currents. Humph! Azel didn't let him do as he liked. He summoned the storm dragon's wing. It burned white on his back, and he fought for the control of the air currents with Atain. Aside from the space occupied by Azel and Atain, the region was swept up by a fierce wind. Everyone evacuate. We'll die if we get caught up in this fight. The people near the dragon demon castle screamed as they started to evacuate. They instinctively knew that the fight between the two of them would basically be a natural disaster. They made the wise decision. Azel and Atain hadn't used their full power, yet the area around the dragon demon castle was being brutally destroyed. Come dragon demon weapon. Azel immediately summoned new dragon demon weapons. He hadn't predicted this development, but he was in open space now. There were countless things he could do now that he wouldn't be able to do if he was indoors. Dawn's Defender. Underworld Ruler's Marksman. Box of Hate. Four clones made out of light appeared. Two clones were a silhouette of Kaalia, and the other two possessed the silhouette of Laura. They split apart as they supported Azel with their magic. Then Azel used his numerous dragon demon weapons to attack Atain. The Box of Hate created countless marbles of light. They flew in the air as homed in on Atain's spells. It detonated his spells. Atain furrowed his brows. Box of Hate. As always, it is a troublesome dragon demon weapon. Atain could freely use the dragon arts and magic, but at his essence, he was a magician. The Box of Hate was a natural enemy of magicians. When the owner of the Box of Hate was Azel, its power was beyond imagination. A box made out of light floated in the air as it dispersed countless light marbles. It was like watching a dandelion spread its seed. It continuously made the spells explode. Of course, Atain had a countermeasure. He created minor spells, so the light marbles created by the box of hate was wasted. The real spells were packaged with higher density of magical energy. These spells were sturdy enough to overcome the ability of the box of hate. This tactic had been used during the Dragon Demon War. However, this tactic consumed a lot of magical energy, and it limited what spells he could use. This fact hadn't changed. The Box of Hate wasn't the only thing that troubled Atain. One of Azul's clones was flying through the air, and he was shooting invisible magic arrows using the Underworld Ruler's Marksman. It flew at a speed several times faster than the speed of sound. Its destructive capability wasn't that high, but it could penetrate magical defense. It was also an unusually stealthy weapon. Hmm. Atain groaned. The box of hate was making him consume his magical energy to the extreme. The underworld ruler's marksman was eating away at his concentration. It was a dangerous combination of attack. 
In such a short amount of time, I can't believe he became so good at using the brand of paradise. Azel was using his cloaking technique on it, but Atain knew Azel had summoned the brand of paradise. The brand of paradise was imbued with the power to manipulate the flow of time. Amongst the dragon demon weapons, it was one of the most difficult power to control. Azel could use such a weapon freely. He used it as he instantaneously moved between his clones. He really is a monster. He really is my fated foe. Atain suddenly felt the treachery of fate. At the end of the dragon demon war, he had died to Azel once. Now they were in the distant future. His victory should have been guaranteed in this era. However, Azel had overcome his curse, and he had revived in this era. He had ruined all of Atain's plan. If Azel had died from the curse, Atain might have woken at a later date. He probably would have no trouble implementing his plan. He might have been able to hide his identity as he took his time to change the shape of the world. However, Azel had awakened in this era. Moreover, Carlos had made the Guardian shadows after he had sealed the god of death Belrun. Carlos was able to deliver the truth to Azel, so Atain was left with not many options. He was put in a bind. I'll sever all lingering feelings here, Atain mumbled to himself as he summoned a new dragon demon weapon. Come dragon demon weapon, moon of rest and anger. From beneath the curtain of darkness, an ominous red moon appeared. The red orb looked as if it was melting. Azul's face hardened. Is he planning to use that instead of the dream's apostle? Chapter 258. One person. Part 4. Moon of rest and anger. There was a clear weakness to this dragon demon weapon. He couldn't relocate it once it was summoned. It had to be unsummoned. Also, he couldn't use it with the dream's apostle. Both dragon demon weapons dealt with the mind and the spirit world. Their powers interfered with each other. The ability that separated the moon of rest and anger from the dream's apostle was. It's coming. It didn't directly attack the mind. It was able to create mental construct that had the ability to attack the mind. The melting red moon looked as if it was far up in the sky. On the surface of the moon, small shadows started to appear. They quickly grew in size, and they appeared in the real world. It messed with one's perspective when one saw the mental constructs appear. There were two extremely different mental constructs. The mental construct singing the beautiful song looked humanoid. However, they possessed luminescent eyes and wings. They were angels. The other type of mental construct looked like an ugly distorted version of a human. They were demons possessing wings of darkness. They were the angels of rest and demons of anger. They were beings that attacked the extreme ends of one's mental state. The angels of rest dealt with the positive aspect of one's mental state, so on the surface, their ability didn't look harmful. However, their ability was scary if it was weaponized. What happened if one's killing intent and hostile feelings towards a must-kill enemy was gone? What if one forgot why one was fighting? Unlike the dream's apostle, it is more powerful when used against a single entity. As a price, it is restrictive in how it could be used, and it is smaller in scale. Azel had faced both the dream's apostle and the moon of rest and anger before. He knew how dangerous they were. The angels of rest flew as they sang their beautiful song. It was mesmerizing. Azel and Atain continued to fight each other, but Azel didn't become careless. The mental constructs didn't have physical bodies, yet they flew at incredible speeds as they attacked Azel using mental waves. Azel strengthened his mental barrier as he used the sky splitter, which was in its light form. He attacked the mental constructs. Since the mental constructs weren't created using magic, the box of hate was ineffective against them even if they used attacks imbued with magical energy. They could be defeated using attacks that utilized mental waves. Still, Azel was being assaulted by their mental waves, so he was under extreme duress. It might have been better for me if I had faced the dream's apostle. The dream's apostle was different from the moon of rest and anger in the fact that it was used over a wide area. Moreover, it was user-dependent. Its effects were dependent on who was wielding it. It also meant that one had to exhaust one's mental power to use it. The moon of rest and anger wasn't like that at all. One had to summon it, 
and one just had to set the target. Everything else was automated. This was the advantage of using the moon of rest and anger. Shit. If only I had my dream sword. Azel missed the dragon demon weapon he had lost. When Azel had lost, Atane had chosen to use the dream's apostle. He had done so because Azel had possessed a dragon demon weapon called the dream sword. This sword also had influence over the mental and spirit world. It was the natural enemy of the moon of rest and anger. However, this dragon demon weapon had been passed on to a young hero of the Nadic Empire by Carlos. In the end, the young hero was unable to pass on the dragon demon weapon before he disappeared. Now let's. Atane raised his hand, and he pointed towards Azel. Azel was puzzled by the gesture. The center of the city exploded. Flames erupted from below. The magician's will wasn't used, so the only thing that could be sensed was the magical energy being moved around. There was no warning sign to the attack. Azel was barely able to block the attack as he flew into the sky. Then he looked down. Shit. Numerous magic circles of darkness rose up from various parts of the city. No, it wasn't just the city. He hadn't been able to see it, because the curtain of darkness had masked their presence. Numerous spells had revealed themselves from above too. No, it is too late. Azel let out a torrent of attack as he destroyed the spells stored within the magic circles of darkness. However, there were too many of them. I've already said this before. The outcome might differ if we were anywhere else. You were too arrogant in thinking that you'll be able to face me in the dragon demon castle. There were devices boosting his magical energy. Moreover, the darkness covering the sky wasn't all that was prepared by Atane. The great darkness was flowing through the heart of the dragon demon castle, and countless spells had been stored within it. In order to use those spells, he didn't need to waste any mental power. He didn't need to waste any magical energy. He just needed to choose which spells he wanted to use. The number of spells being used by Atane more than tripled. A tight equilibrium had been formed until now, but Azel could no longer match Atane. The clones, which had been placed in various locations, were swept away. Azel was sent flying, suddenly, countless magical storms erupted in the sky. It occurred several hundred meters up in the air, yet the aftereffect broke apart the land below. The shockwave destroyed the buildings, and the heat burned up the land. The fierce winds swept away everything. A scream escaped Azel's mouth. His last line of defense was the unyielding fortress. It had almost broken under the assault. Azel was barely able to right himself. In a flash, a dark silhouette appeared above him. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Shit. From beyond the dimensional distortion, a cursed darkness descended upon Azel. Azel, who had been pierced by the darkness, fell towards the ground. Smoke was emanating from his body. Soon, the sound of an explosion rang out, and a dust cloud rose into the air. Azel stood up from within a broken building. He swayed on his feet. He didn't have the luxury of staying down. If he didn't block the impending attack from Atane, he would be dead. Azel. Atane appeared in front of him. He didn't immediately attack Azel. Azel realized that a mere illusion had been projected in front of him. Atane spoke. I want to ask you something before I end this. You are treating me like already cooked meat. I admit that you got a decent shot in, but you shouldn't act as if you've already won. I'm not taking you that lightly. However, I determined that this will be the last chance I'll get to ask you this question. What do you want to ask me? I just want one thing. I want an answer to the question I asked you last time. Are you ready? Ha! Azel laughed as if he was baffled. On the day he killed Almeric, Atane had asked Azel to answer his question on the next meeting. My god, you were being serious. Of course. Do you really think I said all of that to deceive you? No. That isn't your style. Atane was a foe worthy of his hate, but he wouldn't resort to such petty tricks. Azel knew this to be true. Still, he couldn't understand Atane's action. Atane was giving him time to recover. Of course, Atane knew he was playing with fire. Why was he giving up such a golden opportunity in order to hear Azel's answer? Atane let out a bitter laughter. I know I am being foolish. The logical voice in my head is telling to drop this madness. 
However, I do not see you only as an obstacle that has to be overcome. If I can hear your honest answer, I'm willing to take the risk. Even if it might lead to your death. Life is just a battle that must be won. However, I'm not interested in just winning the fight. If I was interested in such a thing, I would have lived my life in a different way. Azel was speechless for a brief moment as he looked at Atane. No matter how much he thought about it, it was ridiculous. They were in a fight to the death, yet Atane wanted to hear Azel's answer. He even gave up his advantage to do so. This actually made Azel want to answer him. The importance behind this fight was so large that rationality was thrown out the window. This wasn't just true for Atane. It was also true for Azel. Ha ha ha. This really is ridiculous. In the end, Azel couldn't hold back his laughter. You make it sound as if it should have taken me a long time to come up with the answer. I could have given you your answer at that time. You ran away before you could listen to it. I'm sorry if I did that. Will you tell me now? I don't really need to explain my stance. The current situation is basically a form of answer. I want to hear the reasoning behind that decision. All right. Azel nodded his head. Atain, you've said it yourself. You aren't a god. Correct. From my point of view, I don't think you truly believe that. You aren't a god now, but you are trying to become a god. Why do you think that? Atain looked amused. Azel was indignant. He glared at Atain as he spoke. In the system you are trying to make, there are no place for humans. I don't know why you think your path is the way to reach true paradise, but I reject your idea. Atain had lost hope in humanity. This was why he had excluded traits of humanity from his system. He was trying to protect humanity, but he was trying to exclude the traits that made humans what they are. If I think about it, it was the same during the Dragon Demon War. Humanity didn't exist in the ideal world you dreamt about. You only thought about the Dragon Demon race, whom you believed to be slightly better than the human race. During the Dragon Demon War, Atain became disappointed in the Dragon Demon race too. This was why he decided on the goal of creating a system that will eliminate traits of humanity from the population. Azel shook his head from side to side. You aren't trying to make an ideal world for everyone. You are pushing a single person's standard of good and evil onto others. Everyone that lives within such a system will be living in a hell where they'll be able to achieve nothing in life. Atain, you are using selfish reasons to put humanity in a birdcage. Do you really think humanity would be, alive, in such a cage? Azel couldn't hold back his cynicism. You said you rejected the deification of yourself by the dragon demon king worshippers. You are deceiving yourself. You are merely a madman that is desperate to become a god. You lost hope in humanity. Laughable. He was sure of it. Atain wasn't someone that could live alongside humanity. He considered humanity to be a pet that he had to take care of. He was trying to put humanity into a bird cage, and he was trying to look after their needs. What else should one label such a being if not a god? If not a god, what would you call it? I cannot come up with a better label. I'll also tell you what my friend said. Carlos said this about your goal. Adults try to protect children. Those with power try to protect the powerless. Do you think humans do that because they are good? Why? There was a noble reasoning behind such actions. They believed that all humans had an inherent worth. Children grew up to be adults. Those without power could do things that the powerful couldn't do. There was no meaning behind the natural order. The idea of good and evil was an invention of those that possessed wisdom and will. Strength wasn't the be-all and end-all in life. When humanity began in this world, they started to put meaning behind everything. It continued to this day. It was the pride of humans, and at the same time, it was the self-conceit of humans. Atain wanted to steal everything from humanity and he wanted to raise them like cattle. You view humanity as an antidote that'll cure your loneliness, yet you expect humanity to live on the bread crumbs that'll be given by you. Who would be satisfied in living such a life? I see. Atain, who had been quietly listening to Azel's words, smiled. I am also a being that looks for meaning in humanity. I know that I am also someone that is seeking my own self-worth. That is why I didn't want to directly mess with human nature when making the ideal world. 
I'm saying that your premise is faulty. You've lived for a long time, so you should know this. During your lifetime, did the standard of what is good and evil stay static? Didn't it change countless times? So why are you now trying to take away the, the will of the people? Why should your own will be forced upon others? Above all else, is there a guarantee that you won't be worse than any other tyrants that existed in this world? Will you be better because you've lived longer? Is it because you are more talented than others? Atain was so talented that he was a godlike figure even in this era. However, this didn't make him a trustworthy person. Atain let out a forced laughter. I already knew all of this, but it cuts to the bone when I hear it from your mouth. You know this, yet you are continuing on with this. Azel, you've told the absolute truth. I won't deny it, and I won't look away from it. Would the loss be greater than continuous misfortunes suffered by humanity? Would the loss be greater than the blood and tears shed at the hands of evildoers? I won't. For the first time in this fight, Atain spoke with passion. His eyes were like molten lava as he stared at Azel. Atain heard a voice from the past ring out within his head. If you treat the world with hate, you have to be ready to be hated by the world. It was the human youth from the past. Atain could no longer remember his name, and in the grand scheme of Atain's life, it had been a brief encounter. However, he couldn't forget the youth's words. It was etched into his mind. His relationship with the youth had created an eternal wound, and at the same time, it had become the backbone of his belief. You should ask your question to the unfortunate souls that were killed by evildoers, who had power. You should listen to the painful cries of those that died without justice. They became demons just because they resented this world. But, at a time's shouted words, Azul's eyes turned sharp. A cold voice flowed out of his mouth. Blood and tears will not stop flowing in the world you will make. Do you really think there won't be any people that'll resent the world you created? I know that. There might be a small number of them. However, there will be those that might take up their sword against a god. The number might be minuscule compared to the people that are satisfied. Still, there will be people that'll fight. It'll be like what we did during the Dragon Demon War. There will be death upon death. Blood will flow like a river. There will be enough bodies to make a mountain. In the end, they'll try to break your birdcage. I'm prepared for it. Atain was resolute. Azel, who had been glaring at Atain, changed his expression. Then, his heartbeat resonated with the rings of life. The resonance started from his heart, and it spread to his extremities. His amplified power gushed forth with force. I'll end your madness here. Chapter 259. One person. Part 5. I'll end your madness here. When Atain heard his words, he looked perplexed. It wasn't as if he was surprised by Azul's hostility. In the short amount of time it took them to have a conversation, a frightening amount of dragon demon magic suddenly poured out from Azel. What did you do? I merely awakened the ninth ring of life I had put to sleep. Thank you for giving me that time. The building couldn't withstand the dragon demon magic emanating from Azul's body, and it started to fall apart. A beam of light punched through the falling building as it stretched into the sky. Afterwards, Azel used the storm dragon's wings to fly into the air. Atain, who had been observing the city from the sky, groaned. You've already finished making the ninth ring of life. Atain had thought he had gotten a measure of Azel's strength when Azel had fought against Almeric. In that fight, Azel had been driven into a corner, so he had to reveal the ace up his sleeve. He had revealed the existence of the extreme extinction technique. Atain had used this information as background to make his preparations for his victory. Even if Azul's comrades joined in on the fight, he was confident that he would be able to defeat them all. He never expected Azel to have hidden such power. The dragon demon magic swept over their surrounding like a tsunami. This simple action had the effect of working against the spells that went against Azul's will. It almost broke down the integrity of Atain's spells. Hmm. While Atain was groaning, Azel started creating clones of himself once again. They took up the dragon demon weapons that had remained summoned. The unsummoned dragon demon weapons were brought back again. Atain mumbled to himself when he saw this sight. Still, nothing will change. 
it was surprising that Azel had completed his ninth ring of life. If this battle had taken place anywhere else, Atain would have lost. However, this place was the Dragon Demon Palace. The Moon of Rest and Anger was continuously creating angels and demons. The numerous magic circles were pouring out spells. The number of preparations he had made was overwhelming in quantity. It was as if several hundred magicians were focusing their fire on Azel. Sir Azel was busy dodging. He was flying at high speed using the storm dragon's wings, and there was a torrent of spells trailing behind him. The flames exploded, and the cursed darkness continued to spread. The gale whipped towards him. The city had been made with magic, so it had been a grand sight to see. In a flash, the city was turned into ruins. You made a mistake, Azel. Azel flew through the city as he used the buildings to block the spells. Atain mumbled to himself as he looked down. Azel should have used the ninth ring of life as soon as the fight had started. If Azel had used this explosive power to overwhelm Atain, Azel might have won. However, Atain's magic had already took control of the battlefield. He had overwhelming power, and it couldn't be defeated by the power of a single person. At this rate, he might just run away. Atain thought about the possibility. However, it was pointless thought. Azel would only run away if he could fight another day. If Atain wasn't defeated here, there won't be another chance. Thunder Dragon's Horn. Azel, who had been in the city, quickly gained height. He shot blue lightning towards Atain. However, the attack never reached Atain. It crashed into the numerous spells in the sky, and it was extinguished. I guess it won't work. Azel grinded his teeth. Azel had awakened his ninth ring of life, yet he had no opportunity for a counterattack. In terms of personal power, Azel overpowered Atain. However, the resources available to Atain was too large. The problem right now was the fact that Azel's mental power was being chipped away. There was a limit to how long he could use his phenomenal mobility to dodge Atain's attacks. Atain was predicting Azel's path, and he was placing spells preemptively in Azel's path. Azel was mired in these spells. Oh no! The heat spread towards the surrounding. It was a trap that couldn't be dodged, yet Azel easily pushed through it. He was narrowly dodging all the magical bombardment, but a small mistake would be fatal. The magical storm destroyed the streets. Atain was shocked as he watched the explosions. What happened? For a brief moment, he lost track of Azel. Even if he was using the storm dragon's wing, Azel needed time to reaccelerate once he was halted. That meant, is this instantaneous movement? The detection spells placed all over the city was able to locate Azel a beat later, and the information was delivered to Atain. Azel was one kilometer away from where the explosion had started. The explosions had indiscriminately destroyed all the buildings in a straight line. Azel was a bloody mess as he glared at Atain. A wave of light moved over the destroyed buildings. As soon as Atain's eyes registered this light, Atain was attacked by Azel. Azel was moving several times faster than the speed of sound. He had used a form of the pure copper technique to accelerate himself. In a flash, he had crossed a distance of 200 meters. It was extraordinary. What ridiculous speed. Atain was taken unawares by his speed. He had been prepared for clones to attack him using their energy form. He was also reading the flow of magical energy, so his spells would automatically react to what he saw. However, Atain had never expected Azel to rush him with his true form, which was made out of flesh and blood. Azel attacked Azel attacked Atain like an angry wave. Numerous clones appeared as they attacked Atain like a storm. The sky splitter let out a wave of light. Every light within visible range gathered and exploded upon Atain. Atain was instantly overwhelmed by the attack, and his body was bounced around the air like a ball. Azel had summoned the maximum number of clones. He used them to block the spells that were converging towards him. The box of hate dispensed its light marbles, and it resisted against Atain's magic. Azel pushed Atain. Come dragon demon weapon. Chain of the earth dragon. He wasn't done with his attack. One of the clones summoned a thick chain with a weight at the end. He started to swing it. Atain and Azel had been locking their swords together. 
When the speed of the chain exceeded a certain point, Azel purposefully broke his stance as he kicked Atain. Then he struck the ground. As the explosion erupted, Atain's movement halted for a brief moment. At that moment, the chain of the earth dragon flew in towards Atain. The weighted end of the chain created an explosion. The explosion had a radius of several hundred meters. The chain of the earth dragon had power over the earth. When it hit its target, a massive impact caused the ground to crumble. Earth and rocks assaulted Atain. Azel, who was in the sky, brought down the sky splitter with all his power. Thunder dragon's horn. In a flash, everything turned white. However, it lasted only for a moment. Azel's face fell when his vision cleared in the next moment. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Shit. The large emptiness swallowed the lightning bolt. At the same time, a large emptiness that was a couple dozen meters away let out the lightning bolt. The lightning bolt carved the ground as it was sent in a different direction. When Atain was attacked, he immediately used the gatekeeper of emptiness, which was capable of connecting two points in space. This was how he had dodged the thunder dragon's horn. Him, Atain started rising into the air from a broken building. He wasn't untouched. He had dodged a critical blow, but his left arm had been broken by Azel's initial charge. The following attack had made him into a bloody mess. In terms of injuries, both sides had suffered similar level of injury. However, Atain was sure of his victory. This is why you put your ninth ring of life to sleep. There was a bitter laughter to Atain's lips. It isn't complete to the point where your body cannot sustain and endure that power. Azel groaned. He looked dismayed. It was as Atain had said. This was a tactic he had used to take Atain by surprise. He had purposefully hidden his magical energy, because his body couldn't handle that much magical energy. The vessel holding the magical energy had to get stronger as one gained magical energy. Azel hadn't been able to find that balance. It meant that Azel had to finish the fight as soon possible after awakening his ninth ring of life. However, he had failed. His energy pulse was unstable, and it was causing massive problems for his body. Your surprising speed using the pure copper technique. I'll call it the ultra-high speed pure copper technique. It seems there is a cost to using it. Azel was able to use the ultra high speed pure copper technique by using the massive power that was released by the ninth ring of life. He had the magical energy to be able to use it, but his body hadn't been able to endure the stress. You are an extraordinary being. You were chosen by this era, so all kinds of luck has converged upon you. However, the fact that you were able to reach this level in less than 30 years is a miracle in itself. While Atain was speaking, countless circles of darkness surrounded Azel. There would be no escape. The fight would end when Atain would activate the spells. Him, Atain was puzzled by Azel's expression. From Azel's perspective, he was in a desperately dangerous situation. Unless he had more aces up his sleeve, he was facing imminent death. So why did Azel have a grin on his face? It seems they were barely able to make it in time. What do you mean? Didn't you think it was weird, Atain? You wondered why I came alone. It was as he said. Azel's party weren't idiots. They knew Atain's power was amplified to the extreme at the Dragon Demon Castle. Yet they insisted on sending Azel to fight Atain alone. It was an unreasonable gamble. However, there are no hidden troops. Atain had been aware of the possibility that Azel's party members might have hidden themselves. He made preparations for the possibility of an ambush from. However, he couldn't sense them even now. Did they attack the ritual room while he fought Azel? That wasn't it either. The ritual was in its third stage. An attack by one or two people wouldn't be able to stop the ritual. He had set up detection spells in the ritual room, and he sensed no one in there. So why? Atain looked baffled as he looked towards Azel. Suddenly, a dizzying sensation washed over him. What is this? Atain knew this sensation. It was the backlash that appeared when magical energy escaped his control. In a flash, the magic around him escaped his control. The circles of darkness, which had been about to activate, collapsed. Even his stored magic went away, and the flow of magical energy in his body went awry. Ah, Atain swayed on his feet, and he was late in realizing what had caused this. 
Someone destroyed the seal to the abyss. Who did it? The abyss was the heart of the great darkness. The seal of the transcendent being buried below had been destroyed. Chapter 260. One Person. Part 6. A white cold energy was sweeping through the deepest part of the dragon demon castle. It was the hallway that was connected to the abyss. It was akin to water bursting forth from a breached dam. The white cold energy was terrifying. It froze the hallway as it pushed forward. If there was anyone alive, death was a certainty. However, there was only corpses remaining in the corridor. No, someone was still alive. It is safe now. After another wave of cold energy swept through the corridor, it died down. Suddenly, someone appeared in this space. She was a dragon demon female with long silver hair. It was Arietta. She looked haggard as she swayed on her feet. A hand suddenly appeared in the empty air, and the hand steadied Arietta. Are you all right? Laura revealed herself as she asked the question. The two of them had used dimensional distortion to avoid the wave of cold energy. Arietta replied as she relied on Laura's hand to hold herself up. I want to say I am fine, but, unfortunately, I'm not in a position where I can bluff. Ooh, orc. Arietta groaned as she sank to the floor. There was a thin layer of ice all over her body, and one of her arms was frozen solid. It was the price of the battle she had fought earlier. Laura was also in rough shape. However, she had fared better than Arietta. She used her magic to warm up Arietta's body. Arietta looked much better as she spoke. Queen of Frozen Land. She was nasty woman. There was a pillar placed below the abyss. Queen of the Frozen Land. She was a crazy transcendent being that wanted to make the world into a frozen paradise. Laura and Arietta had escaped from Rishu, and they had infiltrated the abyss. They had broken the seal. The battle had been fierce but short. In the end, they were able to eliminate the Queen of the Frozen Land using the extreme extinction. Arietta spoke. I am fine, Laura. You should go ahead of me. But, I cannot help you in this state. I don't want to be a burden. In the time it took us to finish the fight, the fight outside might have ended. However, if the fight is still ongoing, he'll need your help. Will you be okay? You no longer have your dragon demon weapon. Ha ha. I received it from Azel in the first place. Moreover, I'm not fighting this fight just for him. Arietta answered in a weak voice. In order to use the extreme extinction, she had to sacrifice the crying phoenix. There were two reasons why she had sacrificed the crying phoenix instead of the Vitten's chalice. First, she determined that the Vitten's chalice might be needed in the future. Secondly, she determined that the Vitten's chalice would be needed after the Queen of the Frozen Land had been defeated with the extreme extinction. Her judgment was correct. If they had sacrificed the Vitten's chalice, they would have died by the wave of cold energy emitted by the Queen of the Frozen Land. She had let out waves of cold energy in her death throes. The two women silently looked at each other for a brief moment. Laura nodded her head slightly. She used dimensional distortion to head towards the surface. When Atane realized what was going on, he was taken aback. They were able to enter into the abyss without my notice. The abyss was the most important location for Atane. This was why he hadn't been lazy in monitoring the abyss. However, his detection spells had not gone off. Laura and Arietta had wiped out the guards as they infiltrated the abyss. Atane hadn't known they were there until the seal to the Queen of the Frozen Land was broken. Atane was flustered, but he soon had the answer. It was Kaalia. Yes. As he gave the answer, Azel attacked Atane. Atane's spells had collapsed, so he had to block with his darkness engraver as he retreated. Azel planned on immediately pushing towards Atane, but he swayed on his feet. He had overburdened his body with his earlier attack, so his body wasn't responding to his will. Shit, she still had this much power. She completely owned me with that move. Atane quickly recovered his defensive magic as he mumbled to himself. He had placed restrictions on Kaalia's access to information, so he hadn't been worried about her. However, Kaalia had transcended his estimation. She was restricted from gathering information from the Great Darkness, yet she was capable of interfering with his flow of incoming information. Kaalia had hidden this ability, 
and she had used it at the most crucial moment. She had taken Athene unawares. I see. She used the delay that occurs when information is sent towards me. Athene realized how he had been duped. He had unfettered access to the information gathered by the Great Darkness. On the other hand, Ainsera couldn't handle the unfettered access this was why he had put a restriction on how the information could be accessed. He had been worried that unfettered access to the Great Darkness would damage Ainsera's sense of self. This was why the user was given only the information that was considered to be important. The priority of the information had to be set manually. When the Great Darkness received an information, there was a step before the information could be transmitted to Atene. Kealia used this fact to her advantage. Atene had made it so that they couldn't see each other's information. However, he hadn't blocked her ability to voluntarily send information towards the Great Darkness. Kealia used this inconsistency. She had sent a massive amount of fake information, and it had caused massive problems to the filter that sorted the incoming information. She used this state of confusion to sneak false information past the filter. Rishu had wondered why her abilities hadn't matched up with her reputation in their fight. While she was supporting Leticia and Chiron, she had been hiding Laura and Arietta's progress as they attacked the Abyss. She had hidden all of this from Atene. Atene queried him. You used all your power to keep me fully occupied in this battle. Was this your role in the plan? I didn't plan on dragging this out. If it was possible, I would have ended this fight already. It just turned out like this. I see. That's. Atene let out a despondent laughter at Azul's answer. If Atene had the time to check the veracity of the information, this tactic wouldn't have worked. Atene was a clone user, so he was very good at multitasking. However, both fighters had to use all their powers to fight each other. Atene didn't have the luxury of paying attention to anything else. What a stunner. I'll agree with what you said earlier. You aren't arrogant. I'm so thankful that you acknowledged that fact. It almost makes me want to shed a tear. Azel went on the offensive. When the Queen of the Frozen Land was unsealed, there were only five pillars left. Moreover, it was the pillar that maintained the abyss, which was basically the heart of the Great Darkness. Even if the Great Darkness had gotten stronger through the deaths of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, the Great Darkness couldn't function properly anymore. Atine's current state was proof of this fact. He had been freely using the spells stored within the Great Darkness up until now. This function was longer working. As the swords clashed against each other, the wind roared around them. The lines of light and darkness crossed each other. Atane and Azel was fighting with their swords at ridiculous speeds. At some point, Azel had retreated backwards. Atane immediately used his magic when he saw this. However, Azel was right back in front of Atane. It was as if Azel had never retreated. Brand of Paradise. His abnormal movement was pulled off by using the Brand of Paradise. It could manipulate the flow of time. Azel had accelerated time to throw off Atane's timing. He used the pure copper technique to rush Atane. After a beat later, Atane's spells exploded behind Azel. Atane had sent the spells after he set his target. This was why his spells missed when his timing was thrown off. It couldn't be helped. The explosion rang out as several buildings were demolished. Azel soared into the air as six clones appeared as they swung their lightning swords. Thunder Dragon's Horn. The bluish-white thunderbolt hit Atane. Atane was also using clones, so he was able to block four out of six attacks. He became a bloody mess when two Thunder Dragon's Horn hit him. He gritted his teeth. Atane let out a shout to quench his pain. In a flash, it felt as if he was having an out-of-body experience. When was the last time he had shown this much passion? He had let out a shout to overcome the pain that was ruling over his body. How long had it been since he did that? Azel rushed forward. He was using the ultra-high-speed pure copper technique. It was an attack that Atane shouldn't have been able to dodge, but... Infinite plane. When Azel stabbed with his sword, the space in front of him extended far into the distance. He got me. Azel's face turned white. He never expected Atane to place a dimensional distortion trap using his magic. On the other side of the faraway distance, a streak of darkness was moving away from him. 
Azel attacked. He tried to stop Atain by attacking the spell. The dimensional distortion should have been ripped apart like paper. Why didn't it cancel? Oh no. Azel realized that this was an intricate trap with two layers. Atain had used the dimensional distortion to stop Azel's charge. Azel had lost his timing and he was flustered. He desperately tried to block the incoming attack. However, he was deceived once again. When Azel focused his power on his defense, the dimensional distortion was withdrawn. Azel had diverted his power for nothing. Atain's real aim was waiting for Azel. When Azel returned to normal space, he was surrounded on four sides by constructs of darkness. Gatekeeper of Emptiness The dragon demon weapon called Gatekeeper of Emptiness used dimensional distortion to connect two points in space. Cursed darkness and cold energy appeared out of the construct of darkness. A vacuumous energy was also sent towards him. Azel was sent flying before he could even scream. He was barely able to surround himself with the unyielding fortress, but he couldn't mount a proper defense. He only stopped the attack for a brief moment. His defense shattered as he fell to the ground. Atain had suddenly been attacked too. He groaned as he fell to the ground. He was barely able to right himself before he crashed into the half-destroyed building. He laughed in disbelief. You were able to attack in such a situation. You've always been a ridiculous person. After the double-layered trap took hold of Azel, Atain used all his power to attack Azel. He even brought out a dragon demon weapon that he hadn't revealed before. It was called the Ice Forest. Azel was busy blocking this attack, yet he was able to summon two clones. The two clones had attacked Atain. The Underworld's marksman possessed a critical ability. It was able to pierce through most defensive magic. The bolts had pierced Atain's stomach and left shoulder. He suffered a serious injury. Atain. Azel's angered shout could be heard. The dragon demon magic rushed forward like a tsunami, and the spells meant to hit Azel from afar was swept away. Then a light started to extend into the air. Come dragon demon weapon. Master of raging waves. After he transitioned the sky splitter into its light form, he summoned a new dragon demon weapon. It was called the Master of Raging Waves. It could attack in the physical and spiritual realm. It caused the nearby buildings to shake as it ruthlessly collapsed to Tyne's spells. I guess the tables have turned. Atain realized that Azel had also prepared a trap, and he had baited Atain into this spot. There was a pillar of light stretching into the sky. It was the Sky Splitter. The Sky Splitter looked like a tree made out of light. Azel didn't hide the fact that he was manifesting the Sun Lightsaber. The injury to his body was large, but he had finished the jewel banding of his Ninth Ring of Life. He was able to create a clone that could freely use the Dragon Demon magic generated by the Ninth Ring of Life. As he started unleashing the Sun Lightsaber, he blocked his surrounding with the Unyielding Fortress. He used the Master of Raging Waves to stop outside interference as he made his move. On top of that, the countless light marbles from the box of hate blocked spells from being used around him. It was as if a fortress had appeared in the middle of the city. Azel wasn't done yet. The white flame phoenix was letting out white hot flames. The dawn's defender manifested as silhouettes of Laura and Kaalia. They flew in the air as they monitored the battlefield. Azel held air superiority. He had complete command over the domain he had created. Even if Atain was able to enter into this space, he wouldn't be able to interfere with his magic. Spells and clones had to be created outside Azel's domain. Are you trying to induce a final showdown, Azel? Even if Azel had massive amounts of dragon demon magic, he couldn't maintain this scenario for too long. This move would have put stress on his energy pulse in normal times, but Azel was seriously injured right now. It is a temptation that I can't pass up. Atain burst into laughter without even realizing it. He knew this was a trap, but he couldn't help it. He had to step into it. If he let Azel alone, he, Azel would be able to complete a move that might exterminate him. Since all the spells stored within the Great Darkness had collapsed, Atain had to move directly. He had no choice. Of course, Azel didn't let Atain do as he pleased. Azel's clones appeared. They were surrounded by lightning and they assaulted Atain. 
A Tyne's clones responded to the attack, and he counterattacked with the darkness engraver. As soon Attain defeated the clones with his sword, he kicked off the ground. He accelerated using the pure copper technique. The underworld's marksman barely missed him. Hoo hoo, it has been a while since I've charged a foe instead of waiting for them to attack me. Attain ignored the pain emanating from all over his body. He had thought his heart has turned cold, but it was beating now. He had always seen everything in front of him as lights that'll be extinguished in an instant. However, he was suddenly in the now, and he was swept up in a feeling of euphoria. Azul's clone was surrounded by flame as it attacked Attain. It was instantly defeated. Another clone came up behind Attain with exquisite timing. However, Attain didn't even need to turn his head. He crouched as he shot an elbow out backwards. When the elbow hit his target, Attain flipped backwards into the air like an acrobat. He split open the head of the clone. Even if the effect of the brand of paradise was used to its estimated maximum, it'll take him 17 seconds to finish the sun lightsaber. Attain passively gathered the information around him, and he acquired the answer he wanted. Even if Azel was able to accelerate the time using the brand of paradise, Attain held the advantage. The curtain of darkness was covering the sky, so it significantly slowed down the completion of the sun lightsaber. The lack of light made it very difficult for Azel to finish his move. 14 seconds. As he ran forward, Atain's clones appeared around him in ones and twos. Azel's clones went on the offensive, but Atain's clones weathered the storm using their magic. The clones opened up a path that would allow the real Atain to attack Azel. Come, oh, darkness, Atain shouted. Darkness gathered all around him. The Sky Splitter wasn't the only dragon demon weapon that could amplify its power. The Darkness Engraver was the antithesis of the Sky Splitter, yet it could be used similarly to the Sky Splitter. This battlefield was where the Darkness Engraver's power was at its zenith. 10 seconds. The Pillars of Darkness had risen into the air on the outskirts of the city. Parts of the Darkness broke away from the Pillars as it gathered around the Darkness Engraver. Darkness also descended from the sky. It was as if the curtain of darkness was letting out a downpour of darkness. It was sucked into the darkness engraver. A normal person would barely be able to see what was in front of their eyes in such darkness. At the same time, a clear outline appeared in the darkness as it pulsed. Come dragon demon weapon. Dreams apostle. Attain withdrew the moon of rest and anger. He summoned the dreams apostle. Azul's clones were no longer functioning properly. Until a moment ago, Azul's clones kept appearing several meters away from Attain. Now they had to manifest far away from Attain. Even if one was a master of using clones, mental energy had to be gathered in one place alongside magical energy to manifest clones. The Dream's Apostle had the effect of interfering and blocking the mental waves around Attain. 7 seconds. No one stood in Atain's way anymore. Atain shouted as he raised the sword made out of concentrated darkness. It is my victory, Azel. It was a mere difference of 5 seconds. Atain's secret technique was complete 5 seconds faster than the completion of Azel's sun lightsaber. Dark Sky Engraver. Chapter 261. One Person. Part 7. Atain put all his power into executing this attack. The enormous sword of darkness looked as if it would touch the sky. When it was brought down, it ruthlessly broke apart the domain being maintained by Azel. The white flame phoenix was cut into two. The light marbles, which were dispersed by the box of hate, continued to explode as they were extinguished. Even the domain created by the master of raging waves was ripped apart like paper. Finally, the unyielding fortress was sliced open. The only thing left was the enormous pillar of light. Even the pillar of light was cut into two by the sword of darkness. For a brief moment, darkness dominated everything. It really was the perfect moment. It was as if time had stopped. It felt as if this moment would stretch on forever. However, the moment passed, and the magical energy making up the pillar of light fell. The light magical energy hit the surrounding like a tsunami. It really looked like the city was being submerged by a tsunami. Everything around them was destroyed. The broken buildings were turned into rubble. The dragon demon castle, 
which had still remained intact, was swept away by the light. It was like watching a natural disaster. It was too solemn of a sight when one considered that only a single person had perished in this attack. Atain continued to watch as if he was mesmerized by the sight. Suddenly, he felt a frightening sensation. Someone is watching me. He felt someone's gaze on him. It wasn't one of the civilians, who had been swept up by the calamity. There was clear hostility directed towards him. An explosion rang out in the distance. When Atain turned his gaze towards the explosion, he saw one of the pillars of darkness fall. Someone had destroyed the facility that was emitting the darkness. It didn't end there. The second, third and fourth pillars exploded before Atain knew what was going on. The curtain of darkness started to fall. It is just one person. Atain was sure that there was only one culprit. While Atain was busy fighting Azel, this person had placed explosion magic within the facilities maintaining the pillars of darkness. This person had detonated the facilities all at the same time. It resulted in the curtain of darkness starting to fade away. Light started to filter in through the curtain of darkness. Hmm. Atain squinted when the sunlight suddenly hit his eyes. A blade suddenly came towards him. Atain was surprised. He blocked the attack, and he was flung backwards. He was perplexed, but he immediately realized that someone had connected two points in space to attack him. Ormsaurus, descendant. Atain caught sight of the dimensional distortion from the distance. Laura was glaring at him from the outskirts of the city. However, she wasn't the real problem. How? Atain's eyes widened. Azel was slumped over as he stood next to her. He was a bloody mess. The blue dragon demon weapon in his hand was burning up with a pure white light. The wave of light washed over the ground. Azel used the ultra-high-speed pure copper technique to pass through the dimensional distortion, and he attacked Atain. An explosion rang out as Atain fell towards the ground. He was barely able to kick off the ground. He rolled several times to lessen the damage. Atain threw up blood. Now, Azel swung his sword from the distance. Thunder Dragon's horn, a lightning strike, which was as sharp as a blade, hit Atain. Atain was barely able to dodge it. Azel followed up immediately with another attack. Atain refused to take it lying down. He moved backwards at full speed as he brought up his defensive magic. He let the force of the attack flow through him. The pure white blade and the pitch dark blade remained locked together. Azel yelled, let's end this ill-fated relationship between the world and you. They were entangled with each other as they flew at high speed. Azel rotated his body as he let out a kick. Atain was hit, and he was sent flying higher into the sky. The rebound sent Azel towards the ground. He once again used the ultra-high-speed pure copper technique to chase after Atain. Ill-fated. Ha ha ha. You are saying I have an ill-fated relationship with the world. Atain let out a bitter laughter. Atain used his clone to block Azel, who was charging towards him. Azel defeated the clone as he pushed higher into the air. The fight had taken only a brief moment, yet he saw several dozen circles of darkness appear in the air. The spells, which were charged within, were released at the same time. The light was so bright that it was blinding. The shockwave shook the heavens. Atain. Azel burst through the explosion as he charged Atain. The sword, which was burning with white light, was brought down towards Atain. Atain parried with the darkness engraver. A clear sound rang out. It was the sound that rang out when swords clashed against each other. However, this was the first time the pure sound of blades clashing against each other had been heard. What a pity. Atain laughed. Azel had brought down his sword with all his power, but the blow felt light to Atain. It seemed Azel's power had been depleted when he charged through the spells. After blocking Azel's movements, Atain spoke. This is the end, my fated foe. Yes, Atain felt puzzled by Azel's words. There wasn't a single ounce of despair in Azel's voice. What is he up to? It happened when he was trying to end the fight by setting off his spells. Azel's sword, which had been stopped by his darkness engraver, resolved into a different appearance. Since the blade had been surrounded by a burning light, the only part that was visible was the hilt of the sword. 
Atain was appalled when he saw the subtle change. Moon Sword. He had thought the sword was the sky splitter. While the blade was burning with white light, it didn't have the blue luster of the sky splitter. It was the Moon Sword, which Azel had inherited from his teacher. The sword cut space before Atain could question anything. Ah, Atain's eyes widened in disbelief. The darkness engraver had been broken into two. Moreover, there was a deep cut to his body. Red blood sprayed into the air. I see. Atain was in a state of shock, but he acquired his answer before he fell to the ground. Is it the extreme extinction? It was the third form of the extreme extinction that had been displayed during the fight between Almeric and Azel. Azel had manifested it through the moon sword. Suddenly, a shadow appeared above Atain's body. The sun was on Azel's back as he looked down at Atain. Once again, he was opening his mouth when he threw up blood once again. This wasn't the first time he had experienced this. This was the sensation he had experienced at the end of the Dragon Demon War. The sound of death's footsteps was getting closer. I've been had by Carlos and you. There was blood around his lips as he smiled. Azel nodded his head. Yes, I would have lost this fight without him. He had openly used the sun lightsaber to bait Atain. He used it to set up his next move. Azel used his clone to maintain his trap as he hid his true body. He waited for the right moment. If it ended there, it would have been optimal for Atain. However, Atain had pushed through Azel's trap, and he had destroyed the Sky Splitter. At this point, Azel wasn't able to immediately resummon the Sky Splitter. In such a situation, Azel had done something very bold. He made the Moon Sword look like the Sky Splitter and he had charged forward for the final attack. It was to take advantage the preconceptions that had been ingrained into Atain by Carlos and Azel. In order for Azel to use the extreme extinction, he had to activate the sun lightsaber using the sky spitter. The version of the extreme extinction left behind by Carlos could only be used by magicians. It was done through a magician sacrificing a dragon demon weapon. These intricate lies had been created, so Azel could take advantage of this exact moment. Magic isn't the only way it can be used. I never expected that to be a lie. Atain sounded dejected as he laughed. The variation of the extreme extinction technique had been left behind by Carlos. In truth, it wasn't a technique that was exclusive to magicians. Spirit order users could also sacrifice their dragon demon weapon to recreate the extreme extinction. It was the same as how Arietta was able to use the extreme extinction by sacrificing the crying phoenix. If my teacher knew that his dragon demon was sacrificed in order to kill you, he would have been satisfied. He had sacrificed the dragon demon weapon left behind by his third teacher Liglan. The moon sword symbolized his special relationship to his teacher. Azel was proud of the absolute knowledge that the sacrifice had been worth it. Atain mumbled to himself. In the end, I couldn't overcome the world's hatred. If you treat the world with hate, you have to be ready to be hated by the world. Azel mumbled those words without realizing it. Atain looked at Azel with glassy eyes as he spoke. A human taught me those words a long time ago. I am sad. In the end, I couldn't change anything. Atain was truly sad. He wasn't sad about his own death. He had been tormented for a very long time. He had been lonely living in a different time frame compared to everyone else. He strangely felt relieved when he realized that it would come to an end. However, his death wouldn't change the fate of humanity. Oh Azel, the fate that'll greet humanity won't change, I know. You are a sage that was able to unravel the truths of this world. The calamity, which you predicted, will come someday. Unimaginable amounts of blood will flow. The world will be covered by a tsunami of hate. Even if that is true. Azel sighed as he spoke. It isn't something you can handle on your own. From the beginning, it was an undertaking that you shouldn't have taken on by yourself, Atain. It is something we all have to overcome. This includes our descendants. Humans shouldn't give up on everything. They shouldn't cling on to you as if you were a god. No one had the right to live someone else's life. Even if their destinies were preordained by the gods, everyone had to live their own lives. That is why you should sleep now, Atain. You've done your part. 
the knowledge dug up by Atain would be passed on to humanity. Humanity would use this knowledge to make preparations. They'll fight the inevitable calamity that'll hit them in the distant future. I see. Atain let out a faint smile. Somehow, there was contentment within his smile. That will do. It seems my life wasn't a waste. He was a man that had feared the loneliness that came along with living an eternal life, so he had tried to change the world. He had looked down on the world, but now he accepted the fact that he was just one of the people living in this world. He closed his eyes. Ain Sarah was deep within the dragon demon castle, and she was waiting for the battle to end. When she was with Atain, she showed feelings of love. She showed the semblance of herself before she had lost her sense of self. Currently, she just sat on a chair with a blank expression on her face. She looked like a doll staring into empty space. Atain might lose. He might die, yet she didn't look worried at all. She looked empty. A darkness started to appear in front of her. King. It was as if her previous self had been a lie. Vivid emotion started to appear on her face. She looked as if she wanted to cry as she ran towards the darkness. A man appeared from within the darkness, and he embraced her. He was a dragon demon with long black hair and thick black horns. It was Atain. I'm sorry. Atain whispered in her ear. It was enough. He didn't need to explain any further. Ain Sarah understood everything. Ain Sarah remained in his embrace as she nodded her head. No, my king, I asked you to wait for a very long time, yet I was unable to do anything for you. Do you not resent me? I gave up on such emotions when you became mine. If I can be with you, it is enough. My time with you may only be a brief instant of your life, but I am satisfied by the fact that you look towards me. Atain looked like he had been sucker punched by her words. Ain Sarah smiled as she looked up at him. Finally, she opened her mouth. I don't want to be alone. Please take me with you. That isn't necessary. I will no longer be here, but you still have. Ain Sarah quietly raised her hand, and she placed it over his mouth. She looked straight into his eyes as she spoke. I am merely an empty doll in a world without you. If you are gone, I have no reason to live. I am sorry. Those aren't the words I want to hear. Ain Sarah shook her head as she looked intently into Atain's eyes. Soon, he let out an abashed laughter as he nodded his head. Thank you. Atain gently hugged her closer. Then the turbulent darkness swallowed the two of them. Forever. Rishu let out a bitter laughter as he mumbled to himself. In the end, it turned out like this. Atain had delivered a message through the great darkness. I'll leave everything in your hands, Rishu. I'm sorry for requesting this task of you. It will basically amount to a penance. I wish you the best in creating a new world. Atain had always prepared for the possibility of his own defeat. That is why he had set up a site called the Plain of Darkness during the Dragon Demon War. It was a place of refuge that would assure the survival of his defeated troops. He had also prepared a plan for those that had followed him. At the end, Atain had asked Rishu to take command of his plan. Rishu already went down a path of no return, so he accepted Atain's request. Rishu, as the corridor fell, he could hear Leticia's scream. Half of Rishu's field of view was obstructed, but he met eyes with Leticia. Do you really think I'll let you run away? She growled as if she was ready to hunt him down. However, she had spent all her power, so she was swaying on her feet. Chiron had also used up all his power. The only one that looked fine was Kaalia since she didn't possess a real body. I'm glad I don't have to kill you. Rishu meant it. Since he had to fulfill a Tyne's request, he didn't show any killing intent towards them. His goal had always been to keep them occupied until Azel and Atain could resolve their fight. If Atain had won, he would have had to kill Leticia and Chiron with his own hands. Atain's defeat was a bitter pill to swallow, but it brought him some comfort that he didn't need to kill the two of them. I'm sure you won't see me for the rest of your lifetime. Rishu said his goodbye. Please live happily, Leticia. You deserve it, Rishu. When Rishu turned around, the ceiling collapsed. Leticia looked despondent when she saw this. Soon, she lost strength in her legs. She collapsed to the floor. Shit. That soft bastard. Chiron was behind her. He sighed as he watched her rage. He was just messing around with us. 
The feeling of defeat filled his heart. If Rishu wanted to kill them in the first place, the fight wouldn't have lasted long. He was well aware of this fact now. On the other hand, he also felt a sense of relief. It wasn't because his life had been spared. Chiron was sitting on the floor as he looked at the back of Leticia's head. He scratched his head. It is infuriating, but he was like a parent to her. Maybe, it may have been for the best that she wasn't able to kill him. If they were able to kill Rishu, it would have been their victory. However, it would have also been a tragedy. Chiron had such thoughts as he looked towards where Rishu had made his exit. Since it turned out like this, you should go somewhere far. Never show yourself again. That would be for the best for both of you and Leticia. Kealia was behind Chiron, and she looked perplexed as she mumbled to herself. Pioneer plan. Azel and Laura was flying above the ruined city. Laura was perplexed as she mumbled to herself. No matter how hard I try, this city had been her home for a very long time. If she closed her eyes, she could vividly remember every inch of the city. I cannot believe it. However, the only thing she could see was the totally demolished city. It had been a majestic city only a couple hours ago. She felt complicated emotions when she saw this sight. It didn't matter if she liked or hated this place. It was her birthplace. Most of her past memories occurred in this place. She felt sadness wash over her when she realized she'll never get to see the home she remembered in her memories. At the same time, she felt the oppressive weight of fate no longer pressed down on her. She felt a sense of freedom. So why did she feel desolate instead of being happy? Azel, who was flying next to her, suddenly spoke. There will probably never be a fight like this. Really? I hope so. Laura looked at Azel, who was sighing. She let out a ghost of a laughter. It'll be fine. She didn't know how she'll live from now on. It was a thought that terrified and frustrated her. However, it'll be okay. She had someone next to her that'll guide her in life. She held up the Vitten's chalice as she looked up at the sky. I hope so. It was as if a large teardrop was floating in the sky. It visibly distorted the sky. It was the heaven's tear. Since Azel couldn't summon his sky splitter for a while, they had to use the next attack with the highest amount of destructive capability. They had to use the heaven's tear to destroy the ritual. First, she evacuated all allies from the dragon demon palace. Azel chose the target, and she opened the road of tears to the location. Then, release. She let out a small whisper, and she released the massive amount of sunlight gathered in the sky. The enormous pillar of light passed through the path of tears, and it hit the underground facility of the dragon demon castle. An enormous explosion detonated, and light erupted towards the surface. The dragon demon castle couldn't withstand the damage, and it cratered into the ground. A massive cloud of dust rose into the air. Laura and Azel sensed the terrifying amount of magical energy, which had been underground, ceased to exist. Azel watched it until the end. His face relaxed as he mumbled to himself. It's over. There were a lot of emotions within that short phrase. As a sense of relief washed over him, he recalled the faces of many people. He remembered his comrade from long ago. He recalled the faces of the people he met in this era. He could finally stick his chest out as he spoke these words. The long fight was finally at an end. We've won. It really is over. Azel let out a bright smile as he reveled in this truth. Chapter 262. Epilogue. Part 1. After Atain was defeated, the dragon demon castle was demolished. The heart of the plane of darkness was destroyed, and the long fight waged by the guardian shadows came to an end. However, this didn't mean that their work was done. The great darkness still existed in this world. More pillars of darkness had to be destroyed to completely eradicate the presence of the great darkness. Moreover, there was an immediate problem they had to take care of. There were still remnants of the dragon demon king worshippers. The plane of darkness possessed five small cities, and many dragon demon king worshippers had been dispatched into the outer world. The remnant of the dragon demon king worshippers would come flooding back. The suicide squad was tired and injured right now. They were running out of medicine, supplies and equipment. They would have to break through the waves of dragon demon worshippers to escape from this place. 
The suicide squad was ready to fight to the death, but they soon received a shocking piece of news. The five small cities within the Plain of Darkness was empty. While the Dragon Demon Castle was being destroyed, everyone within these cities had evacuated to some unknown location. They were basically ghost cities. It was the same for the troops that had been defending the waypoints and the Pillars of Darkness. Of course, the Guardian Shadows were taken aback when they realized all the Dragon Demon King worshippers were gone. Kealia found out the reason behind their disappearance when she regained access to the Great Darkness. Pioneer Plan. It was a plan that had been prepared alongside the construction of the Dragon Demon Castle. It had been prepared near the end of the Dragon Demon War. Rishu was in charge of carrying out the plan now. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were embarking on a new future. He could hear the sound of the waves. An enormous ship was crossing the ocean. It was a ship that was larger than any ship built in the history of this world. It was so large that it could be called a small island. The ship's hull was colored black. The sail and the power of magic allowed the ship to cut through the waves. There wasn't just one boat. There were 33 ships traveling as a fleet. A dragon mage and female with long black hair and cold blue eyes was standing atop the deck. She looked out at the horizon. She had been working as Nibiris' aid until Nibiris betrayed the Plane of Darkness. Regina was thrown out from the Dragon Demon Castle afterwards, and she chose to reside in one of the small cities within the Plane of Darkness. On the day of the final battle, Regina had heard the voice of Atane ring inside her head. My comrades, you have participated in my plan, and we stand at the crossroad of our fate. Atane knew that everything he had worked for was in danger of collapsing. It would be great if he had won, but there had always been the possibility that he might be defeated. This was why he had worked on finding another future for his people. The residents near the Dragon Demon Castle, who were embroiled in the fight, was excluded from the order. All the other Dragon Demon King worshippers were ordered to gather in one location. They were told to wait for the result of the fight. They gathered at the eastern tip of the continent. They were at the Atazan mountain range, and it was a place beyond human reach. Only a very few number of people knew about this location. Another plan was put in place when Atain had built the Dragon Demon Castle long ago. When Atain's death became known, his plan was revealed to the scared and saddened Dragon Demon King worshippers. Pioneer Plan. Atain had used his great magic to find a new continent. He had chosen to immigrate his people to the new world using his fleet. A new land across the ocean. Regina absent-mindedly mumbled to herself. After Atane was awakened, a chosen group of people had been put in charge of preparing the pioneer plan. He had built the Dragon Demon Castle for the possibility of him losing the Dragon Demon War. He had done the same thing by preparing another backup plan. The foundation of the Pioneer Plan had been laid down before the Dragon Demon War had begun. He had put dozens of years into preparing this plan. It was considered short if Atain took only several dozens years to complete a plan. There were some plans that took several hundred years to finish. Aside from the Road of Emptiness and the Dragon Demon Castle, the rest of Atain's plan had remained incomplete after his death. The Pioneer Plan was one of the incomplete plans, but it had been at the final stages of being completed. The plan just needed some finishing touches to be completed. However, there had been a lack of manpower and supplies to finish the plan near the end of the Dragon Demon War. The Pioneer Plan was finally finished after it was halted 220 years ago. It occurred after Atane was revived. As civilizations grew, their technology and skills naturally developed. Their search for knowledge did not remain confined to their continent. The Auru Archipelago was located in the Western Ocean. The Brikra continent was located across the Southern Ocean. Still, the Northern and Eastern Ocean were uncharted territories for humanity. The North contained the Plain of Darkness. The Atazan mountain range, and the Alberton formed an impenetrable barrier to the South. This was why humanity was blocked from exploring towards those directions. Some tried to explore the north and south through the ocean. They were met with natural and artificial phenomena like giant whirlpools and the fog of the water god. Atain had defeated a transcendent being called the water god a long time ago. In the process, 
he found out a route that would allow him to bypass these obstacles. Moreover, he was able to use the Great Darkness to observe the new continent, which was across Eastern Ocean. There were no humans and dragons living on this uncharted continent. In fact, no intelligent races occupied this territory. If Atain had won and survived his battle, he would have used the pioneer plan to extend humanity's territories. He planned on creating new possibilities using this land. However, he had lost. In his death, he ordered his people to embark on their new future. Rishu was sitting inside of the captain's room of the lead ship. He was going over a report. The fleet was made out of 33 ships, and there was a communication line being maintained through the great darkness. They didn't have to waste paper to create reports. They could exchange information through the great darkness. Food is our biggest worry. Rishu mumbled to himself. It had been 10 days since the fleet was put out to the ocean. They could use the power of magic to transform the ocean waters into drinkable water. Their water supply wasn't a problem. However, they were short on food. They hadn't been able to scrounge up enough food before the final battle had started. I think we should start fishing now. The one to make the suggestion was a dragon demon youth sitting next to Rishu. It was Jeffers Almeric. During the final fight, he was dispatched to protect one of the pillars. This was why he hadn't participated in the final fight, and he became included in the pioneer plan. He had the status symbol of being the descendant of Almeric, so he was widely accepted by the dragon demon king worshippers. Rishu had also rescued him twice before, so he had made Jeffers an officer under his command. Jeffers had been a big help in taking care of the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Rishu spoke. Fishing. I guess that's our only choice. Does anyone have experience with fishing? No. It is to be expected since we never fought near the ocean. We'll have to rely on the magicians to fish. It would be optimal if we are able to find an island along the way. It would be great if we are able to find one. Jeffers sighed as he spoke. Atine's plan only gave the route that'll get him to the new continent. Overall, the information had been lacking. Atain had used the abilities of the Great Darkness to observe and glean couple crucial information about the new continent, but he didn't know much else. Atain hadn't had the time to explore and expand on the information he had gathered. Suddenly, Jeffers spoke. Do you think we'll do a good job? We have to do a good job. Are you not confident? In truth, I'm not. This is my first time doing this. It is also my first. Rishu chuckled when he saw Jeffers' expression crumble. It is understandable that you are nervous about this venture. I'm nervous too. You don't look like you are nervous. I have to be like that. You've been in positions where you had to lead men. The leader always has to be confident even if you are hitting a rock with an egg. Him. Jeffers groaned. He felt frustrated. From the moment he was born, he had always walked the path designated by someone else. It didn't matter before or after Atain was revived. He always believed that the path pointed out by his superiors was the right one. This was why he was anxious now. In some ways, he was still living his life the same way as before. Atain was his god, and Rishu was in charge of carrying out Atain's will. However, Atain hadn't been able to completely discern the future. They were being given a blank canvas to work on. Would they really be able to do well? Suddenly, Rishu spoke. I was thrown into this world with only my name. I left the Alberton Forest to understand humans, and I was afraid and nervous at the time. It comes with the territory when you are trying to discover the unknown. However, if I gave up before I even attempted it, I would have never been able to bring about any change. Even if I am afraid, I shouldn't try to dodge an unavoidable fight. You are saying I shouldn't think about the consequences. I should hit it hidden. That's exactly it. It probably differs from what you learned from the plane of darkness, but I know you aren't saying we should willingly die for our noble mission. Jeffers sighed. Suddenly, Rishu spoke. It had been a blur since we've started our voyage. Somehow, I get why Atain gave this mission to me. Do you know why he did so? He appointed Rishu Nim as the Dragon Demon General. You have the right pedigree to be in charge of the Pioneer Plan. Also, you have the power to control everyone if needed. Jeffers gave his answer. 
It was the reasons why everyone accepted Rishu as their leader. There were many problems percolating within the ships. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were beings bred and raised on fanaticism within the Plane of Darkness. The Dragon Demons were on top of their social class. Humans were placed at the bottom. They had lived within such class system. When Atain was revived, all their values and beliefs were shattered. They were shocked by it. It also didn't mean their personalities changed after they learned the truth. The principles of fanaticism, which had been established from their birth, still had a hold over them. Above all else, the word of Atain was important. He was the god. However, Atain was dead now. There was a state of uneasiness in the ships, and it felt as if a problem would arise at any moment. It was a ticking time bomb. This was why it had been wise to have placed Rishu as the leader. He had both the pedigree and strength to be the leader. Rishu spoke. In practical terms, you are right. The elders of the plane of darkness no longer exists, but the problems they created remains. If drastic measures are needed, the leader must be able to take control through power. The survivors of the Dragon Demon War and the elders of the Plane of Darkness had been gathered inside the Dragon Demon Castle. They had done so at the order of Atain, and they had been wiped out in the final battle. This was why they weren't part of the Pioneer Plan. It was unknown if Atain had purposefully done this or it was a simple coincidence. As the leader of the Pioneer Plan, their absence had been a huge boon for Rishu. However, those weren't the only reasons why Atain chose me. Even if Almeric, Orsaurus or Baldazark survived until the end, Atain would have chosen me. Why? This will be my first. What do you mean? Jeffers looked as if he couldn't comprehend his words. Rishu spoke. I've never been a king before. Ragus, Almeric, Orsaurus and Baldazark had lived for a very long time and they had been kings before. They had fought for their ideals, and they had become worn down by reality. This was why they had entrusted their dreams to Atain. However, Rishu had never attempted to achieve his ideals through his own power. I've always lived in a world created by others. It started in the Alberton Forest. It was the same when he wandered around the human's world. It continued when he had allied himself with Atain. From Atain's point of view, his lack of experience as a ruler was a merit in Rishu's favor. It made Atain want to entrust the future to Rishu. Rishu knew about the various facets of the world. Moreover, he had created the dragon soul. It had been several thousand years since the dragon demon weapons had been created, and he had created a new possibility through his own actions. I think that is why he did it. He wanted to entrust the future to an unknown quantity. Atain hadn't revealed his inner thoughts to Rishu. He just told Rishu about the pioneer plan, and in the case of his death, he would entrust the future to Rishu. He told Rishu to make a good world as he saw fit to make it. Atain left me a big burden, so I have to take on the responsibility. From now on, I'll borrow the name of the god called Atain. I plan on acting as an apostle that follows the words of a god. You'll be his apostle, isn't that what I am? Rishu shrugged his shoulders. Rishu had to change the way of life of the settlers from now on. It was a lifestyle that was ingrained into them. From the moment of their birth, these people had lived as slaves to their fanaticism towards Atain. Rishu determined that the easiest way to change their behavior was through using the God's words. The dragon demon king worshippers had grown roots in the plane of darkness for the past 220 years. They left behind their lives without any fuss, and they were participating in the pioneer plan without causing any trouble. It was all thanks to Atain's presence. If Rishu tried to minimize Atain in any way, it would cause confusion and backlash amongst his people. At some point, I won't need to use such facade. The dragon demons, dragon magians and humans would overcome the confusion of change that came with generations changing. They would do so by following Atain's words. In the distant future, humanity in their homeland will forget about their hatred towards Atain and the dragon demon king worshippers. When that time comes, we'll be able to reunite with the people of our homeland. We'll be able to forge a different relationship with them. If possible, I want to live long enough to witness this. You'll have to live for a very long time. I guess so. Well, it is merely a wish.
Rishu didn't know how long his lifespan was. He wasn't sure if he'll be able to transcend his lifespan. Anyways, he'll be with the settlers for a very long time, and he'll be able to steer the future of the new world. Rishu looked at the navigation map on the wall as he spoke. Now that I think about it, the new continent has no name. There are no indigenous people there so no name has been given. The name has already been chosen. Is it the Rishu continent? Is that supposed to be a joke? Rishu clicked his tongue as he raised a pen to the map. He wrote a name atop the new continent. Atain. Chapter 263. Epilogue. Part 2. She stood atop a windy mountaintop, and her long black hair fluttered in the wind. The owner of the long hair was a young and beautiful dragon demon woman. It was Nibirus. She had been watching the horizon for a long while. Someone approached her. He was a dragon demon with beautiful blonde hair. It was Kieran. Nibirus. After Sibane and Ragus had destroyed the Pillar of Darkness, Nibirus and Kieran had escaped to the Alberton Forest. When they arrived at the Alberton Forest, they were told of Atine's defeat at the hands of Azel. The two of them resided in the Alberton Forest as guests for the next month. Kieran spoke. Alberton Nim is looking for you. Nibirus turned around to look at him. There was a soft smile on her lips as she spoke to him. I'm sorry for always doing as I please Kieran. I'm sure you would have enjoyed living here. No. I. Kieran looked away as he scratched his cheek. When she smiled towards him, she was stunningly beautiful. It was an expression that he would have never seen in the past. Kieran called up his courage as he spoke. I'll go wherever you want to go. Thank you. However, if you are doing this because you feel obligated to honor my father's words. Nibirus. Kieran furrowed his brows as he called out her name. He looked straight into her eyes as he spoke. You know that's not the case. Then why? Ah, please tell me in no uncertain terms. Ah, him. That is. Kieran's face turned red, and he floundered. Nibirus watched him struggle for a brief moment. She let out a small sigh as she started walking. Let's go. We shouldn't make Albert and Nim wait on us. The two of them didn't bother walking down the mountain. They used magic to fly down towards Alberton's abode. Alberton was a dragon, who had acquired wisdom. He had his head perched atop his talons as he waited for the two of them. When Nibirus arrived in front of him, she gave an elegant bow. Alberton spoke. I heard you were leaving today. That is correct. I came here because I wanted to give my final farewell to you. Will you consider becoming a resident of my forest? I want to thank you for your offer, but I'll have to decline. Sibane had bargained for his freedom for the price of teaching Alberton the extreme extinction technique. He had also asked Alberton to accept Nibirus and Kieran into the forest if they decided to come to the forest after the fight. Alberton was willing to grant that request, but Nibirus revealed her intention of leaving for the outside world. Alberton asked her a question. Why, you guys aren't part of the human society. Also, there is no one left inside the plane of darkness. Alberton knew the result of the final battle, and he was aware of what had occurred afterwards. He had passed on the information to Nibirus. She had nowhere else she could return to. I've never had a place I can return to. When Atain was revived, she had impulsively ran away from the plane of darkness. Afterwards, she clearly chose to walk down the path of treason. Even if the Dragon Demon King worshippers hadn't left for the Pioneer Plan, she wouldn't have been able to return to them. This place no longer feels the same to me. My father isn't here anymore. Nibirus let out a sad smile. When she resided here before, it might have been the most peaceful and happiest time in her life. When she first came here, she was able to reunite with her father, who she had wanted to see for a very long time. When she returned to the forest after the fight, she saw the traces of her father, and it had soothed her sadness. However, that wasn't enough. If she stayed here any longer, the sadness and longing for her father would continue to grow. She knew she would feel tormented here. My father gave me so much. On that day, she couldn't hear what Sibane had said before she lost consciousness. His words had been drowned out by the sound of the explosion. However, she had a good idea as to what he was trying to say to her. I do not want to stay in a shelter provided by someone else. 
I would like to find my own answers as I travel the world. By doing so, I'm hoping I'll be able to find my path forward. I'll respect your wishes, Sybane's daughter. However, there will always be a place here for you. Remember this. Your father gave me something that'll guarantee that. Understood. Oh wise dragon, I hope you peace until we meet again. Nibirus nodded her head. She turned around, and she left. Kieran followed after her as he asked a question. Where do you plan to go? I'm not sure. Nibirus had expressed her wish to leave the Alberton forest, but she hadn't talked about any specific destination. She thought for a brief moment as she looked to the north. Kieran, where do you want to go? Ah, me, if you tell me, you'll go wherever I go then I'll refuse to listen to such an answer. This time I'll give you the same statement you presented me with. I'll go wherever you want to go. Nibirus. Kieran was flustered. Soon, he realized that there was a change to Nibirus' usual expression. Her face was red as if she was embarrassed. Despite being embarrassed, she looked straight at Kieran as she waited for his answer. Kieran suddenly woke up from his stupor. She was being brave by giving him such an opportunity. If he tried to avoid answering her question with a half-assed answer, how pathetic would he be? This might be sudden, but I would like to answer the question from earlier first. Which question? Him. That is. You asked why I'm doing all this. Okay. When he heard her words, Kieran took a deep breath. He mustered up his courage as he spoke. I'm doing all of this, because I love you. Even if Saibane Nim hadn't made the request, I would do the same. I love you. If it is for you, I'm willing to do anything. Nibiru's expression froze for a brief moment when she heard his honest confession. She stared at Kieran for a brief moment, and her face started to heat up. Ah, understood. What, Kieran? Your words. I understood it. It was Nibiru's turn to take a deep breathe. Her face was beet red from embarrassment, yet she didn't look away from Kieran's gaze. Wow, this is so like her. It really was like her. Yet this was a side of her he had never seen before. She was so lovable right now that it was driving him crazy. Kieran wanted to hug her right now, but he resisted against such impulse. Nibirus spoke. I love you too, Kieran. Ah, ah, I hope you won't ask me if I'm speaking the truth. At her words, Kieran swallowed the words that he had almost blurted out in a reflexive manner. It had been very close. Nibirus took another deep breath as she raised her hand. Soon, Kieran realized that Nibirus wanted him to take her hand. He quickly held her hand. Nibirus took the lead as she spoke. We share the same fate now. That is why I'll decide where we should go. What? Wait a moment. I thought you wanted me to decide on a destination. Even if I choose the destination, you don't plan on going against my decision. Isn't that right? I guess so. My plan is simple. Let's start with somewhere close. In the outside world, the Yellow's kingdom was closest to the Alberton forest if they didn't want to travel through the Atazan mountain range to the plain of darkness, they had to go through the Yellow's kingdom. Nibirus spoke. That place will be our starting point. We'll take a tour of the continent, then we can choose our next destination. What do you think? It. Kieran didn't answer immediately. When he hesitated, Nibirus whipped her head around to glare at him. Kieran smiled as if he was waiting for her to do so. He spoke. It is the best of plans. They were freed from the madness that had shackled them from birth. The two started a long journey to find a new life for themselves. 6. Youth. This is why the young ones are fun to watch. Alberton was far away, but he had heard the whole conversation between Kieran and Nibirus. He mumbled to himself. As soon as he spoke, he heard a reply. You were listening in on a conversation between lovers. If they found out about it, they'll cuss you out, Albert and Nim. The one to speak was a young dragon demon woman with straight blonde hair. She was the woman who had greeted Azel's party when they arrived at the Alberton forest. Alberton laughed. I don't remember my youth. That is why it pleases me when I see such sights. It is like listening to a great story. I can live vicariously through it. Maybe, it is time for you to woo a charming female dragon. I wish such a woman would show up. It would have been great if Liberton was female. In the history of this world, 
The second dragon to acquire wisdom was Liberton. Liberton was male. Myrnal shook her head from side to side as she spoke. We've received news from Azel Kazark. What did he say? There are only two pillars left. When Atain was defeated, there were five remaining pillars of darkness. Azel's party and the Guardian Shadow replenished their supplies, and they killed another transcendent being sealed within the plane of darkness. He was the god of pestilence named Lemurs. At that point, the suicide squad was disbanded, and most of the members went back home. The remnants of the Dragon Demon King worshippers had left this land, so the role of the Guardian Shadow had ended. Each member had to go back to their own country, and they had to clean up the mess within their countries. This would also be another long, hard fight. Azul's party understood why they had to return to their home. If help was needed in destroying the Pillars of Darkness, the nearest members would be enlisted for help. For the time being, everyone went on their separate ways with such an understanding. After one month passed, two additional pillars had been destroyed. Alberton spoke. The world's greatest magical legacy is being destroyed. It is a miraculous item that'll never exist once again. It is a pity. We've inherited its power, so it won't be completely gone. No. The system that'll be created in this forest will never hold a candle against the Great Darkness. The Great Darkness was a tower of wonder that had been built up by Atain, who was the embodiment of magic and its history. Alberton received a copy of the Great Darkness when he made a deal with Carlos. For the past dozens of years, he had slowly laid down the foundation for his own system. His efforts were starting to come to fruition. He was finally seeing some tangible results. However, he was merely a single magician, so he had to be realistic about his own limitations. The Great Darkness was made by sealing twelve transcendent beings, and it was a miracle that'll never be recreated once again. Suddenly, Mineral spoke. I've reviewed the recent events, and I feel uneasy about it. What are you thinking about? We might have to leave this land someday. We'll have to leave like the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Atain and his followers had been an alien presence that had been incompatible with humanity. Atain had attempted to control the fate of humanity, and he had failed. His followers were no longer welcome in this land, so they had to leave for an unknown land. It had been an inevitable choice. Mineral observed the fallout, and she was reminded that the Alberton Forest was also considered to be an alien presence to humanity. The only difference was the fact that they had never openly fought against humanity like Atain and his followers. Their land was considered to be one of the demonic lands that couldn't be encroached, but would that remain true in the future? Alberton spoke. We might have to move. It is a possibility. At some point, humanity would become so strong that we won't be able to stop them. Their minds aren't mature enough, so they'll try to eliminate everyone that isn't like them. At that point, we might be chased out of this land. Alberton had always worked to fight against such a future. However, it wasn't a guarantee that he'll be able to protect this land indefinitely. No one could make such a guarantee. He let out a soft smile towards the gloomy mineral. However, you don't have to worry about it. It won't happen in your lifetime. Alberton Nim. It won't happen during your son's lifetime. The humans have too many enemies they have to fight beside us. Soon, Mineral left. Alberton looked up at the sky as he murmured to himself. Will my race disappear first or will humanity face the calamity predicted by Atain first? I have no idea. Mineral was talking about the distant future. She would be dead, and her son would also be dead by that time. However, it was a reality that Alberton would have to face some day. I am still a green pup compared to you, but I somehow understand what you were feeling, Atain. Alberton let out a bitter laughter as he muttered to himself. Chapter 264. Epilogue. Part 3. He was called the White Sword Count in the Rio's Kingdom. It had been a while since Bokad Lakadi was able to return to his castle. It had been two months since he had participated in the final battle as a member of the Suicide Squad. During those two months, he hadn't been able to rest. The Plane of Darkness had meddled in the affairs of the world, so his country had been fighting a war against the Rulan Kingdom. He had been ordered to lead the troops into the war. Fortunately, the war hadn't reached a point where the relationship between the two kingdoms couldn't be salvaged. 
In the end, the two kingdoms reached an end of war agreement. It was all thanks to the effort made by the members of the Guardian Shadow in both countries. They patched up the relationship between the two kingdoms. Bokad had been of those members. When the agreement to end the war was finalized, he returned to his castle, and he headed straight towards the field in the back. It was a graveyard. It was where his parents, who had died at the hands of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, had been buried. Moreover, there was also a new grave placed next to the old graves. Our dreams will come true soon. Please look over us. Eileen. He poured alcohol straight from the bottle over the grave. Bokard was wearing an eye patch. He had lost his left eye in the fight within the Dragon Demon Castle. However, his loss was small compared to his other loss. In the final battle, he had lost his beloved little sister. He had lost Eileen Licardi. He was pouring a brand of liquor that Eileen had enjoyed in life. Opa, you've returned. While he was remembering Eileen, his remaining siblings arrived behind him. Sarah and Jirans held the same brand of liquor as they approached the grave. Bacardi turned to look at them. Yes. Did you hear about the cessation of war? You did good. What about you guys? How was Count Kazark? He is still ridiculous as ever. Sarah burst into laughter. While Bokad participated in the delegation that had brought about the cessation of the war, Sarah and Jirans had accompanied Azel's party. Their enemy had been one of the pillars of darkness. He was a transcendent being called the King of Emptiness. The party had made many preparations. However, it was unnecessary. The fight was fierce but short. They were able to kill the King of Emptiness. Bokad spoke after he listened to their account of the fight. I see. I wanted to join you guys in that fight. However, you guys did your part in achieving our dream. Eileen would have been happy. Opa. Sarah's eyes were filled with sadness. In the final battle, around half of the suicide squad had died. Everyone had been prepared for the possibility of death. Their deaths had not been in vain. In death, they were able to achieve their goals. Still, one of his blood had died. Of course, he was sad. Each Licardi sibling felt as if a piece of their soul had been torn away. They were still in the grips of sadness. Bokard looked at his siblings for a moment then he changed the topic. Did Count Kazark leave behind any message? He did. What did he say? He said he'll head towards the Bear's kingdom after the last pillar is destroyed. He'll focus his energy in rebuilding the county of Kazark. He asked you to visit when he succeeds in his task. What else? He said he'll freely share a Tyne's research material in regards to the demon problem. He looks forward to working with you in solving the problem. Atain had left behind a homework for humanity. The remaining guardian shadows had to work in place of the dragon demon king worshippers. They'll have to fight against the calamity that would befall on the humans in the distant future. Bakard spoke. We still have work to do. Of course, I'm willing to cooperate with him. However, I put more importance on both your input than mine. Of course, we are of the same mind as you. She passed the liquor bottle as she spoke. Eileen would have wanted that. Yes, she would have. The three of them mourned the loss of their sibling as they drank the alcohol. It was a bright moonlit night. The bluish moon was at the center of the night sky, and countless stars surrounded it. Darkness was rising into the sky like a geezer. The darkness pierced the sky, and on the ground, it spread like wildfire into the surrounding as the darkness dissipated. This place had been a reservoir for magic, and it had encompassed the whole continent. The destruction of this reservoir was the last step in destroying the great darkness. Now, Kaalia was watching this sight when she opened her mouth. My work is done. She had her back to the moonlight, so she looked like a forest fairy. She let out a bright smile as she looked at her party. Azul's party and the phantoms of the guardian shadows were the only ones to participate in the destruction of the last pillar. Azel, Laura, Chiron, Leticia and Arietta were standing in front of Kaalia. Kaalia, as he called out her name, Azel felt a lump in his throat. She knew what her fate would be if she accomplished this task. Despite knowing what would happen, she went through with it. Kaalia watched Azel bite his lips. She flew through the air as if she was a fish in water. Her half-translucent hand stroked Azel's cheek. 
Of course, it was pretense. She was an illusion, so she could never touch Azel. Thank you. Azel Opa accepted me. I can end my life without any regret. She was reborn in this state thanks to Atain. It had always felt as if she was no longer alive. It didn't feel as if she was a part of this world. The only meaning she could find in this world was her ties to her old life. If there was no connection to her past, she couldn't find any meaning in this life. It was as if she was dreaming a never-ending dream. Her life should have ended a long time ago. Yet she continued to work towards the moment when her incomplete life would be completed. That moment had finally arrived. You. Kealia put her finger on his lips as she let out a bright smile. It was a mischievous smile. Please don't say anything sad. I want you to laugh. I want to remember your laughing face. At her words, Azel tried to force a smile onto his face. It was a really awkward smile, yet he had done his best. I really like Opa's smiling face. When I was a human, it was that face that I always remembered. Kealia let out timid laughter as she nodded her head. At some point, white figures lined up behind her. They were the guardian shadows. Prophecy. Prophesied person. Our long wish. It has been granted. The forest had been destroyed from the battle, yet Azel could hear whispers emanating from his surroundings. No matter where he looked, he could see the guardian shadows. Their numbers had dwindled a lot through the continuous fights yet there were over 2,000 of them gathered at this location. However, he would have to say farewell to them too. They were in the same boat as Kealia. Their existence had root in the great darkness. Soon, the great darkness will be no more, and their existence would end soon. Despite knowing this, the guardian shadows weren't sad. They had given up on their eternal rest to become the guardian shadows. This was the first time they were happy. Their whispers rang out in the forest, and it sounded like an ode to joy. Azel Opa. As the song rang out, Kealia retreated backwards as she spoke. Please be happy. Goodbye. She let out a bright smile as she melted into the darkness. Then her world changed. Her connection to reality was severed. Instead, her consciousness flowed into the world of the great darkness. It was where her essence had been stored. At one point, Everyone within the great darkness had once existed in the real world. It was a world made out their experiences in life. This world was falling apart. The great darkness had lost all its pillars, yet it didn't mean this world would immediately disappear. Still, the destruction of this world was right around the corner. Kealia was within this world as she looked at the memories that made her who she was. She watched the distant past when she started walking this world as a parentless dragon demon. She remembered her fear of death. It drove her to create the reincarnation technique. Then she watched herself go through reincarnations, and she saw the first moment when she started losing herself. She started changing into different existences. Kadika. She saw her twin brother, who had fallen under the weight of his sad fate. Since a single entity had been split into two, Kadika couldn't withstand the hatred that had been awakened within him towards Kealia. He had lived a luckless life. When Kealia approached the figure in her memories, he laughed. This was him before he was crushed under his cruel fate. He had treasured her as someone that was of his flesh and blood. Kealia continued to fly through the world of memories. Countless people passed by her. She couldn't even remember the names of most of the people in her memories. It was rare for anyone to evoke any meaningful emotions within her. Atain. Amongst all of them, there were figures that she couldn't forget. They were part of her memory, yet the shadows of their former selves still remained within the great darkness. Atain was smiling towards her, and Ain Sarah was next to her. She was smiling too. It was a smile that Kealia had never seen before from Ain Sarah. You've acquired your salvation. As the world continued to deteriorate, the shadows of the dead looked at each other as they laughed. Kalia flew past them, and she flew deeper into the world. She wanted to meet all of the remaining shadows within the great darkness. Almeric looked as if he had no regrets. The two of them showed respect towards each other as they brushed past each other. Hey, you did a good job. Unlike the other beings, there was a being that spoke in a carefree manner. He was a dragon demon with an unusually large body. When Kealia saw him, 
Her eyes widened in surprise. Regus. Her surprise lasted only for a brief moment. Soon, she put on a gentle smile as she flew into his arms. The two shadows, who had finally lived a life with no regret, smiled at each other. They greeted their final moment of peace. There was a strange echo as the whispers filled the forest. Each guardian shadows followed Kealia's example. They started disappearing in ones and twos. It was as if they were melting into the moonlight. The sound of their whispers started to sound distant as each guardian shadows exited this world. It had sounded as if several hundred children had been whispering to each other. But the unnatural sound started to die away. In the end, every one of them is gone. The only thing left behind was silence. Please rest in peace. Azel murmured to himself as he touched his cheek. It was where Kalia had placed her hand. There was no way this could be true. But somehow, he could still feel her warmth on his cheek. He was the dragon demon prince of the Rulan kingdom. Saiga Vile Rulan had participated in the final battle as a member of the Suicide Squad, and he had survived until the end. After the battle ended, he departed from Azul's party. He returned to the Rulan kingdom, and he gave his report to his mother, the Dragon Demon Queen. Afterwards, he ceased doing his public duties. Saiga ventured out of his residence after four months had passed after the final battle. He hadn't gone out, because he had to fulfill his duties as the Dragon Demon Prince. Saiga took couple talented bodyguards as he headed towards the county of Michael. After he shifted all duties to his successor, Count Michael was currently enjoying his retirement. Saiga had traveled here to meet Archmage Biorin Michael. Welcome, Prince. It has been a while. Saiga gave a respectful greeting. Biorin had also participated in the final fight as a member of the Suicide Squad and he was a fellow survivor. This was why there was mutual respect in both their gazes, even if there was a gap in age and station. Biorin spoke. Did you achieve your goal? Yes. It took a long time. May you show it to me? Of course. Saiga closed his eyes, and at the same time, a powerful wave of dragon demon magic was emitted from his body. Release dragon soul. A half-translucent blue dragon appeared as it wound itself around Sega's entire body. At the same time, sparks started to erupt from his surroundings. Biorin looked impressed as he asked a question. As expected, your dragon soul is a thunder dragon. It is. My sister probably has the same dragon soul. Saiga unsummoned his dragon soul. He had been holed up in his residence, because he had wanted to perfect his dragon soul. In the final battle, he had been lacking in power, so he hadn't been able to play a significant role in the fight. It had frustrated him. Biorin asked him a question. What brings you to this retired old man? The county of Michael was pretty far from the capital. Saiga had went through the trouble of coming here, so he must have some business with Biorin. Saiga spoke. I would like to commission you to make me a dragon sword. You want a dragon sword? Dragon Sword was a weapon created by Chiron and Michael. Of course, several more people had collaborated in the endeavor, but the two of them was crucial to the process. If one wanted to make a dragon weapon, either Chiron or Biorin had to be involved. If they were excluded, it was impossible to make the Dragon Sword. Yes, the Crown acquired all the ingredients. I'll be sure to compensate you very well too, since Saiga had awakened the Dragon Soul he would never be able to acquire a dragon demon weapon. Aside from the dragon demon weapons, the dragon sword was the best weapon in the world, and he wanted one. Also, I would like to leave behind the dragon sword to my descendants. Unlike the dragon demon weapon, dragon soul was part of oneself, so it couldn't be passed on. Moreover, the Alberton Forest had put a strict restriction on who can learn the dragon soul. This was why he wouldn't be able to teach the dragon soul to his descendants. He wanted a dragon sword the more he thought about it. He'll marry someday. If he had a son, he wanted to leave behind a weapon for him. Biorin nodded his head. I see. All right. This might be a good opportunity. A good opportunity. It is time for me to start teaching my pupils on how to create the dragon weapon. I cannot take this precious technique to my grave. I see. Saiga laughed. Biorin had spoken some wise words. Saiga suddenly asked a question. 
Are you solely focused on teaching your pupils now? I've taken my hands off from the family affairs, so I guess so. However, that isn't the only reason why I'm doing this. Then why? I'm looking into the research material given to us by Sir Kazak. We are furthering at times research with the other members of the Guardian Shadows. Ah, this was the first time he had heard such news. Azul's party had handed over a Tyne's research materials in regards to the demon race. Azel had suggested they should collaborate in furthering the research, but the offer had been made to mostly magicians. This was why Saiga hadn't heard about it. Biorin stroked his beard as he laughed. It'll be something that'll happen in the distant future. We have to steadily make preparations, so we'll be able to escape a Tyne's prediction. I never expected to find so much motivation in my latter years. I see. If you need my help, please ask. I'd be happy to help. Understood. I'll be asking the throne for support when I'll be expanding my research. Please support my endeavors when the time comes. Chapter 265. Epilogue. Part 4. It had been a while since Giles Vince had entered through the gate of the capital. He was the personal knight of the dragon demon princess Arietta, yet he had been allowed to take a fairly long vacation. He had used the long downtime to return to his homeland, and his family had welcomed him back. In his childhood, his father had been strict in his education. It was so harsh that it almost counted as abuse. His father didn't say anything, but he looked proud of Giles. After Giles had become the personal knight of Arietta, his family's fortune had improved a lot, so all his other family members looked happy. This was why he was able to spend a pleasant time at home before he had to return to the capital. We are here. As soon as he returned to the capital, he made a promise to meet someone. He was meeting Bor, who was a member of the Royal Knights. Bor was six years older than Giles, yet they shared a deep friendship. If it wasn't for Bor, Giles would have had a hard time adjusting to the life within the capital. Giles flinched in surprise when he saw Bor, who had reserved a seat in a bar. Where did you get that scar? There was a large scar on Bor's cheek. Bor let out an embarrassed laughter. Ah, I got hurt in a mission that I conducted not too long ago. A new recruit overextended himself. I got hurt trying to save his life. Bor thought about the incident as he clicked his tongue. Giles sat across Bor, and they clinked their glasses together. Then they talked about what had happened in their respective lives. So, Giles had a peculiar expression on his face when he heard how Bor had been wounded. So you met a new recruit that acted like your old self. Okay, buddy, I received a valorous wound in the process of saving someone else. You shouldn't talk like that. Bor laid it on thick. The recruit was from an affluent family so he was directly elevated to knighthood. He didn't have to go through the process of being a knight's apprentice. He had overestimated his own strength, and he had almost died. Bor didn't look kindly on the new recruit, but they were comrades in arms. As the senior knight, he had saved the new recruit even at the expense of being injured. The princess sent word that she'll be returning in couple days. Is that why you've returned to the capital? That's right. Giles had gone on his vacation, because Arietta had stopped her duties as the dragon demon princess. She had joined Azul's party for the past couple months. However, Arietta had sent notice that she'll be returning to the capital. The throne had called him back to work. Giles spoke. While I was on vacation, my frustration didn't go away. What's wrong? I was too weak to be of help to the princess. I couldn't accompany her. Also, it was a fight between legendary heroes. It won't be written down in the history books, but it was a fight with the fate of the whole world on the line. I really wanted to play a role in that fight. The fact that I wasn't good enough frustrated me to no end. I understand your feeling. I felt something similar when I learned that Sir Azel was really Azel Kazak. Bor let out a bitter laughter. He had learned that Azel was the legendary hero Azel Kazak through Giles. Azel had befriended Giles and Bor for a short amount of time, yet it seemed he didn't want to hide his identity from them. When he learned the truth, Bor was so shocked that he couldn't form words. He had befriended the legendary hero, who had etched his name in history. On the other hand, Bor was a friend. 
but he wasn't someone that could unload some of the burdens carried by Azel. He felt a bit bitter that Azel hadn't shared the truth with him earlier. Still, Bor was very self-aware. He had been too weak to be told such information. Giles spoke. I want to become strong. When I meet him once again, I want to show him how strong I've become. I want to show that it was all thanks to him. Azel had given him too much. The two of them were hailed as geniuses now. But if they hadn't learned the forgotten techniques from Azel, they would have been limited to standards of this era. They would have been trapped in mediocrity. Bohr raised his glass as he spoke. The feeling is mutual. Let us become the stepping stone that'll change the standard of this era. Let's do it. Giles clinked glasses with him. Honora had lived a very leisurely life for the past four months. It was to be expected. She had no one to serve since Arietta had left her post. Still, it wasn't as if she hadn't worked. She started the day by cleaning Arietta's room, then she diligently did all her duties as a maid. She made sure she wouldn't be taken unawares when Arietta finally came back home. Currently, Honora was changing the sheets atop Arietta's bed. While she was folding the bed sheets, she heard a voice from behind her. Honora. For a brief moment, Honora thought she had heard wrong. However, she soon realized that she had heard the voice in reality. Her eyes widened. Princess. Arietta had walked through the open door. Honora was glad to see her. So she started running towards Arietta. Soon, she came to a halt. She froze like a statue. What's wrong? Arietta became puzzled at Honora's rapid change in behavior. Arietta had expected an emotional reunion, but Honora looked pale. It looked as if she had seen something dreadful. Honora, no way. This cannot be. Honora's body shook as if she had seen something that she shouldn't have witnessed. Honora sounded like she was about to cry as she stood in front of the confused Arietta. Of all the places, we are in palace. I cannot believe you showed this grubby appearance inside the palace. Suddenly, Arietta swayed on her feet in relief. She really wasn't in a clean state. After departing from Azel's party, she had done her best in keeping herself clean on the road, but it was inevitable that she was travel-stained. Him. I might have understood it if you said I was a bit disheveled. Grubby is a bit. What do you mean? I'll immediately prepare a bath for you. Since you've returned, you have to see the king and queen. If you go meet them in such a state, you'll make them faint. No. Both of them said I did a good job. They said they were proud of me. When Honora heard Arietta's complaining words, it looked as if her world had come crashing down around her. Basically, Arietta had seen the king and the dragon demon queen in her grubby state. Honora felt dizzy. Ah, I'm done. They'll think I let you appear in their presence in such a state. My reputation is ruined. You don't have to worry about that. I went to the throne room as soon as I arrived at the palace. They know this truth. Arietta stroked Honora's head. Then she sat in front of the table as she spoke. I would like some fragrant tea. I've missed the tea you've always brewed for me. A-H-T. Yes. Which tea should I bring? Him. I would like a tea that'll mend my broken heart. What? Honora thought she had heard wrong. Arietta spoke with a serious expression on her face. Yes. It is true. My heart was broken. Your heart, princess. That's right. I didn't even get to give my confession before my heart was broken. That is why it hurt so much more. Arietta looked out the window as she sighed. An explosive piece of information had suddenly been dropped on Honora's lap, and she had no idea what to do with it. She could only open and shut her mouth in a soundless manner. Arietta turned to Honora as she asked a question. You don't want to know who broke my heart. How dare I? Him. You a pretty bright girl. You probably guessed who it is. It can't be Sir Azel, right? Arietta sounded as if she to talk about it with Honora, so Honora carefully asked the question. Arietta had an expression of displeasure on her face as she complained. Yes, it is him. What a bad man. He made so many accidents with women in the past, yet I was willing to look past that. He should have had the courtesy of allowing a girl to confess to him, yet he was like an iron wall. He said he wanted to rebuild the county of Kazakh and he wanted to start his life anew there. Honora listened to Arietta's complaints. 
She let out a small sigh as she discreetly exited the room. She went to boil some tea. Soon, she poured a fragrant tea that calmed Arietta's heart. Arietta held up the teacup as she took in the aroma of the tea. Arietta spoke. I was cross with him, so I didn't plan on delivering this. What is it? That man wanted me to deliver some words to you, Honora. Me? Honora's eyes widened. Arietta nodded her head. That's right. He said he'll be going to the Bear's Kingdom, and he plans on rebuilding the county of Kazark. He asked if you would like to become the head maid of the newly constructed county of Kazark at a later date. Ah, Honora's face turned red. She was deeply moved by the offer. He was a legendary hero, who had saved the world. After he recovered his lost land, he was asking her to embark on a new future with him. When Arietta saw Honora's expression, she sounded sullen as she spoke. If you want, you can go. The Bear's kingdom is far away but I'll make sure you'll get there safely. We are talking about something several years down the road. Of course, it'll be a worthwhile endeavor. No, princess. Honora had unconsciously cut off Arietta's words. Honora flinched when she realized she had been rude. Soon, she regained a calm state of mind. She spoke the words in her heart. I've already made my future plans. Him, will you let me hear your plan? Yes. I'll serve you until you retire. After you retire, I'll follow you, and I'll be the head maid of your household. I want to be able to point with my chin, and the other maids will jump to do my bidding. Then I want to meet a good man, and I want to live a happy life. This was her dream, and she had told Azel about it. This was the first time Arietta had heard it, so her eyes had turned round. Honora didn't sound confident as she spoke her next words. Of course, this is merely my own wishes. If you will not accept me, I'll have to find work elsewhere. What do you mean? I welcome it. Arietta quickly spoke her words. She cleared her throat as she clarified her words. When I retire, there is no one else that can fill the role of my head maid except you, Honora. I promise you this. Princess. Honora was moved. Arietta sounded excited as she spoke. Since I'll be the world's greatest sloth in retirement, I'll need someone talented to take care of my servants. You shouldn't worry about your future, Honora. Just follow me. I'll do my best to retire as soon as possible. Yes, Honora let out a bright laughter as she gave her answer. Chapter 266. Epilogue. Part 5. Leticia looked at the distant city, and she unconsciously murmured her words. It is a beautiful place. Isn't it? The one, who had answered immediately, was Chiron. At his words, Leticia became startled. Soon, she nodded her head. Unlike you, your parents had great artistic taste. It really is quite apparent. Ha ha ha. You're not wrong. Chiron laughed. The two of them were looking at the Taranto's castle, which was at the heart of the dukedom of Taranto's. Chiron looked deeply moved as he spoke. It has been a long time since I've returned to this place. My people will nag me to no end. I can imagine it. It had been over a year since he had left his land to follow Azel. He had sent regular updates on his whereabouts, but he was a lord, who had vacated his land for over a year. He could easily imagine how much stress his absence had caused Havans. When he returned to the castle, he'll be assaulted by a storm of words. He'll have to put up with Havans's scolding. I'll have to endure it since it is karma for my actions. At the very least, you are aware that you've done wrong by him. It couldn't be helped. If I hadn't left at that time, what would have happened if you hadn't left? Azel would have floundered without my sublime abilities as a commander. If only you couldn't talk. Leticia gave him the side eye. Chiron laughed. I don't regret leaving at that time. Our fight won't be written down in history like the Dragon Demon War, but I was able to fight with the legendary hero. We fought for the fate of the world and I was able to meet you. The great darkness was gone now. When Kaalia and the Guardian Shadows gained their true rest, the party's journey had come to an end. They toasted their victory, then they broke up the party. They set up a future reunion date. Azel said he'll go to the Bear's Kingdom, and he'll rebuild the county of Kazark. Laura revealed her intent of accompanying him. Arietta had to return to the Rulan Kingdom since she had to return to work as the Dragon Demon Princess. 
The only one left was Leticia. She had finished a fight that had consumed her whole life. There was a weird sense of despondency within her. When he saw this, Chiron invited Leticia to his land. Since she had nowhere else to go, she accepted Chiron's offer. It is a bit late to ask you this, but suddenly, Leticia asked a question. Did you talk to Azel? Him. Please tell me the truth. I did. Chiron avoided her gaze as he gave his answer. Leticia clicked her tongue when she saw this. It was quite curious. Azel hadn't asked Leticia to help rebuild the county of Kazark. She was the only one he hadn't asked. It seemed Chiron had talked to Azel beforehand. When the fight ends, I want to ask Leticia if she wants to come with me. If she turns me down, you can ask her to participate in the reconstruction of your lands. Leticia looked sullen as she spoke. Let's hear it. What do you mean? Why did you do that? Him. I didn't have any future plans. I accepted the offer of being a guest in your lands, because the idea intrigued me. So why did you invite me to your lands? Is it because I'm your comrade in arms? Ah, him. That is. Chiron was flustered. When she saw him become embarrassed, Leticia let out a sigh. I've lived for a long time, and I've never been posed a question quite like this before. You already know that I'm unlike any woman you've ever met. I heard you've dated a lot of women, yet you are airless. What gives, your lordship? I'm sorry, I was wrong. Chiron admitted defeated. He cleared his throat then he spoke. Leticia, I like you. I like you too. At Leticia's forthright answer, Chiron's eyes widened. However, Leticia didn't sound like she was admitting her dying love for him. I think I like you in a different way than you like me. I want there to be no misunderstanding. I cannot answer your feeling. What I'm trying to say is, I like you, but I don't know if it is the same feeling that occurs between a man and a woman. Him. So what you are saying is, Chiron was careful in how he posed his question. You aren't turning me down. I have a chance. For now, that is enough. Really, we can take our time in figuring everything out. As long as you stay as a guest in my house, I'll try to seduce you. Please keep your heart open and wait for me. You really are. Leticia smirked. You are a shameless man. Can't you just say I'm being bold? Chiron let out a playful laughter as he replied to her. The two of them were getting closer to the Taranto's castle as they conversed with each other. The Bayer's kingdom had fallen for the scheme set up by the dragon demon king worshippers. This was why they were at war with the Elo's kingdom. However, the blueprint had been set in the war between the Rulan Kingdom and the Rio's Kingdom. The members of the Guardian Shadows brought about an end to the war. The war had been very fierce, so the domestic situation within the Bears' Kingdom was a mess. The Bears' Kingdom was in a state of turmoil, yet in this turmoil, a man started to make a name for himself. He started creating ripples. Azel Karzak. He was a man with the same name as the legendary hero Azel Karzak who had defeated the dragon demon king Atane. He had the same name as the man who had ended the dragon demon war. His outer appearance was also identical to the hero's portrait, which had been passed down through the years. This man claimed to be the descendant of Marquis Kazark. It really did sound like a plan hatched by a swindler trying to use the clout of the legendary hero for his benefit. However, something surprising happened. Count Chiha, who was the king's maternal uncle, came forward to vouch for Azel. Even Duke Renas, who was the great lord of the east, stepped forward to back the newly found heir of Marquis Kazark. It created a big splash within the Bear's kingdom. Afterwards, Azel travelled around the Bear's kingdom, and he performed great feats. Thanks to the war, there weren't enough soldiers to protect the population. The monsters didn't miss this opportunity to take advantage of the situation. They caused great damage to the human population. Azel went around the whole country in order to defeat these monsters. He didn't ask for any recompense, and it allowed him to be accepted by the people. He killed the Orc Horde in the south. Then he killed a frost dragon that was rampaging in the Burdan region with his companion mage. At that point, everyone accepted that he was the descendant of the hero. Azel was bold as he told everyone his goal. I'll take back the county of Kazark, which was taken over by monsters. 
Azel wanted the throne of the Bears kingdom to give him dominion over his land. The people praised him as a hero. It allowed Count Chiha, Duke Renas and other nobles to support his activities. It had been eight months since Azel had started his plan. At that point, he was officially accepted as the heir to the county of Kazakh by the throne of Bears. He acquired the rights to take over his lands. The throne didn't send any troops. However, people from all over the continent started to gather when he made his desire known that he wanted to restore the county of Kazakh. We are finally here. Azel sat inside the barracks as he mumbled to himself. The sun was slowly coming up. It was getting loud outside as people started to move around the camp. The people outside were equipped with an assortment of weapons. They were from all over the continent. They had come because they admired Azel. They wanted to help Azel take back his lands. There were several thousand fighters gathered outside. Even if one considered Azel's reputation, his title as the Marquis was in name only. He didn't have any resources, so they asked for no recompense from Azel. It was almost a miracle that so many people had shown up. It took us a long time. Laura had spoken. In any rumors pertaining to Azel, there was always a beautiful blonde dragon demon girl by his side. Everyone assumed they were an item. Azel tilted his head in puzzlement. Did it take a long time? It has been less than a year. If we didn't unnecessarily hide our power, it would have been much faster. Azel had hidden his true powers as he accomplished his tasks. In this era, he was now known as someone that possessed legendary prowess. However, he had revealed only a portion of his true power. They were only seeing the peel to the fruit. Azel shook his head from side to side. I don't believe that is true. Do you think people would have become afraid of you? In the standard of this era, I have enough power to threaten a nation. This fact had been fine during the Dragon Demon War. The army led by the Dragon Demon King army had been such a powerful force that they were considered to be a calamity. The Nadic Empire had conquered most of the continent, and most countries were under the banner of empire. There were many powerful beings on both sides, so these powerful beings usually moved in concert to take down anyone that went rogue. A being with transcendent power could be stopped. However, it was different in this era. If Azel revealed his true strength, the common folk might greet him with fanfare. However, the rulers of each nation would feel extreme fear towards him. Anyways, we have to live as a member of this era. We cannot make enemies of the people. I am very thankful to the members of Guardian Shadows for making this possible. He was accepted as the descendant of Azel Kazakh, thanks to Count Chiha and Duke Rinas. Both of them were members of the Guardian Shadow. Azel had let them realize their long-cherished wish of taking revenge against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Moreover, there were practical benefits to having Azel join Bear's kingdom. This was why they had given their full support to Azel. Laura queried him. Still, I think it would have been okay if you were a bit more greedy. What do you mean by greedy? It could have been more than the county of Kazakh. You could have made it the Kazakh kingdom. During the days of the Nadic Empire, he had held the position of Marquis. Currently, seven kings ruled over this continent, but their families had merely been high-ranking lords before the Nadic Empire fell. If so, wouldn't it have been okay if Azel created the Kazakh kingdom? Azel grinned as he asked her a question. Why? You want to be queen? No. Then why? It is just an idle thought. In the stories, the hero always becomes the king. My dream is to make the county of Kazakh inhabitable. I want to make it a good place to live. Anything else? Yes. I'll leave that possibility open, but I'll push such plans to a later date. You want to put it off like the plan for us to have children? Laura had ambushed him with her words. His saliva went down the wrong pipe, so he started coughing. Azul's face turned red as he turned to look at her. Yes, that's right. I'm not saying we should rush into it. It is something we should do after we build our nest. Laura had an expressionless face, yet she had stuck her tongue out. Azel let out a sigh when he saw this. Your personality has changed a lot. It is bound to happen since I have to live with a rascal like you. Jeez. Azel hugged her, and he gave her a light kiss. In the past year, they had become lovers. 
Hazel had been freed from the ghosts of his past, and he was able to become honest with his feelings. Moreover, Laura had accepted his feelings. Soon, Hazel exited the barracks as he spoke. Shall we go? Laura nodded her head. The change in her expression was so minute that others couldn't see it. However, Hazel knew she was smiling right now. When the two of them exited the barracks, the people caught sight of them. It stirred the audience. As numerous eyes were focused on him, Hazel extended his hand towards the sky. Suddenly, lightning erupted from the sky. The lightning bolt shattered the darkness of the early morning as it shot towards Azel's hand. Azel's cape fluttered as he appeared from within the explosive light with a blue sword in his hand. Everyone let out an ardent shout. As their shout rang out, Azel and Laura advanced towards the demonic land called the County of Kazakh. Azel looked at the forest as he spoke. This is just the beginning. He was finally able to escape from the shadow of his past, and he embarked on his new life.